What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. I didn't think properly. Jumped right in while trying something out and exhausted all of my chakra. Daiki admitted with a sigh. No point really hiding it at this point. Well, roughly how he ended up in this state. Not that he actually restored the corpse of an Uchiha to perfect health so he could harvest its eyes. Must have been quite the technique. Tenten whistled, halting and poking his cheek. You're an endurance freak after all and have chakra for days. Something like that. Daiki snorted. So guess you finished the exam then? He changed the subject. Yup. Not long ago actually. Fourth team so far apparently. She grinned at him. Flashing him a V sign with two fingers. Heard you were the first one to finish Mr. Ringer in record time at that? Less than an hour, baby. I'm awesome like that. He grinned. You're something alright? The bun-haired girl rolled her eyes. Full of it I'm thinking. Still, that's why I came here since I heard you were already here. You miss me that much? He joked. Want a second date? Tenten snorted, amused. Actually, Lee got into a bit of a fight with those sound punks and didn't take them seriously. They busted up his eardrums, so his balance is all thrown off and he can't hear right. She replied. I'm not good enough with a mystical palm jutsu yet to do delicate stuff like that, so was hoping you could heal him up, but looks like that's a no-go for now. She gave a helpless shrug. So that had gone down the same then? I'll do it later, once I've recovered. Should only take a few hours. He promised, and she gave him an odd look, but didn't comment. So the sound team, huh? I was thinking of bullying them a bit myself the other day for attacking one of us. But they were too weak to be any fun hunting down, to be honest. They have some niche techniques, that sound arm thing the lead one has was kinda interesting. And one of them even had a wind jutsu that's a lot like yours, Ten Ten mused. But yeah, they weren't all that strong to be honest. Lee could have beaten all three of them easily enough if he took his weights off. Should have done that before the exam started, really? Daiki rolled his eyes. Lee definitely had the strength to be a chunin, but he completely lacked the mentality. True, though he has his reasons. Silly as they might seem to some, Ten Ten shrugged again. Honestly, they were kind of annoying. Thought they were hot crap for ganging up on that pink-haired girl. Sakura, I think? We didn't need to in the end because it seems she's friends with you because she busted out that jutsu of yours. Daiki blinked. She did. Ah, yeah. She got caught up by that sound chick grabbing her hair. And the stupid biatch went off on some rant about her long hair despite having even longer hair. Wasn't mouthing off for long though. Ten Ten growled before snorting. The Sakura chick cut off her hair, then used it as a bit of a smokescreen to get the jump on the biatch. Punched her right in the stomach and used your jutsu on her. Would have probably killed her if her arm didn't snap like a twig in the process. Huh. As expected, she couldn't handle the jutsu with her current arm strength. But still, Sakura actually took Kin down, and she did exactly as he said, used it only when she was sure she would get the hit in. Good on her. The guy with a jutsu like yours totally wigged out seeing it though, went on a total rage about her copying him and stuff, it was kind of pathetic actually. Ten Ten continued. He tried to blast her with his own, but she fired off your jutsu with her other arm. Snapped it as well, I think, but managed to block his own with it. Then the Uchiha kid woke up, had some weird tattoos, his chakra went all nasty and acted like a total psycho. He ended up killing the guy when he saw what happened to his teammate and then the bandage guy who was the leader. Eh? Then Dosu and Zaku were dead then? Huh, that was new and an unexpected development. Still, that Uchiha kid was really unstable there for a bit. Almost called us out for a fight as well before that Naruto kid woke up. Ten Ten continued. Blondie made a big fuss about his teammate's shorter hair, and the Uchiha snapped out of whatever berserker rage he was in and those weird tattoos and his nasty chakra disappeared real quick. Hung Daiki frowned in thought. 
This will change things up a bit come the preliminaries. He mused. But then again their existence wasn't actually all that important in the grand scheme of things. Dosu would get killed by Gara off-screen and Kin and Zaku just got used as Edo Tensei sacrifices. Orochimaru could get any two sacrifices so they weren't all that important really. Can't say I'm not glad how things turned out though. The bun-haired girl grinned. I managed to get my hands on that gauntlet the bandage guy had. He called it the melody arm I think. It'll be fun to learn how to use in the future. Uh, another change. Not exactly a massive one. But still another change. And sound-based techniques would be super useful for her in the future. He needed to time to think these thoughts were derailed by surprisingly soft hands grasping his head and gently lifting it up and directed the back of his skull to a pair of full, firm, yet comfortable thighs. Daiki froze. What are you doing? He asked blankly looking directly up at Ten Ten now from where his head lay on her thighs. Well, I figure since it'll be a good while before you can move, I may as well make things more comfortable for you. She smirked down at him. Come on, you can't say a perv like you isn't happy getting a lap pillow from me. You weren't exactly shy before in complimenting my... Let's be polite and say my looks. Was she coming on to him? You could just help me over to the bed, you know. He pointed out. I can if you want. Ten Ten raised an eyebrow challengingly at him. Nope, I'm good here. He instantly backtracked. I thought so. She snorted, her smirk turning wry. One seriously could not underestimate the healing properties of a lap pillow. Daiki practically felt his chakra recovery speed up massively. A thousand percent over. Even, it was such a speedy recovery technique that in response to Ten Ten's teasing, he managed through sheer epic badassery, to roll in place so he was laying face down on her thighs and could feel the full lusciousness of them against his cheeks. He inhaled and then exhaled deeply. Smells like victory. A hand wove itself into his hair and fingers grasped his short spiky tresses, and he found his face yanked up by the grip. His nose practically being buried in Tenton's toned belly for a second before his head was tilted up and found the brunette looking down at him, one eyebrow raised gaze dry. Really? She deadpanned. Hmm. Looking up at her like this, he could only see half of her face. The rest was blocked out by the surprisingly large sloping of her breasts. Well, you probably don't know being a complete pleb with medic ninjutsu, but lap pillows are known to speed up recovery rates by 100%. Daiki helpfully informed her. Going the face down route of it though with a cute girl boosts that ten times over. Somehow her gaze became even drier and her other eyebrow raised up to join the first. You must be really great at infiltration missions with how easily you can hogwash with such a straight face. The bun-haired older girl snorted. I'm not hogwashing, remember? I had to move to change my position. Daiki smirked at her. Proof that it works. Utterly shameless. She shook her head, letting go of his hair and letting his face plop down against her thighs. Despite how firm and toned they were, her thighs were also surprisingly soft somehow. Such a mystery. Not that he was complaining. You're an utter menace, she continued. I can only imagine the amount of girls you've taken advantage of like this and got away with just because you're cute and strong. None really, he said. His voice muffled slightly because of her thighs. You're the only one who's ever given me a lap pillow. Be proud. He could have taken advantage of Hinata most likely. But he wouldn't. He'd felt up Sakura, but that was just for a laugh and to hype her up, and pinching Eno's Giat didn't count, and Kurinai and Anko didn't count either, because he couldn't be taking advantage of them when they freely offered to ride his member. That was on them. Really, his restraint was quite admirable when he thought about it. He was quite the gentleman. Oh wow, my biggest achievement yet, Ten Ten replied with a snort. I can practically see the Hokage giving me a Chunin vest and a Super Chakra blade as a reward right now. I mean, if she wants to be my personal lap pillow giver, that's an easy reward. He laughed mentally. Ten Ten was actually one of the most suited to be a Chunin in his general age group. She wasn't the strongest, nor was she the smartest, but she was mature and struck a nice middle ground between them with having both the strength and intelligence for the role. Whereas most of the candidates were like Naruto, Sasuke, and Lee, specked into the strength and not having the maturity, or the likes of Shikamaru who specked into the intelligence role and lacked the strength. The whole theme of the Chunin exams here was about that heaven and earth crap that old man Saratobi thought up. 
only those possessing of both the required mental and physical ability would be promoted. Funny how that got hand waved for Shikamaru and nobody else. Then again, the old man was dead and gone by the time the promotions came about. He probably just got promoted because of Asuma pushing for it and nobody wanting to slap the man down after he just lost his father. It was that or Shikaku pushing for it as the more or less Jonin commander that seemed the most likely options to Daiki. He refused to believe the examiners could be that utterly bum stupid to promote him over everybody else for his showing against Tamari. Nepotism at its finest for sure. Well if he ended up Hokage, it wasn't gonna happen unless that noodle armed shadow boy got put through a grind course and gained some muscle. None of his teams would be getting led on missions by such a flimsy guy. Honestly, such an unmotivated guy was near the last he'd promote from his age group. Chunin Vest and Chakra Blade. Got it? Daiki nodded into Tenton's thighs. Seems a pretty good trade for you as my personal lap pillow giver. That actually might make being Hokage worth it. He'd have his clones do all the work while he chill-axed with his head in Tenton's lap. He'd totally need to find some sheer skirt for her to wear though. Like a harem one. He should hit up the daimyo or something to ask him about getting harem girl outfits. No wait. A belly dancer outfit would look way better on Tenten. Last I checked you weren't Hokage. Tenten pointed out. For now, but I'm pretty much next in line. He responded. A who? And where'd you get that idea? The bun-haired girl's voice was light as she asked, clearly disbelieving. Cause I'm just that awesome. He smirked into her thighs. No doubt if the Hokage were to die anytime soon or step down they'd pick me to replace him. And did you wake up with your face in a bowl of cereal after that dream? Tenten snorted. Or did you hit your head before I found you? Let me check for a bump. He felt one of her hands reach into his hair and gentle rake through his dark tresses. Haters gonna hate, but that does feel good. He replied idly and just relaxed and enjoyed the feeling. It wasn't like he blamed her for not believing him. After all, he had a hard time believing it sometimes that he was basically the next Hokage and he'd had a decent while to process it now. And Tenten wasn't exactly privy to his full strength and resources, never mind his Jinchuriki abilities and the like. MMM, maybe your head is just one big lump and that's why I can't feel one on here? She mused sardonically as she continued to gently rake her fingers through his short spiky hair. Your head is plenty big enough for it. I'm gonna give you D-rank missions for a year straight when the truth come outs. He laughed. Sure you are? The bun-haired girl drawled sarcastically. Heck, tell you what, if it does turn out to be true, I'll give you a lap pillow whenever you want. Ooh, high stakes there. Daiki grinned and turned his head over a bit, so he could look up into her eyes with one of his own. I'm pretty possessive, you know, which means no other boyfriend for you when that happens. These cozy thighs will belong to me. Ah uh, who? She rolled her eyes. Guess I'd be stuck with you then. Daiki blinked, before his grin widened. That sounds like a proposition to me, he replied. You're the one that loves having your face between my thighs. Ten ten deadpanned. Touché. Among other things, he shot back. But it's good to know. Good to know what? She furrowed her brows. How good my game is. He gave a tiny shrug that only the recovery power of the legendary lap pillow afforded him. And that you're totally fine being stuck with me. Despite how cool she played it so far. Ten Ten was unable to stop the slight flush her cheeks took on. I don't see you complaining about it. She replied. As if I would. Daiki laughed. I'd probably be a crap boyfriend. But I wouldn't say no to dating you. Her lips quirked up. Is that so? The bun-haired older girl mused before reaching down to flick him on the nose. Save it for after the exam's lover boy. We can try it out a bit if you want. See if it works out. Totally fine with me. He agreed. Two hours later Daiki was up back on his feet and moving again. Albeit a bit stiffly. His chakra capacity had fully recovered though, which was what mattered. He just felt like he'd had a cheat day and gorged on a bunch of artery-clogging junk food full of salt and super greasy fat as if he took a bite out of Choji's mother's ass. Not that he would. There were some things even the ever-fearless Daikisama himself was too afraid to face head-on. And this is the boy that plans to save the world. Isabu groaned. Daiki shrugged. I know my limits, buddy.
he replied mentally as he made his way down the hall that the assigned bedrooms were located in with Ten Ten by his side, or rather a bit in front of him, leading him to where her team's room was. And because he was taking advantage of his exhausted body to check her out from behind, it was only a short walk that took less than 30 seconds, about 25 at most and only because of his pace and the fact that Tenton's team had claimed the most far away room at the end of the hall for whatever reason. Daiki personally had chosen the first one. He had no idea why none of the other two teams had before he got here. Possibly some strategic thing or something, honestly, he couldn't be sure since he saw nothing wrong with taking the first room he came across. You know, are you sure you had chakra exhaustion? Ten Ten looked over his shoulder at him forcing him to drag his eyes up from where he was admiring her backside. She rolled her eyes but didn't comment. Because I've had chakra exhaustion before, a few times even, and I was laid up for days recovering, it's only been two hours and you're up and about. Your thighs have the magic touch. What can I say? Daiki shrugged with a grin. She gave him a thoughtful look. So it's just some trait you have then? Bloodline maybe? She mused. Yep, it's called the Sexigon, when I'm in contact with a knockout like you all of my parameters are increased by a thousand percent. He nodded and revealed. Well, keep your secrets if you want. Ten Ten rolled her eyes and turned back around, though not fast enough to hide the flush that spread over her cheeks once again at his compliment from his eyes. I'll get it out of you at some point. I mean, if you want to know that badly, I'll tell you for a lap dance. Daiki grinned. Tenten paused and once again looked over her shoulder at him, giving the younger boy a deadpan look. Slow down a bit hot shot, she replied drilly. We haven't even had a proper kiss yet. Never mind started dating and you want to jump straight to a lap dance? Mm. That was quite the interesting tell. You didn't deny you could give one, he pointed out. Besides, what's a kiss compared to lewdly holding hands? He joked. They had indeed been holding hands for a decent bit during their date not that long ago. What Kunoichi couldn't give a lap dance? Ten Ten snorted derisively, before turning back around and continuing down the hall. Daiki stopped in his tracks and blinked. Being able to give a lap dance is mandatory for Kunoichi? He goggled after her. Were seduction classes in the academy actually a thing? He thought that was just crap. But the girls did have some classes separate from the boys. He'd need to ask old man Hokage about that. Also, if true and he became Hokage, he'd for sure need to review the skills of all the beautiful Kunoichi. For the good of Kanoha, of course. Just to make sure they were up to par and not rusty. Moments later, they arrived at Team Guy's room, and Ten Ten opened the door, directing him inside. Daiki blinked at what he found. I kind of should have expected this. He thought. Niji was sitting on the edge of one of the three beds, the one closest to the wall and one that seemed to have been moved a bit away from the others. While Lee was doing one-handed vertical push-ups. 6,668. 6,669 dash. The bowl-cut haired boy counted off to himself, before noticing his presence. Ah! Daiki-san, good to see you. How have you been? It seemed he'd gotten quite into a little bit of training over the past two hours while Ten Ten was with him. I've been good Lee, you? He replied automatically. Sorry, what was that? Lee suddenly shouted. I am afraid I cannot hear you my ears have been damaged. Daiki rocked back on his feet, startled in spite of himself at the sudden loudness. Nai sight ye te blu. He heard Ten Ten face palm from behind him and then groan. Please fix this idiot. He seems fine to me, Daiki shrugged, looking over his shoulder to the grin at the bun-haired girl. You're not as funny as you think you are you know, she deadpanned. Why does everyone keep saying that? He rolled his eyes. First Isabu, now Ten Ten. He was hilarious and people quoted everything he said. That has never once happened before, ever, and it will never happen. The only person who thinks you are funny is yourself. Isabu deadpanned like the hater he was. Ten Ten rolled her eyes right back at him, before stepped past and reaching down and palming Lee by the face. I told you to take it easy until you got healed, didn't I you moron? She huffed, and bodily picked him up with one hand and tossed him onto the bed. What? Lee shouted in question as he landed on the bed. Ten Ten that was not very youth dash. She palmed him by the face once more, shutting him up. Please, 
Please just be quiet. She groaned, then turned her head to give him a pleading look. Please fix him up so he can go back to his normal loud volume and not this. See, I would. Daiki trailed off and gave a shrug. But my feelings have been hurt. I'm all depressed and as it turns out, my chakra control dips by negative 69 million percent when I'm feeling sad. Seriously? She gave him a dead stare. You're doing this because I said you're not funny? Hey, what's with that look? Daiki smirked for a brief second before giving a mock gasp of pain and grasping his chest in an over-the-top manner, even making sure to stagger back a bit just to add to the show and force his legs to tremble. I'll have you know I've been wounded in the heart. This is true emotional damage. I'm going to cut you. She deadpanned. Well, my chakra control is shot and now I'll have to worry about getting attacked. How am I supposed to use medical ninjutsu like that? Daiki retorted. I hate you. Hate you so much right now. Somehow, her voice became even more dead. Like wow, if her voice was a corpse right now, it would have been in worse condition than Shursue's body. Oof. Daiki grasped his, his chest even harder and stumbled back against the door. The emotional damage just doubled. Negative 69 billion chakra control now. What is happening? Lee tried to bounce up from the bed. Only kept down by 1010 10 pushing down on him. Daikius and my friend, are you okay? 1010, 10, just give him what he wants. Niji's head mechanically turned to stare at her. His somehow blank-eyed gaze, becoming even more blank. He had some real skill with his eyeballs for sure. Whatever he wants, just give him it. Whatever will shut that idiot up. I'm this close to puncturing my own eardrums. How is 69 billion doubled from 69 million? This is so stupid. She groaned. Your mind is just at a lower stage than mine, I'm afraid. My brain exists in a higher dimension. Daiki replied. His lips twitching up into a brief smirk before he hit it again. Tenton's eyebrows twitched. She totally saw it. Is that the dumbass dimension? She snarked with a huff. Oof. Daiki's legs gave out beneath him and he slumped to the ground. Limp. Daiki Esan. Lee shouted, eyes wide in horror. Is this truly my fate? How cruel. Niji rubbed his temples, trying to massage away what was no doubt quite the killer headache. All right, all right, I give up, you win. Tenton's shoulders slumped in defeat. The bun-haired older girl closed her eyes and took a deep breath. When she exhaled a few moments later and opened her eyes, a bright perky smile was on her face and she walked over to Daiki. Hips swaying, Daiki-sama. Daiki perked up. He was actually quite surprised when Tenten -ten boldly sat right down on his lap, wrapping her arms around his neck, bringing one of her hands around to gently trail a finger daintily over his cheek. You're so cool and strong Daiki-sama. I bet all the other guys around here wish they could be like you. She simpered. And so handsome too. This is all true. Daiki nodded. Though not gonna lie, wow. She can act really well. If he didn't know any better, he for sure would think he was dealing with a fangirl on the level of Sakura or Ino in their heyday of Sasuke Simpuri. And so humble, she gave a tittering giggle, crushing the flash of exasperation that appeared on her face for a brief moment expertly. Can you do me a favor, Daiki-sama, and please heal my dumb teammate? It would mean ever so much to me, she asked, leaning forward to plant a quick, chased smooch on his cheek, before pulling back to give him a pleading look. His hands grasped her hips and in one motion he rose to his feet. And suddenly I'm totally healed. He announced, Sure. I'll fix up your teammate for you, Tentenshan. Anything for a fan. You're the best Daiki-sama. She chirped, pressing another quick smooch to his cheek before letting go of him. Tentenshan. Daiki-sen. What is going on? Lee hollered, ruining the moment. Tenten -ten cringed. Daiki laughed, walking past her. Don't worry about it, leotard boy. He waved the bow cut ninja off. He noted Niji was giving both him and Tenten -ten a horrified look. His head turning from him to her and back again, back and forth, as if unable to understand what just happened, but disgusted all the same and not sure who to direct that disgust at. He could see Tenten's face burning bright red in his peripheral vision. But being a generous guy and all, he didn't stare and make it worse or comment on it. Instead, he formed a single hand seal of one of his most used jutsu and green healing chakra began to warm around his hands. When he was done healing Lee, he beat a hasty retreat. 
just to let Ten Ten calm down a bit. She hid it well, but her embarrassment at simping for him to boost his ego to do what she asked had hurt her pride a bit, and she knocked Lee out when he was still just as loud, like full-on Senban tipped with a sleeping drug, and stabbed him in the leg with it. Well, it was fine, she could heal that much herself. He wasn't afraid or anything, of course. He just wanted to let her get her emotions under control. Honest. Okay, so maybe he pushed it a bit far. I regret nothing. Daiki grinned to himself as he returned to his room, closing the door behind him. It may have embarrassed Ten Ten to put on that little act, but he got to see an all-new side of her, so it was totally worth it. And all that because she said you weren't funny. Isabu snorted. Clearly a lie. Daiki shrugged. Just because everyone else had such low levels of humor didn't mean he wasn't funny, it just meant everyone else was too dumb. Clearly. Obviously. That's a bigger delusion than Shikaka thinking he can take Karama on in a fight. Isabu scoffed. Hey, it could happen. If Shikaka fought Karama out in the desert, he'd have the advantage, and for as stupidly powerful as Karama was, he was only at half strength now at best, so he wouldn't put it past Shikaku to eke out a vict. No, it wouldn't even be close. Isabu cut him off. Even at only half capacity, Karama would still have more chakra than the other eight of us combined. And while when it comes to you humans, more chakra isn't really a full indicator of strength, it's different for us Bijou. The more chakra we have, the stronger, more durable and faster we are in general. And of course, none of us even come close to Karama's destructive output with a Bijudama. Even now, he could form one that could blow away an island and the entire surrounding area easily. Shikaku has no chance one-on-one, -on -one, even in the desert. Ha! Huh. Granted, Daiki had a good idea of how absurdly strong Karama was just from reference. After all, he did see Karama in his first Bijou transformation with Naruto, beat not only his buddy Isabu himself, but Matatabi, Son Goku, Kokuo, Saiken and Chome. And even with all six of their Bijidamas combined, Karama still countered them at full power after they had a head start in charging theirs over his. Poor poor Shikaku. Gone bear sand guy. Well at the very least, he can take pride in being a Tanuki and having the biggest balls of all. Daiki mused. We Bijou lack genitalia, I have told you this before, have I not? Isabu snorted. Oh yeah, poor, poor, poor Shikaku-chan. Indeed, Isabu laughed. While we all have rather useful and powerful abilities, in the end, Karama's raw power and strengths trumps the versatility we have over him. At full power, I would be lucky to last a few minutes in a fight against him. Karama was such a broken cheater man. Nine tail soap, bailish nerf. I'd rather whoever you're pleading to didn't. Isabu rolled his eyes. That overpowered strength will be vital in the future if things go to hell as you saw. Well, yeah. But Karama was a real dark spot. There was nothing Daiki could do to get him to cooperate with Naruto. His arrogance and hatred was just that high up there. It would be up to Naruto himself to win Karama over. If he even could this time around. The best Daiki himself could do was maybe teach Naruto how to use his powers as a Jinchuriki. And that won't be a simple issue either, Isabu pointed out. After all, I'm fully working together with you. He will have to wrestle mentally with Karama to control the chakra and resist my brother's attempts to send him into a blood rage that will attack anything in sight. Have I mentioned how much I love you, buddy? Daiki replied. Seriously, he was so, so glad he didn't need to deal with anything like that. Fake and gay. The huge turtle Bijou snorted. How can it be gay if you don't have a D? Daiki squawked, surprised at the internet meme suddenly thrown his away. A dead one at that. Watching your memories through your subconscious and learning about your former culture is a good way to pass the time. Isabu was completely unrepentant. Also, going by the logic of the culture in your former life, I identify as male. No. Daiki replied simply. I do have to say though, your taste in literature and these anime you like to watch shows your poor taste. The three-tailed bijou ignored him and continued on. You watch so much of these harem shows because of girls but ground your teeth in a rage over the main characters because of how spineless they were. I suppose your lust for voluptuous girls and the childish dream of a harem overpowered your sheer dislike. Especially of this. Hum, who was it again? Tom Aolo. Yes, that's his name. Daiki replied instantly blocking out any thought otherwise. 
Also again we're not doing this. So he disliked that the wimps that were never proactive or improved on themselves at all got all these greater girls to themselves. Sue him. He wasn't alone in that taste. Rosario Vampire just happened to be the first ever harem series he watched through. His biggest problem with them was that they were supposed to be your average Joe. But they weren't. He was an average Joe in his other life. And he was nowhere near as pitiful as those clowns. Ho! Oh, are you embarrassed? How amusing, if I knew bringing up your horrible taste in entertainment was enough to do this. I would have done it much sooner. Isabu laughed, amused. Though if it makes you feel better, I do believe you are much superior to the likes of this Tom Aolo. You know, it didn't make him feel better. That was like saying he was more interesting than a dog's turd, covered in flies, and having been baked under the sun for an entire day. I think I'll get started working on my new seal. He nodded to himself. He had two days now until the preliminary started. He was eager to add the power of Shursue's Sharingan to his Shinkigan. Isabu's laughter echoed in his head, distracting him. Damn turtle bro. With the Sharingan now in his grasp, Daiki threw himself fully into developing his new seal. It was going to be the greatest seal he'd crafted yet. Using everything he'd learned, combining much of the powerful seals he'd learned together. Taking not only from the Four Symbol Seal, but his Chakra Filter Seal, the Chakra Absorption Seal, the Dimension Force Seal, the Life Force Conversion Seal, and even the Base Makeup Seal Matrix of his Heavenly Star Seal. It might have sounded simple, claiming he was more or less combining them. But it wasn't. Not even close. For one, making them fit together was a challenge in of itself. And that wasn't taking account of the fact he needed to break down each and every seal matrix and pick and choose the right parts of each seal to conjoin together, in the process having to edit to make it mesh with other seals. A day and a half later of constant poring over the seals, experimentation, research and trying things out, and he was barely any closer than when he started. This won't work. Daiki groaned, tossing aside a huge rolled out scroll. A seal attempt scribbled on the middle. It landed on the pile of other duds. The pile that was now taller than him. Daiki rubbed at his eyes. This is even more complicated than I thought it was going to be. He huffed. He knew it wasn't going to be easy, of course. But he'd still seriously underestimated the sheer scale of what he was doing. And that wasn't taking into account the fact that he was going to be putting the seal on something as small as an eyeball. There was a limit after all to just how much a ceiling matrix could be locked and miniaturized. But it was worth the effort. Should, or rather once he managed it because he would, he would have access to all the abilities of the Sharingan. Enhanced perception, increased prediction ability, technique copying. And that was just the base. Above that, he would have access to Shursue's Manjiku Sharingan. Putting aside his crap mind control Genjutsu, there was his Susanu. With the Susanu, he could perform the majestic attire Susanu with Isabu in his full Biju mode. On top of that, he could create even more armor with Chakra with the mysterious Peacock method. With all that stacked on top of Isabu's absurdly durable shell, there would be few ever capable of breaking through their defenses. They would become an unbreakable wall, the tankiest of all tanks. His stomach growled breaking him from his delusions of grandeur. Ugh. I need something to eat. Daiki groaned, grasping his stomach. How long had it been since he last ate? Nine and a half hours. Isabu helpfully informed. Ugh, that long? While he could go longer without food if needed, he was expending a lot of chakra with his clone's training and the seal attempts, plus concentrating with all he had. Thus, his stomach got more growly faster. His eyes drifted over to the nightstand he'd pulled back out of his dimension force seal where a few empty plates were piled up. He'd sent a clone out every so often to bring him back some grub to munchity munch on. He needed his vital proteins after all for his epic muscles. Hmm. Now that he reviewed the memories he'd gotten from said clones, it seemed Eno and her team had finished the exam not long ago. Well, not long was relative because he wasn't exactly sure how long ago that was. He'd noticed them in the mess hall and stopped to say hi and the like, Eno had been totally red-faced when he did. Tamari had given him dirty looks when his clone flirted with Eno a bit, while Tenten had ignored him entirely. And his clone had caught sight of Kakashi, Asuma, 
Karinai and a few other Jonin arriving at the tower when he was out just browsing around with his eyes. Hmm. His clone had felt his frustration it seemed and had been tempted to go see about banging Karinai. Good thing he didn't. Those memories would have totally distracted him from his seal experimentation. The path of the horny was no good for this kind of thing. Though maybe getting my rocks off could clear my head a bit. He mused. There was a knock at his door, making him pause. Maybe that's Karinai now? He mused, perking up. Chakra flooded into his eyes and he peered through the door. Only to sigh in disappointment when he found himself looking at a familiar orange book toting one-eyed scarecrow wannabe. E.W. Kakashi. Why would it have been Karinai you dunce? The woman has tried her best to distance herself from you. Lest she get roped back into your embrace. Isabu asked. For that reason, she's the one that keeps coming back for more. Daiki shrugged. Standing up, Daiki stretched out the stiffness in his joints and walked over to the door, pulling it open. Yo, Daiki-chan. Kakashi greeted him with a perky eye smile and wave. Go away, I'm busy. Daiki responded flatly. He had no desire to get involved with Kakashi. Whatever the man wanted, it was going to be to borrow a word from Shikamaru and his clan, troublesome. If that noise. Ah, uh, you think you have a choice? How cute. Kakashi giggled. Still, is that any way to talk to a good mentor like figure such as myself? Technically, Kakashi did have authority over him since he was a genin and Kakashi was, you know, an elite jonin. Daiki could also technically transform into his bijou mode and bijudama the man out of existence. He was just saying that was all. When I get Shursue's Sharingan working right, I'm gonna copy and steal all your jutsu. Daiki mentally vowed. While out loud he said, Since when are you a good mentor figure? I've taught your team more jutsu than you. He deadpanned. What can I say? I'm a trendsetter. I'm so hip and cool I don't need to teach personally. They just learn from my example. Kakashi shrugged, not missing a beat. Ugh, how he hated dealing with this guy. Probably because he's one of the few people that can be as obnoxious as you. Isabu commented. Daiki ignored him. He was nowhere near as obnoxious as Kakashi after all. Honestly, with that imagination of yours, it's a shame you don't focus on Jinjutsu. You'd be an undefeated master of it. Isabu snorted. Silly turtle bro. He just didn't understand that Daiki was a really down-to-earth, kind, generous, and extraordinarily humble guy. If he wasn't, he'd be crowing from the rooftops, boasting for all he was worth and rubbing all his achievements in everybody's faces. He was amazing after all. Totally. That, that's the complete opposite of humble. Just because you don't say it out loud doesn't change that. Isabu groaned. Daiki gave an internal shrug. He disagreed. What do you want? He asked the virgin porn peddler on the other side of his room door. A new Aika Aika book, an Aika Aika movie, the Mizukage to star in the Aika Aika movie. Guy to stop wearing that horrible leotard. More new Aika Aika books dash Kakashi began rattling off. No, enough. You're not as funny as you think you are bro. Daiki cut him off. Pot meat kettle. I'm funny. You're just not smart enough to understand my humor kid. Kakashi shrugged. Anyway. Sasuke, Naruto and Sakura finished the exam not long ago. Daiki blinked. Uh, that was news to him. He glanced behind him to a clock on the wall of his provided room. There's still a good 12 hours before the next part of the exam start. He noted. They finished faster than they did in the other timeline, it seemed. Good for them. Good for them. What does that have to do with me? Daiki responded. MMM. Well, it's twofold. Naruto's exhausted and sleeping it off right now, the man informed. But Sasuke and Sakura are different. Sakura has broken her wrists and medical staff won't intervene right now for the exams unless it's life-threatening. To keep things fair and all. Oh yeah, Tenten did say something about that, didn't she? Though he didn't know that the medical staff weren't going to intervene and heal people right now. That was odd. Though it did explain partially why Tenten came to him to heal Lee instead of taking him to the infirmary. You want me to heal her, then? Daiki katoned on. See, you're not as dumb as you look after all. Kakashi's eye smile got bigger. Somehow. And as for Sasuke, well I'm sure you already know why I'm bringing him up. 
the Hokage tells me you jumped in when he had a little run-in with a certain snaky snake man after all and managed to grasp quite a bit about the cursed seal. Insulting my looks just shows how much of a jealous virgin you are. Daiki shot back, before smirking and crossing his arms. So you came to see me not only to heal one of your genin, but also to help deal with a seal you don't understand at all. I see. I see. Not much of an elite jonin are you. Of course, he left out the fact that it was just pure luck and outside world knowledge that let him understand the cursed seal itself. Hmm. You seem to have a fascination with my sexual exploits. Sorry kid I'm not into dudes. No matter how many steroids they pump into their muscles. Kakashi shrugged off his words easily. But I have no problem sealing off the cursed seal myself. It was the Hokage that told me to have you tag along. And as for Sakura, well, healing jutsu were never my forte. Medical ninja like yourself are a bit squishy and need to hang at the back as support, unlike a super powerful frontline fighter like myself. Daiki resisted the urge to click his tongue in annoyance. Just means the Hokage has more faith in me than you, which is telling really, weren't you taught by the fourth Hokage, one of the greatest seal masters like ever? He fired. And frontline fighter, that's a laugh. Can people that can't last 15 minutes in a proper fight be qualified for that role? Does someone have a small chakra capacity? He smirked tauntingly. Bigger than yours. Kakashi didn't miss a beat. And Daiki had to force his eyebrow not to twitch. Anyway, as much as I love this little game of ours kid, I'm afraid I don't really have the time to indulge your poor attempts at flirting with me. So what will it cost me to move this little shindig along? I'd like to have Sasuke and Sakura ready for the next part of the exams. Honestly, he didn't really need payment. He was just shooting the crap and giving the guy a hard time because he was a prick. Sasuke was his friend and Sakura was eye candy. Teasing the pair of them in totally different ways sounded like a fun time right about now as far as breaks went. Still, that didn't mean he wouldn't extort Kakashi with the option available to him. And he knew exactly what he wanted from the man. Tell me how you trained your Ninken summons and I'll do it, he replied. He'd ask for a lightning jutsu, but this was more worth to him right now. The thing was, he wouldn't really need them soon, at least from Kakashi. He'd be learning from the third Hokage himself over the next month. That man was sure to know plenty of lightning jutsu he could teach Daiki. Huh, figured you'd ask for a lightning jutsu. Kakashi blinked, then shrugged. Sure, fine with me kid. I'll write down how I did it and give you it later. Good. Daiki smirked. Where's your team then? He asked. He may as well get right to it. Sakura is with Naruto in their room, Kakashi replied. As for Sasuke, he's waiting right now for me. He was allowed to get checked at the infirmary because of the cursed seal. I'll be taking him to a specific room soon to apply the evil sealing method to it. I'm sure you'll be able to find your way there with those eyes of yours once you're done with Sakura. Right? Just point me towards their room for now then. Daiki shrugged. The evil sealing method, huh? He mused inwardly. That was one he hadn't been able to find an example of. So he could learn all about it from watching Kakashi and see if there was any parts of it he could put to use for himself. After letting Daiki know which room Sakura and Naruto currently occupied, Kakashi cheerily disappeared with a shunshin. Off to go, most likely take the piss out of Sasuke while they waited on him to heal up Sakura. That guy's good. Daiki begrudgingly accepted. He had a counter for literally everything the Tan Genin threw at him, verbally at least. He'd have to work on his material if he wanted to rinse the crap out of the famous copy ninja, it seemed. Just another thing to add to the grind. As always, the grind was eternal. Putting Kakashi out of mind, Daiki made his way towards the room he was directed to, down the hall. Team 7, it seemed, had picked a room near the middle. Not that they would get to enjoy it much. It seemed there was only roughly 12 hours or so before the second round ended and the third round began. Then again, the rooms were utter crap anyway. Stopping in front of the door, he wrapped it with his knuckles. He probably could have just walked in and gave Sakura a good startling for a laugh. But he had manners. Sometimes. Eh, come in. Sakura's voice called out, echoing from behind the door. Accepting the invitation, Daiki opened the door and stepped in, shutting it behind him. He was immediately greeted by loud snoring. Naruto was in the bed closest the bathroom, fast asleep, sprawled out messily, drool trickling from his mouth, down his chin and onto the pillow he was snuggling. 
Sakura herself was sitting at the edge of the middle bed, both arms held together in a set of slings made from bandages. Daiki? She blinked, looking surprised to see him. What are you doing here? What do you think I'm doing here? He raised an eyebrow at her. I'm obviously here to check in on my favorite pink-haired lady friend. I'm the only pink-haired girl you know. It's not exactly a common hair color. She replied, giving him a deadpan look. That you know of, he shrugged. Hmm, actually, was there any other pink-haired girls around? He actually couldn't remember any. The closest was probably Tayuya or Karen. Sakura sighed. If you're just here to tease me, I'm kind of not in the mood, she replied, then gave him a small glare. Besides, I'm still not happy with you. You felt me up and slapped me on the ass before running off. She reminded him. I did indeed, good times, good times, Daiki nodded sagely. But as fun as riling you up is, I'm not actually here to annoy you for funsies. She raised a skeptical eyebrow. Aha! And what are you here for then? He raised one of his own eyebrows at her in response, before forming a single hand seal, warm green healing chakra coating his hands. He gave the healing chakra an obvious glance, before looking her in the eyes. Oh! Sakura blinked in realization. Wait! How did you know I was injured? She questioned. Hmm. He was tempted to tell her he'd saw them through the walls and mess with her a bit. See if she'd gotten nude at all while in this room and get her all embarrassed. But it was probably better to heal her first than tease her. Priorities and all that. He walked over and sat on the bed beside her. Kakashi stopped by and told me. Daiki replied. Though, I already knew you were injured before he came along. I heard you did good in the forest even took out one of those sound genin. How'd you know that? The pink-haired girl asked, before blinking and freezing. Wait, were you watching? Nope. Tenten told me. Her replied. Turn around to face me. Oh, the bun-haired girl on Lee San's team? She asked and did as he said, sitting fully up on the bed and turning to face him, crossing her legs. That's the one. I actually finished up not long after I left you guys. I got bored since there was nobody interesting to fight. Daiki replied with a shrug, before reaching over hovering his hands over hers and directing the green healing chakra into them. There was an immediate reaction. Sakura sighed in relief as the mystical palm jutsu numbed the pain in her arms. And Daiki whistled as he got a good look at the damage she'd done to herself. Her wrists were snapped of course, but beyond that, there were multiple fractures spreading up from her hands to through her forearms. Better? He grinned at her. Much, thanks, she smiled her face seeming to be much less strained now. And I really do need to thank you for the jutsu you gave me. Without it, I wouldn't have been able to beat that Biechi sound girl, and they might have killed us before Sasuke Kuen woke up. Not a problem. I'm a generous guy like that. He waved off her thanks, before his grin turned impish. Though if you're dead set on thanking me, I'm a big fan of lap dances. Sakura sighed. And you ruined it. Hey, at least I'm consistent. He shrugged it off. Besides, I'm mostly joking anyway. While I'd love a lap dance from you and that awesome ass of yours, I'm just giving you a hard time for a laugh. No, no I think a hard time is exactly what you want to give me. She responded voice dry, eyebrows raising almost challengingly at him. He blinked, actually surprised and almost taken aback by Sakura throwing some innuendo his way. Sakura with the banter. Huh? Nice. Well, you're not wrong, Daiki laughed. I'd love to give you a real hard time, all night long in fact. I'm free right now in fact if you're up for it. You're such a pervert, she snorted, shaking her head. Honestly, you should be more careful. What would you do if I accepted? And no, clapping my cheeks isn't an acceptable answer. I'm talking about after that fact. Daiki opened his mouth to respond, before pausing. He wasn't at all expecting her to be so blunt about it that his shtick, and also, because he actually didn't have an answer for that. Railing her into the bed and making her scream his name to the heavens was one thing, but the after fact was something different. For one, he couldn't promise her anything, because he'd already more or less lined things up with Tenten to see about how their relationship would progress. That's my point, Sakura rolled her eyes, breaking him from his thoughts. You know, 
You gave me some hard truths about Sasuke Kuin and my naive thoughts about loving him in the forest. But isn't this more a case of the pot calling the kettle black now? You flirt so freely with girls. Spread your attention all around but can't focus on just one. Then again, maybe you aren't interested in love or a relationship and just want to sleep around. I'm not really interested in that. This took a turn he was not at all expecting. Sense and logic, his greatest weaknesses. How did she know? It actually took him a few moments to organize his thoughts and response. Honestly, you're only half right, Daiki replied, sighing. Do I want to sleep around? Yes, most guys our age do. But it doesn't mean I'm not interested in a relationship. I'm testing the waters myself, you know, to see who I mesh well with. Also, he was kind of surprised about how reasonable she was being about her infatuation with Sasuke. He kind of expected her to dig her heels in more. She'd spent years thinking she was head over heels for the guy after all. Granted, in the other timeline, she realized that her infatuation was utterly childish and not real love if he remembered right. And her infatuation turned into real affection later despite Sasuke being a traitor. And she was already older here than there. Still, I'm more surprised of you even talking about the possibility even being there, he pointed out. What with you liking Sasuke and all? Guess we're both just a couple of hypocrites then, Sakura snorted derisively. What can I say? Those hard truths of yours hit home, you apparently know far more about Sasukakin than I do. You're closer to him than I've ever been and probably ever will be, and I'm not even his type at all. It's funny how a single little fight to the death with enemy ninja can put things into perspective, and it just got my mind wandering. About? He prompted, raising an eyebrow at her in interest. A few things, she shrugged. How useless and weak I am compared to Naruto and Sasuke Kuen. How I've not been serious enough at all. Thinking back to bad decisions I made around Sasuke Kuen you. His second eyebrow joined the first. His interest totally peaked now. Me, Daiki repeated in a scance. Pretty emerald green eyes stared into his own and Sakura gave him a half smile. Sasuke Kuen never showed an ounce of interest in me looking back. No matter what I did, she replied. You did though. Actually you couldn't make your interest any more blatant. You're good looking, strong, successful, help me out. Even if you're a pervert about it. So yeah my mind wandered and I thought, what if I try going after you instead? Well, this was unexpected. Not at all unwelcome though. Of course, then I remembered you mostly just seemed to want to bed me. She continued with a shrug, then snorted. And I realized how shallow I was being. I'm mostly playing it for a laugh, you know. Daiki sighed and responded seriously. This wasn't really the time for jokes. Sure. I do want to bed you if I'm being totally honest. But that's just instinct because you're hot. You're not perfect. But nobody is to be honest. You've got your problems but I can already see them easing out of you. Actually, right now, he felt more like he was dealing with Shippuden Sakura. Rather than the pre-time skip one. Age-wise, she was only a few months off of Shippuden Sakura was at the beginning. And despite having the outfit of her pre-time skip self, she was looking more like her Shippuden self as well, especially now that her hair was cut short. It was what, October now? If he remembered right, her birthday was in March, so she was six months from being 15. Sakura chuckled lightly. Now see, if you were serious like this all the time, then I might have went all in and chased you. She teased. That'd be so boring though. Daiki laughed along. I did the serious thing before, remember? All through the academy, in fact, life is much more fun now that I've changed things up. They fell into easy, more comfortable conversation after that while he continued healing her. He asked mostly about what went on with them in the forest after he left behind and got more or less the full story of what went down, which more or less lined up with what he already knew and what Ten Ten told him. After that, they took the sound team's earth scroll and continued on, struggling here and there, before they ran into Kabuto who had been separated from his team. And from there, things progressed as he remembered, with them running into one of the other rain teams, Sasuke being unable to do anything, the same with Sakura since she was injured, with broken wrists and all in Naruto carrying them to victory. Though he apparently had a much easier time of winning this time around and defeated them within around 10 minutes, apparently. Probably because he didn't have to worry about his chakra being messed from the five elemental seal. Daiki mused inwardly. And also because he was apparently able to box in the rain shinobi's clones with the earth style. Barrier making it easy to catch them out until they were all fakes. 
Before he knew it, over a half hour passed and he finally finished up healing her, taking care of both the broken wrists and the fractures going from her hands to up her forearms. Medical ninjutsu is really amazing. My arms feel pretty much fully healed. Sakura flexed her hands after removing her slings once he was done. Yeah, it's super helpful, Daiki nodded. I've taken care of all your injuries, but your arms might be a little tender, so don't strain them too much for the next little while and just rest up until the next exam starts. All right, I'll do that, she nodded, before eyeing her hands thoughtfully. Hey, do you think I'd be able to learn medical ninjutsu as well? Yep, Daiki replied instantly. Sakura blinked. That was fast, she noted, looking surprised. I know how good you are, he shrugged. I don't doubt you'd be able to learn medical ninjutsu pretty easily. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if you had a real talent for it. Maybe you could even rival Tsunade one day if you go for it? Of course, he already knew she did and could do so. She had the potential to be the best medic ninja in the world, rivaled only by Tsunade herself. Her cheeks took on a red flush at his words. You think so? She asked. Not a doubt in me, he confirmed with a grin. The flush got deeper and a pretty smile spread across her face. See, you can be charming when you want to be. Sakura teased, a slight giggle escaping her. What do you mean? I'm always charming. Daiki's grin widened and he gave her a wink. Only you think that. She shook her head and looked up at him. Pretty smile aimed straight at him. Thanks. Not a problem. Getting some alone time with you is a pretty fair deal in Ikshadash. He was cut off by a resounding snore coming from a certain spiky-haired blonde. Well, mostly alone, he amended. Sakura looked over her shoulder and gave the sleeping blonde a dry look. Well, he's earned the rest, I guess. He really pulled through for us there at the end. She mused before turning back to look at Daiki. And I wouldn't mind doing this again sometime. Hit me up whenever you want, Daiki shrugged. I can even help you get started on learning medical ninjutsu if you want. Let me guess, in return for a lap dance? The pink-haired girl's pretty smile turned teasing. Well, I definitely wouldn't say no, he grinned. Her teasing grin just got wider. Hmm, I'll think about it, she responded, stepping forward and surprising him by standing on her tiptoes and pressing a kiss against his cheek. Right now, though, I've got doctor's orders to rest, so I'm going to sleep a bit, so it's time for you to go bye-bye. Or I could join you. He wiggled his eyebrows. There'd be no sleeping or resting involved then I'm afraid, right? She snorted, stepping by him and opening the door. So bye-bye for now, perv boy. Fair enough. He chuckled, turning around and leaving out of the door. Just before he stepped past her though, he reached out faster than she could react and took a nice big handful of her butt and squeezed, just grabbing my payment. He grinned widely. He was expecting to have to dodge a punch, but instead, Sakura barely reacted at all, and merely raised an eyebrow at him. I knew you were going to do that, she snorted, and yet she didn't try to stop him, and wasn't attempting to remove his hand. He gave her full, round but cheek another hefty grope, grin widening. Sakura sighed, if you leave that hand there much longer, I'm keeping it, she told him dryly. He gave her but another nice squeeze, getting a fell for the bouncy cheek filling his palm, before letting go. I'm tempted to let you, but sadly, that annoying guy Kakashi needs me to do something else for him. He huffed, stepping outside into the hallway. That's too bad. Sakura suddenly pouted at him, leaning on the door. I was kind of liking that there and was thinking of giving you that lap dance, and another confirmation that a kunoichi could give a lap dance. Seriously, what did they teach in those kunoichi-only classes? But more importantly, really? His eyes lit up excitedly. Yeah, no, you're not that lucky, buddy. Sakura snorted and promptly shut the door in his face. That's not nice, Sakura. He called through the door. Ah, I'm soaked with sweat and this thong I'm wearing is just digging in. I should really take it off, her voice echoed back, definitely teasingly. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. He, of course, could just peek through the door and wall themselves with his shinkigan. But that would mean he lost. Freaking Kakashi. Daiki huffed, mustering his mighty grind enhanced will power and self-control and walking away. It wasn't really the copy ninja's fault.
but it just felt good to blame it on Kakashi. What most of the people currently visiting the tower in the middle of the Forest of Death probably didn't know was that the tower itself had a basement level. Daiki himself wouldn't have known about it either. If not for the fact he could literally see through any solid object with but a glance with his Shinkigan. So a sweeping look revealed it to him during his first day in the tower. And another sweeping glance with his eyes after he left Sakura behind revealed to him that the basement level was exactly where Kakashi and Sasuke were. Honestly, finding the door to the basement took more time than finding their whereabouts. He even stopped a passing Chunin patrolling the halls about it, who had no idea what he was talking about. As it was, it took him a few minutes to locate the door. Freaking Kakashi, couldn't that lazy prick do anything helpful? Oh Daiki, by the way, the door is located over there, that was all he needed to say. But no, as always, he had to make things way more difficult than they needed to be. Because he was a prick. There wasn't even any stairs, just an inclined little hill kind of thing. It was subtle as all hell, to the point where he missed it a few times when searching with his eyes. The basement level itself was odd. It was really only one big massive room, filled with pillars going up into the ceiling. He had no idea what purpose this place served at all. Granted, he also didn't really care. Though with all the huge, sturdy pillars around, his best guess was that it was a place used for chaining up huge beasts, which made a slight bit of sense considering all the massive beasts in the Forest of Death. Though the why still eluded him, he found Sasuke and Kakashi quite quickly, making his way through the huge basement level room towards them. His eyes revealed to him, though, that there was a fourth in the room. Hidden underground, not far away from Sasuke and Kakashi, their presence completely concealed. Daiki hid a grimace, Orochimaru. He made sure not to look directly at the man or stare and give away that he knew he was there. He didn't want to spook the man into action. With what he revealed the other day, he might feel his plans were jeopardized and try to kidnap Sasuke right here and now. His serpentine yellow gaze followed him with interest, and Daiki ignored him as best he could as he made his way over to his friend and the copy prick. Crap. I didn't even consider that. Daiki cursed inwardly. He'd left Sasuke and his team behind in the forest, after showing he was capable of destroying Orochimaru's soul fragment in the Cursed Seal. He hadn't even considered the fact that the man might just have taken Sasuke because of Daiki and not risk losing his future vessel. Stupid of him. He'd need to think things through a bit more. He was lucky this time, but the consequences of his actions needed to be understood more. He put that out of mind for now though as he approached the student and teacher pair waiting for him. Well, 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 if it isn't little Timmy and the would-be criminal. Daiki said in greeting as he reached them. It was an odd sight. While Kakashi was the same as usual, Sasuke knelt within a ceiling circle on the ground. Shirtless. Lines of ceiling kanji were painted all over his torso, leading down like chains onto the ground, going on for a few feet before reaching up and spreading across multiple pillars. So this was the evil sealing method seal array, or rather, it was extended compression seals, spread out over a larger surface to make it easier to compress the seal matrix onto a smaller target. It showed Kakashi's lack of skill when it came to sealing, because just from a cursory glance, he already had a decent understanding of the evil sealing method. I could apply this with only a fraction of the space. He mused. But this was something he hadn't considered. Using an amateur's tool, which would be akin to someone tracing another drawing and calling themselves an artist in scale, to apply a seal. With this method, I could use it to compress the seals for my eyes. He mused. I think he's talking to you, Sasuke. Kakashi mused, idly turning a page in his smutty book. Just ignore it. He says random crap that nobody understands all the damn time. Sasuke rolled his onyx eyes and looked at Daiki a frown on his lips. Tsh, so you were totally fine, unlike me apparently. Sakura told you then? He asked in reply. Yes. Sasuke clicked his tongue. Told me you shook off the pain of that seal unlike me real quick, and then made it your own. Even used the power boost it gave you to blow that Orochimaru guy away. Well, almost right. If it was that easy to kill him, he wouldn't have lasted to this point. He escaped my jutsu without any problem. Daiki shrugged. As for the cursed seal, well, let's just say that I'm just built different from you. 
He added and gave Sasuke a pointed look before touching his thumb to the right side of his chest. Sasuke's eyes widened minutely before he quickly smothered his surprised look, returning to his usual impassive expression. I see. His frown deepened. Hmm. Kakashi looked up from his book at their silent conversation before shrugging. So, the Hokage tells me you have a way of not only dealing with the problems of the Cursed Seal, making it safe to use, but also improving upon it. Hmm, well obviously the old man would tell Kakashi about it. Not quite, I've made my own safe to use and improved upon it, in fact by my estimates, the power boost it gives me has been increased by a bit over 50%, Daiki replied. The problem is, the way I made it safe for me isn't something I can replicate for anyone else. Kakashi's eyebrow raised and he gave him a searching look. If the Hokage told him of this, no doubt he told him of the fact that he could in fact do something about the Orochimaru soul fragment in other seals as well. He was just holding off on it for now. Drop it for now. Daiki projected his chakra into a message and directed it into Kakashi's mind. Hmm. Well that's disappointing, Kakashi mused. You're really quite useless here then, huh? He needled. Like you're one to talk. Look at the mess of the ceiling array, Daiki scoffed. I could get this seal down in a few hours and apply it with just my chakra, and you're supposed to be a student of the Yandame Hokage, one of the greatest sealing experts to ever live, probably the best outside of the Uzumaki clan period. Uzumaki clan? Sasuke's eyes widened a bit. He seemed a bit shocked to learn of such a thing. Yeah, extinct now except for a few like Naruto, but we used to be allies with them, in fact we still wear their symbol, Daiki jabbed his thumb at Kakashi's flak jacket, pointing to where the Uzumaki swirl was displayed proudly. They were known for having absurd vitality, powerful chakra and stamina and being absolute monsters when it came to the sealing arts. As in so good they even make me look like an amateur, and I'm pretty amazing. Absurd vitality, powerful chakra and stamina. Huh? Just like Naruto. Sasuke mused thoughtfully. Yup, honestly, odds are, Naruto might be the last of his clan like you... Daiki pointed out. Actually, I know you're a crap teacher and all Kakashi, but why haven't you tried to at least get him started on the basics? He might be a spastic, but his actual talent is only something an idiot would miss. Hmm. You seem to know a lot about the Uzumaki clan and Naruto in general. Kakashi pointed out instead of answering. Always with the run around with this prick. Our alliance with the Uzumaki clan is well established in older textbooks, and what clown would pursue the sealing arts without knowing of the foremost masters of the art? Daiki replied with a shrug. Hell you don't even need to teach him yourself. If you just told him he had a clan and they specialized in seals, he'd pursue it himself. That was just how much the blonde desired family. That even for just a connection to his clan he'd pursue it all. Eh. Just didn't occur to me. Kakashi waved him off blandly. This guy. Ignore Kakashi. I'll tell him about it once this exam is done, so he doesn't obsess over it in the next round. Sasuke cut in. Now enough of this crap, can we get a move on here? You two might be having fun bantering like fools, but I'm not having a good time kneeling here with my own blood painted all over me. You're such a spoil sport Sasuke, Kakashi pouted. But, I suppose since your little friend is utterly useless, we can get a move on. Don't bijudama him. Don't bijudama him. I want to bijudama him. Daiki's eye twitched in annoyance. He'd even be pragmatic about it and fire it in the direction of Orochimaru while he was at it. Get rid of two annoying pricks for one biju bomb. And everybody won. Except Kakashi and Orochimaru. But who cared about them? You'd also blow away the entire tower and much of the surrounding area. Isabu added his input. That was a sacrifice he was willing to make as long as it shut Kakashi up for a bit. All right, brace yourself Sasuke. This might sting a bit, Kakashi said, stowing his book away and walking over to stand behind Sasuke and ran through a few hand seals. Just get on with Dash Sasuke began, only to be cut off by Kakashi. Evil sealing method, Kakashi declared finishing his hand seals and pressing his hand flat against the cursed seal on Sasuke's neck. The Uchiha's onyx eyes went wide and a howl of agony erupted from his throat almost immediately, his body beginning to convulse. The sealing kanji spread out over his back. The floor and the pillars began glowing and retracted from the pillars, shrinking from the floor and retreating up onto his back. At moments it was over, 
the massive lines of kanji gone and replaced by a ring of sealing kanji circling around the cursed seal on Sasuke's neck. Kakashi pulled his hand from Sasuke's back, and the boy slumped over onto the ground, sweating profusely and panting deeply and rapidly, eyes wide. So, even if the cursed seal awakens again, this seal will suppress it, Kakashi began explaining nonchalantly. Though Sasuke, the foundation of this seal is your own will power, you have to want it to work and not be led stray by the temptation of the cursed seal's power. If you give in and rely on its power, the evil sealing method will be useless, so dash, blah, blah, blah. Daiki cut him off rolling his eyes, Sasuke, if you rely on the seal, Orochimaru will brainwash you and take over your body so don't just be a little biatch. I already own this biatch ass seal and made it my own, you can't because you're too weak and unskilled, that's it, so if you have to rely on it, it just means you're a weak piece of trash in the end and you'll never come close to Itachi. Honestly, Kakashi didn't understand Sasuke at all. The best way to make him not rely on the cursed seal was to biatch slap his pride and rub his balls all over it. Sasuke scoffed at his words, a smirk spreading across his face at Daiki's words. Look at you acting all high and mighty just because you've got a crappy seal that gives you a little power boost, he said. Don't forget who you're speaking to loser. Even with that seal, your eyes and all your other little advantages, I'll still beat your ass in a fight. Daiki crouched down in front of the other boy and smirked. Tough talk. Let's see you prove it, he replied. I'll wait for you in the finals. Try and keep up. Eh, Cage? It'll be fun to see you talking so big when I'm punching your face in. Sasuke began replying, even as his eyes dimmed and his consciousness left him. Before his face could smack into the ground, Daiki caught him and hoisted his friend up onto his shoulder. He'd keep him safe himself. If Orochimaru tried to go for him and take him now, he'd blow him away full power. While he wanted to keep his status as a Jinchuriki hidden, he was surprised to find that he wouldn't hesitate to unleash his full power as the Sanbai Jinchuriki alongside his heavenly star seal to keep him safe from Orochimaru. When did I become such a fool? He wondered idly. It really was odd. Initially, he only planned to use these people and Kanoha as a whole to make sure he survived the coming apocalypse. But somewhere along the way, he'd come to respect and care for them. Kukukuku? A familiar hissing laugh echoed through the underground basement. Now wasn't that an interesting little show? Kakashi's eyes widened and he immediately fell into a ready stance, pushing up his headband. Daiki, don't move from my side, he said, utterly serious. It was an interesting change from the Kakashi he was used to dealing with, and it seemed he hadn't at all sensed Orochimaru until the man decided to introduce himself. From behind one of the pillars, the pale snake-faced man, dressed in what looked like a Kanoha Jonin uniform made his way out, though it was different, where Kanoha's base was a dark blue, this was a pale purple and the flak jacket a grayish blue. He'd outright copied the uniform of Kanoha for his sound village, it seemed. kakashi -kuen. It seems you've even dabbled in the sealing arts these days. Impressive? Orochimaru's eyes gleamed as he looked from Kakashi to meet Daiki's own eyes. And daiki -kun, so good to see you again. He licked his lips with a long, snake-like tongue. Yeah, nice to see you not frozen over and charred by lightning I suppose, Daiki replied blandly before smirking. If I were you, I'd toddle off because I won't hold back this time. He added and as he did, he pulled not only on the heavenly star seal, but also Isabu's chakra. Lightning-like marks spread across his body, and the whites of his eyes shimmered and turned into a ringed purple. This was more or less the same setup he had against Orochimaru in the forest before. But now, he was even stronger. Not only was his base form a decent bit stronger from the energy from the fragment of Jell, but even the heavenly star seal gave a much improved boost compared to the cursed seal. In fact, with the Star Chakra and Jellal energy amplifying it, it was close to double the strength, at least hovering around the 1.75 times mark. So 75% stronger boost-wise. The boost it gave was near enough comparable to two of Isabu's base chakra cloak tails. With it and his initial Jinchuriki stage, he was around the same strength right now as back when he used the hero's water. Orochimaru didn't bat an eye at his threat, instead his eyes seemed to brighten with interest. So Kakashi was not lying when he said you improved upon the cursed seal. How interesting. He hummed. You really are quite the specimen Daikikuin Kukuku. So 
Surprisingly, before Daiki could reply to the snake Sanin, Kakashi stepped in front of him, cutting the man's vision from him, glaring at Orochimaru. So not only Sasuke, but Daiki has your interest as well, huh? Kakashi huffed. Tell me Orochimaru, what do you plan to gain from all this? Why go after Sasuke? Daiki felt the urge to roll his eyes. There was only one thing Sasuke had that Orochimaru wanted. It was obvious hell he'd already told the Hokage and the like what he wanted. He supposed Kakashi didn't get the memo. That, or he was fishing for more information. Oh, you know how it is. Two guys have it already and this third one just has to have it cuckoo. Orochimaru laughed lightly. Three, I suppose if you're counted and all things considered, it hasn't been all that long since you were given it by your dearly departed little friend. So that's it then. Kakashi replied, voice monotone. Indeed, it's the Sharingan. Orochimaru revealed, spreading his arms wide, grandiosely. But pardon my rudeness. I have no interest in you, kakashi -kun. Unlike sasuke -kun, you're useless to me, I'm afraid. I have no need of an imperfect Sharingan user. Well, obviously, Daiki scoffed. If it was just about implanting the Sharingan like Kakashi, you could have raided the corpses of the Uchiha ages ago and got it like that. You want the natural ability to use it like an actual Uchiha, and for that you need to have the body of an Uchiha. Orochimaru's eyes lit up. Indeed. So intelligent aren't you Daikikuen? He hissed, seeming very pleased by his words. Unfortunately, all the Uchiha are now dead, beyond Itachi and sasuke -kun. And I'm sure you understand why I target sasuke -kun. Because you're too scared to face Itachi? Daiki taunted. He was looking for a rise out of the man, to break that amused facade and see about making him sloppy by attacking his pride. Orochimaru just chuckled. Well, you're still but a young lad Daiki -kun. All that talent and power doesn't change that, he replied in amusement. Subduing Itachi and taking his body is much more of a challenge than taking young sasuke -kun from the Leaf Village. It's just that simple, and I'm quite the pragmatic man you see. His taunt washed over him like a pitiful stream against a mountain and was turned aside. Daiki clicked his tongue. Taunting was useless. What about insults then? So you're just a coward then looking for easy prey? He shrugged. But this isn't an orphanage, Petamaru. So I suggest you walk away before I might break my foot off in your scrawny ass. Could have fooled me. What with all the orphans in here and all. Cuckoo. Orochimaru laughed his words off. But do feel free to continue. The feeble banter point of battles are ever so amusing sometimes. I'm sure your mind is twisting and turning desperately trying to come up with options to combat me or escape. Damn, that was cold. His insults and taunting were completely ineffective here. But then, he understood it. What were the words of some little weakling when you towered so high above them like a lion over an ant? Or at least that was probably how Orochimaru saw the current situation. Shows what you know. I could escape from you instantly and you couldn't do a thing about it? Daiki scoffed at him. If it wasn't for Sasuke being vulnerable, I'd be beating your ass like you owed me money right now. Literally, he could escape to Isabu's personal dimension at any time. He was just reluctant to show it off in front of Orochimaru unless he was forced to. Well, you're welcome to try my interesting little friend. Orochimaru smiled widely, spreading his arms out invitingly, daring him to come at the man. Though I should add, that if you feel brave because Kakashikuen is here, he wouldn't make a difference I'm afraid. I'm sure he remembers how our last encounter went. I was barely a man at that time, Kakashi refuted. This won't go like that time. I'm far stronger than I was then. In response, Orochimaru chuckled derisively. No, no you are not, he replied, denying his words. In fact, I dare say you're weaker. You've lost that edge you had back then Kakashikuen, and let all that potential you had go to waste. Jonin at a mere 13 years of age and with potential to rival our dearly departed minato -kuen, or at least near his own. But look at you now, you're older now than minato -kuen was when he died. And yet you don't even come close to his strength, what a disappointment you turned out to be. He's gonna need a fragment of jell for that one. Daiki resisted the urge to wince. That was a real burn right there. He had to resist the urge to clap. He was impressed. Surprisingly, Kakashi didn't react much at all to the insult and kept his cool. Feel free to think so, true I may be weaker physically, rusty from the peace we've enjoyed, but I've learned much along the way, the copy ninja replied. 
There may be a gap between us Orochimaru, a substantial one, but don't think for a moment I don't have ways to cross it. Hmm. Is that so? Orochimaru hummed thoughtfully. That is interesting, I wonder. How exactly you would do that though? The Manjikyu, perhaps? Did all that grief you went through in your younger years unlock it? Or mayhaps you've learned how to use the gates from Gaikuin? I remember you were quite close to him, were you not? Kakashi stilled only for a very brief second. But neither Daiki nor Orochimaru missed it. Oh, so the eight gates then? Orochimaru mused. Interesting. So the Sharingan even allows you to copy that method? Wait, it does. Daiki had to resist the urge to let his own eyes widen at that information. He had no idea how he would get Guy to teach him to open the gates. And here the solution dropped right into his lap. Once he had Shursue's Sharingan, he could just copy the method. Perceptive as always, aren't you Orochimaru? I suppose you weren't called one of the greatest prodigies to ever come from Kanoha without reason. Kakashi all but admitted he was right. But you guessing it doesn't change anything. I'm known as the master of a thousand jutsu for a reason. Do you feel confident enough to take on all that jutsu amplified by the eight gates? Now this is interesting. Daiki eyed Kakashi thoughtfully. This had went completely off script. Originally, Kakashi would have been stunned into inaction by Orochimaru the gulf in their strength that massive. But here, Kakashi was ready to fight him and even had a plan to beat him. The eight gates would mess him up for sure, but it was still quite the hand to play. Even Orochimaru couldn't take that lightly, especially not with Daiki here. He already knew one little mistake would be all it took for Daiki to fire off the same jutsu he had in the forest of death. And if he couldn't escape it in time like he had before, he would die. Well, that would be troublesome for sure, Orochimaru tapped his chin. Of course I would still beat you Kakashikuin, but it would become a bit of an exercise in doing so, and of course all that commotion would have reinforcements come running. Then he smirked. A good threat Kakashi, how about I return the favor? He replied, and ever so casually, went through a few hand seals, before reaching down and pressing his hands against the ground, maintaining eye contact with Kakashi and Daiki and almost daring them to act. Daiki's eyes widened. He recognized those hand seals. The ground rippled and from it, a wooden coffin emerged from the ground. Oddly though, it wasn't as he was expecting. The coffin was open still, and there was no formidable shinobi within it. But rather, a girl. A girl he recognized, wrapped to the chin in bandages. Her black eyes was wild with panic and terror. Orochimaru-sama, please, I'm sorry we failed you. Please have mercy. Kintsuchi begged him. What is this? Kakashi growled at him, and it was the first how of pure emotion he'd given since Orochimaru appeared. The state of kin actually inflamed his temper. Orochimaru opened his mouth, but Daiki cut him off before he could. It's Edo Tensei, the Naidame Hokage's Jutsu, he explained. Using a living sacrifice, it lets you summon someone that's already dead back to the world of the living as a puppet to fight under your orders, as long as you have their DNA. Orochimaru's eyes actually widened. You know of it, Daikikuin? My interest in you grows ever more, he hissed out, almost moaning in happiness, before he turned his attention back to Kakashi. Indeed, this is the Edo Tensei Jutsu. You showed me your hand. I thought, why not show you mine? And as kind as I am, I thought, why not let you have a reunion with your dear departed and beloved teacher, Minato Kuin? Kakashi's eyes widened in absolutely horror. Minato can't be summoned. His soul is in the Shinigami's stomach. Daiki's mind raced. This could be a real problem. But nothing stopped Orochimaru from changing who he summoned. And if he summoned Hashirama Senju, then they were absolutely reeked. Even with him being weakened from the non-improved Edo Tensei that Kabuto would perfect later, he was still a Kage-level shinobi, beyond anyone currently in this room. And with the Mokutan, he could suppress the power of a Bijou, which would totally invalidate Daiki's trump card. Or perhaps I could let you meet you dearly departed little friends. I wonder what Abitakun or Rinchan's reactions would be to Kakashiku and all grown you dash. He was cut off by two swords appearing in the air besides Daiki, crackling with lightning chakra. Twin streams of lightning shot towards Orochimaru, forcing the man to quickly evade and Daiki didn't waste the surprise attack. 
he thrust his free hand out behind him, firing off the a blast of pure force, jettisoning him forward at the same time he rushed towards Orochimaru. A split moment later, his foot smashed into the wooden coffin, right behind Kin's head and shattered it. And as he landed, he grabbed up Kin in his free hand and launched himself backwards, landing beside Kakashi. It was such a sudden attack, neither Kakashi or Orochimaru spoke for a moment. It only lasted a moment though. Orochimaru chuckled once more. How ruthless Daikikuin, and we were having such a pleasant conversation too. He shook his head. And here I was being kind, not only offering Kakashikuin the chance to meet with those he misses so dearly, but even offering up one of the three that tormented his precious Genin in the forest not long ago. Kin on his shoulder whimpered, but didn't speak. I'm not interested in sappy crap like that. Daiki shrugged, even with balancing both Kin and Sasuke on his shoulder. Honestly, this has dragged on way too long. I'm a busy guy you see, so I cut that crap off at the head, or well I will after I rip yours off if you don't piss off already. Ah, uh, Daiki Kuin, do you think little Kin is the only sacrifice I've prepared? I have dozens just waiting, Orochimaru Tutaid. And now you have even more baggage and made yourself a target. How do you plan to fight if you have to carry around Sasuke Kuin and this useless little girl? In response, a jet of lightning shot from one of the Kiba blades hovering by his side and Orochimaru tilted his head to the side, easily avoiding the attack. I think I'll manage, he replied dryly. Well, if you want her Daiki Kuin, feel free to keep her. She's very much disposable, not like you and Sasuke Kuin. Orochimaru shrugged the attack off nonchalantly. Say Daiki Kuin, it may be a bit abrupt, but why don't you cut your ties with the Leaf Village and join me? Kanoha has squandered your talent for sure. Not a single person to teach you. With my teachings, you could very well surpass the Hokage of the past. Kakashi growled again, and I Daiki from the corner of his eyes. I'm good, Daiki snorted. I don't need your help. Now now, let's not be too short-sighted here. Talent only goes so far, my young friend. Orochimaru waggled his finger reproachfully. And this village will soon be a thing of the past. It won't be long before I raise it to the ground. No, you won't. Daiki denied flatly, instantly. The flat denying and so quickly actually caused Orochimaru to blink in surprise. Oh, and how can you be so sure? He replied. You haven't even seen a glimpse of my true strength yet, my young friend. And the village hidden in the sound. I created it. They are all my loyal subordinates. Do you think Kanoha can stand up to myself with a village at my back? I just got done fixing up my house and my buddy's pond. You destroying the village means you'll destroy my house, where I live, keep my crap and relax. Not to mention, this village has tons of hot girls. Daiki deadpanned before narrowing his eyes. If you try it, I'll kill you and raise your village to the ground instead. Hmm. Well, that is a pity. Orochimaru shrugged, unconcerned. Well, I'm sure your answer will change in the future when you see what's in store for Kanoha. I can wait, and am unbothered by the arrogance of a child who doesn't understand the situation. Casually, the pale man stuffed his hands into his pockets and turned, walking away. And I've seen all I needed to know. He looked over his shoulder at them both and grinned. Sasuke Kuin desires power above all else, since you cannot get rid of my cursed seal. The day will come when he seeks me out for that power. If my hands weren't full, I'd be sticking the middle finger up at you. Daiki replied with a snort. Please imagine I'm doing so. Very well, I'll do that. Orochimaru nodded and casually walked away, disappearing behind the pillars out of sight, his presence vanishing. For Kakashi and any normal person at least, Daiki stared through the pillars and watched him go, sinking into the ground with a single hand seal and making a straightforward path out of the building into the forest. Kakashi sighed, relaxing. Well, that was fun. The man commented idly, a bead of sweat trailing down the side of his face. Meh, that guy's a clown, Daiki scoffed. He's all big talk. I could take him. He'd have been in for a fight shock if he really tried to fight. Daiki would have dumped Kin and Sasuke's asses in Isabu's dimension, went full three-tailed cloak and unleashed all of his clones currently training in there while he was at it. Saying he's all big talk is quite funny from you, it's like your favorite pastime, Kakashi snorted. You might have your big turtle trump card, but if a single one of them going up against him was enough to bring him down, he wouldn't have reached this point. Doublespeak, why was he? 
All right, Kintsukuhi was currently privy to everything they were talking about. Sure, she seemed too terrified to even move in his grasp right now, but her ears were still working. Not true, my favorite pastime is getting laid. Unlike you, Virgin Kashi, Daiki snorted fight back. And how many of my kind has he actually fought? Never mind a perfect one like myself. Unless he ever fought Killer B or Yagura, then I doubt he's at all prepared to face me. You'd kill everyone in this tower by accident if you tried to go full power. Kakashi shook his head. Without it, he'd be privy to your secret. Know what's going and flee before you could kill him. And he'd come up with multiple plans to deal with you. Orochimaru is not someone we can ever underestimate. Ugh. I hate it when you're right. Daiki clicked his tongue before shaking his head. So what will we do about this girl then? Kintsuchi is her name from what I remember from when I was scoping out the first exam. Can I keep her? She's cute enough and I've been looking to get some maids for my place. He'd show Sasuke he could get hot maids. Yeah. No. Kakashi rolled his eyes and replied flatly. She's a foreign kunoichi and former subordinate of Orochimaru. What is wrong with you, kid? A foreign subordinate he was going to kill, whom I saved the life of, and I'm stronger than Orochimaru. I'm totally badass, Daiki replied, trailing off in a tangent before getting back on track. I doubt she's going to betray anything to the guy who'd snap her neck for a laugh. He felt the girl on his shoulder stiffen and swallow heavily. Still, not going to happen, Kakashi shook his head. We need to have her interrogated and learn all we can about Orochimaru and this sound village. Well, obviously, Daiki rolled his eyes. But beyond being a foreign kunoichi, she hasn't exactly committed any crimes against us, and she won't be allowed to go freely, so she can be my maid after that. She tormented Sakura and tried to kill her and the rest of my team. Kakashi deadpanned. It's the Chunin exams. Do you know how many people I killed in the forest? Daiki scoffed. Hell he planned on murdering the sensei of one of the teams he killed while he was at it. Brutally so. Besides, Sakura kicked her ass. She's lucky Sakura isn't built to use my jutsu or she'd be dead in fact. You know I'm actually not in a position to grant any of that anyway, right? Kakashi rolled his eyes right back at him. If you want to have her as a maid instead of her being kept in a cell or killed, take it up with the Hokage. Fine. Daiki shrugged. Good. Kakashi shrugged. By the way, get bent Kakashi. Daiki replied. Control your raging hormones, brat. Kakashi replied. F you. Daiki retorted. No thank you. Kakashi retorted. And they bickered right up until they left the underground basement, where they parted ways, Daiki taking Sasuke to the infirmary and to keep an eye on him until he woke up, and Kakashi taking Kin to be interrogated. Daiki being the ever-generous, ever-dutiful good buddy he was, carried Sasuke like a sack of potatoes over his shoulder to the infirmary. The two Chunin guarding the door of it gave him odd looks, but didn't stop him. In fact, they gave him respectful bows of their heads, probably because the pair of them were present when he was mouthing off at Danzo with the full support of Old Man Third. Finally, some respect around this joint. Once he closed the door behind him, totally not banging Sasuke's head on the door frame as he entered, Honest, he noticed that the place was empty. The med Neen on staff was out for whatever reason. Well, whatever, Daiki shrugged, picking out the nearest bed and walking over to it. Sleep tight, princess. He unceremoniously dropped the Uchiha onto the bed, his body almost bouncing right off the bed, before pulling the curtains around the bed around and hiding him from view. Then he plopped down on the chair beside the bed and kicked his feet up on the infirmary bed crossing his arms behind his head and relaxed. He sat there relaxing for all of a half hour, before the boredom really seriously got to him. This is mind-numbing. He groaned, head lolling back over the chair and looking up at the ceiling. He couldn't even train in this place. There was hardly any space with all the medical equipment, beds and crap around. Even making sure Sasuke was comfortable and covered up in the bed after dropping him on it for a laugh didn't do anything. And he couldn't even leave this place, since he was guarding Sasuke. I really need to get my hands on a gaming console or something. He groaned aloud. Looking into it, he had found that indeed game consoles did exist in this world. Not ones that measured up quite to the ones in his memories, but he had found a few portable ones, the most up-to-date one being reminiscent of a Game Boy. 
The problem was they were pretty new in release made by a company at the Crescent Moon Islands, and they didn't sell them outside of there. So he would need to get a mission to head there to buy one, which was a trip and a half for sure. And beyond that, there wasn't even anything really interesting going on at the Crescent Moon Islands for him to pick up. The Crescent Moon Islands events that Naruto, Sakura, Lee and Kakashi all got involved in, didn't involve any particularly powerful object or chakra source. It was just one dude using a team of ninja trying to take over the kingdom after killing the royal family. That might not be a bad idea on of itself to take care of though. He mused with a sigh. If he put a stop to it and got the gratitude of the royal family in place of Naruto, he could see about getting funding from them for the village if him having to take over came to pass. Though if crap did go down like the other timeline and Old Man Third died in the invasion, he wouldn't exactly be able to leave the village himself to take care of it. Well, a clone could do it I suppose. He shrugged or a team of them hyped up by Isabu's chakra. They should be capable of taking care of that nonsense. And then he could get trade open with the Crescent Moon Islands. And get game consoles sent over here. A good plan. But not really anything that eases my boredom right now. Daiki sighed. Sitting up straight in the chair. He cast a look at the Uchiha peacefully snoozing away in the bed beside him. And his expression turned deadpan. Having a good rest I see. He drummed his fingers on his thighs. If he was awake at least they could banter to pass the time and neither of the two Chunin outside garnered much interest from him. Now, if one or both of them were females, that might have changed, but such was life. His eyes stayed focused on Sasuke, and with how bright the room was in the infirmary, he noticed just how pale the body was. Bro, you need a tan. We should hit up the beach or something for a vacation, he pointed out. Seriously, the dude was as pale as a ghost. If he got any paler, he'd look like chalk white and ever sigh-like. Honestly, his skin looked like a blank canvas. Wait. A grin spread across Daiki's face and he held his hand out. With a thought. Summoning his seal brush from his Dimension Force seal. He stood up and leaned over the sleeping Uchiha. This is your own fault for falling asleep around your best buddy? I mean, it's tradition as well. He excused his future actions. He gently swiped the paint brush over the other teenager's face. First, around the eyes with a pair of black ink circles, connected by a line over the bridge of the nose. Then, he went downwards to just above his mouth, and drew a nice big long and curly mustache and curled around so much his full cheeks were black ringed. Heh, classic. Daiki laughed to himself. Something was missing though. Oh right. Daiki's eyes lit up. His forehead was empty. He brought the brush up to his forehead and drew a nice, Big long and thick inky cock, with a few little droplets of what looked like liquid shooting through the top and raining down over his eyes. Ha 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 ha! Daiki erupted into pure, amused laughter. He couldn't wait to see his face when he looked in a mirror, or even better, if someone pointed it out to him. It would be way funnier if his fangirls that always squealed about how cool he was saw him like this. But if he saw it in the mirror, he'd definitely clean it off with a Uchiha style pout before anyone could have a laugh at him. And there was a mirror right at the entrance of this room. Which meant his plan was doomed to fail. Guess there's no helping it then. Daiki shook his head, concentrating chakra into his palm. He pressed his palm against Sasuke's head and focused, before pulling back a good 30 seconds later. Now, there were a pair of lines connecting together and forming an arrow pointing down at the cock on his forehead. But it was mostly hidden by his hair and bangs. Just another condensed seal matrix, though this was a mere combination of the storage seal and the storage return seal. With but a thought, he could make the ink go into the storage seal, and then make it come back out. This way I can hide it until we pass all the mirror then bring it out later. Daiki mentally pat himself on the back. He was such a genius. And this was gonna be a riot. Your immaturity knows no bounds. Isabu commented, deadpan. I'm bored. What do you expect? Daiki shrugged, sitting back down on his chair. And this is the boy in line to be the next Hokage. I fear for the future of this world. The huge bijou shook his head in dismay. If I become Hokage, let me tell you, mini skirts, booty shorts, cleavage bearing tops and compulsory Hokage lap dances are become mandatory. He replied. Exactly. Isabu groaned. You know, I know you're playing it up. 
but I can feel how tempted you are to actually go through with that. Hey man, Hokage sounded like such a crap job after the initial benefits. He'd have to get some good fun out of it somehow. And if he couldn't use the authority of it for someone like that for a laugh, then what was the point of it all? Too much responsibility for little in return after the initial benefits did not at all sound like a good time. Of course there was the bet he had with Ten Ten going on. He'd become Hokage just for that. Unfortunately, despite the brief amusement his doodling of Sasuke's face gave him, it wasn't long before he was back deep within the pitch-black ebony pits of boredom. Damn Orochimaru, if it weren't for him, Daiki would be free to grind away right now and pass the time in muscle-burning training. But no, already he'd wasted three hours just sitting guarding Sasuke. The funny thing was that besides Kakashi or the Hokage himself, Daiki really was the best choice to guard Sasuke. If it came down to it, he was one of the very few capable of either beating Orochimaru or getting away from him. So he couldn't even fault the logic of Kakashi leaving him to guard Sasuke. Though he could sure as hell gripe about it to Isabu, to the huge turtles slash tortoises dismay. It was a good chance to grind up his whining ability Daiki supposed. Thankfully, something that could through the gloom of boredom broke him from his thoughts. A groan escaped Sasuke's lips, the Uchiha shifting noticeably in the infirmary bed, before slowly, his eyes blinked open, clearing his exhaustion. He released a silent yawn, before pushing himself up in his bed and rubbing his eyes. Then his gaze shifted and fell on Daiki himself. Sasuke blinked, before rousing fully. Daiki? He mouthed, confused. Sup sleep in beauty. He greeted the boy with a wave. Have a good sleep? Sasuke gave him an odd look. Why the hell am I waking up besides you of all people? Cause somebody needed to guard your sissy, but while you were out like a light. Daiki shrugged, grinning. He blinked once more, before narrowing his eyes. Since when am I a sissy? And why would I need your loser but to guard me? He challenged. Since you passed out, again by the way, Daiki shot back. Well, as far as being a sissy goes at least, the reason I'm guarding you is because Petamaru tried to come yoink you while you were out like a light, so he could sliver up your butt and go all ungabuna in your body. Sasuke grimaced in disgust. That explains why I'm being guarded, not why you're doing it, he replied. And do you need to be so disgustingly crude? Yes, he shrugged, unashamed, grinning all the way. And you already know why I'm guarding you as well, because I'm one of the few people strong enough to beat his ass if he tries anything. Crap, Sasuke deadpanned, denying his statement. You're strong for sure, but not that strong. Well, he wasn't wrong. I am if I use the full power of my bijou. Daiki shrugged again. Sasuke's gaze became drier. That's not you being strong enough. That's your bijou you clown, he huffed. And while we're on the subject, who the hell are you calling a weakling like you did earlier? The only reason you managed to do anything about the seal on your neck is because of your bijou, relying on another, yet you were trying to say I'd be a weakling loser for relying on Orochimaru's power, which I won't, just saying, you're such a hypocrite Daiki. Do as I say, not as I do? Daiki replied. The Uchiha merely raised an eyebrow at him. The only hypocrite I like is myself. Utterly shameless, Sasuke scoffed, before smirking at him. After all that tough talk earlier, you're just as big a loser as you tried to make out I would be if I relied on Orochimaru. Daiki blinked slowly for a moment, organizing his thoughts before countering. At least a snake man doesn't want to anally probe me like he does you. And you can never just let anyone get the last word in except for you? Sasuke rolled his eyes, before releasing a deep breath and sobering, his eyes locking with Daiki's own. Still, thanks, for sticking around and trying to help. Even if you can't do anything, it means a lot. That's fine, but I never really meant that, Daiki shrugged. I just knew Orochimaru was listening in and didn't want him to know I actually could mess that seal up just like I did mine and make it fine for you to use. Oh, Sasuke uttered blankly, before sighing again, his gaze turning dry. I really hate you sometimes. Nah bro, you love me, Daiki smirked. Obviously, I'm gonna do what I can to make sure old pedo Snakey Maru doesn't get his slimy hands on you. I can't have him messing up our bromance. Another word I have no idea what the meaning of is, Sasuke replied blankly. 
Do you just love talking gibberish or something? Silly Sasuke. Daiki shook his head, but instead of explaining, he stood up to his feet and took a deep breath before. You my homie. Yeah, yeah, know me. He broke out into song and sat down on the bed beside Sasuke, wrapping an arm around his shoulder and pulling him into a bro hug before gesturing out widely with one arm. And if you ever need a wingman, I'd let any girl blow me. I understood none of that except for the last part. Sasuke deadpanned, pulling out of Daiki's grip. And considering you showed an interest in Sakura and Yamanaka, I don't think your standards can get any lower, so that's not really much of a sacrifice on your part. Yeah. Daiki nodded, accepting his words. Well, you're a crap head. Literally, it was hard to take him seriously with the ink glasses, mustache, and big ink crap over his forehead, spurting ink jizz over his eyes. Now he was gonna laugh even more at Sasuke for his cheek. Who denied a bromance? He deserved the doodles now. Thankfully, with Sasuke awake to banter and take the piss out of, time seemed to flow in a lot quicker, and he was a lot less bored. Sure, the Uchiha liked to be quiet and tried to brood as he tended to do a lot, but Daiki's boredom could not be quenched with such a thing, and as such, he spent hours annoying Sasuke. That too was a form of the grind. His ability to annoy his enemies was a vital skill. Sasuke made for a good test dummy, being the brooding stoic guy he was, so if something got to him, it would easily get to most others. And he kept that up right up until one of the chunin outside the door let them know that the next part of the exam was beginning. Finally, Sasuke groaned in relief as they made their way through the hallways, heading towards the ground floor. His face was currently bereft of any doodles. For now, somebody's happy to get his fight on. Daiki noted with a grin at his side, arms crossed behind his head casually. No, I'm just glad I won't need to sit around and listen to your nonsense anymore. Sasuke snorted. Zat so? Daiki mused, grin widening. For that, he would make sure to time his little prank very well for maximum points. They arrived not long later, to find that they were the last to enter. All eyes turned to them, inspecting them. Man, even Kakashi was here before them. Talk about a brass neck. There was even a few frowns shot their way. Well now, it seemed that they held them up a bit. There were a few smiles as well of course. Specifically from Hinata. Such a good girl. Naruto was lucky Daiki was a bro. And it wasn't bro-like for him to pursue Hinata. Sasuke ignored them. As was customary for the broody teen. Daiki on the other hand. Just grinned. They made their way over to the gathering of Jenin. Taking position at the back of the crowd. Daiki specifically stood beside Tenten since she and her team were at the very back. Yo, he greeted her. Ten Ten was one of the ones that had been frowning at him. She gave him a dry look, before turning her nose up at him and looking back towards the Hokage, who stood in front of a pair of giant rock sculpture arms formed into the seal of reconciliation. Behind him were multiple Jonin and Chunin, the staff of the tower, alongside the Jonin sensei for all the teams who passed. The only non-leaf sensei being Baki standing away at the back. Eh, must be awkward. She's still mad at me. He laughed inwardly. She wasn't happy at all she had to put on that little simpering fangirl-esque fake personality and hype him up to get him to heal Lee. Though, he felt more like she was putting more effort up into acting like that to him rather than was actually mad at him now. Congratulations to all of you. Anko's voice broke him from his thoughts and he looked to the front to see her taking position beside the Hokage. On passing the second exam, she looked around the gathered genin, eyes passing over each and every single one of them. She only paused, and briefly at that when she met his eyes. He winked. She had no reaction and her eyes continued on. So that's Gai-sensei's eternal rival, Kakashi. Tenten murmured at his side and he looked to see the bun-haired older girl looking at Kakashi admiringly. He definitely has Guy sensei beat out on looks and cool factor at least. Kakashi has a tiny member, like minuscule, even babies have bigger ones half the time. Daiki helpfully informed her. Kakashi visibly twitched, and his head turned from where he was blandly staring forward to look into Daiki's eyes with his own singular revealed eye. It narrowed at him. Daiki stuck the finger up. Kakashi flashed the finger back at him for a split second before it was hidden away again. Tenten turned to him then and gave him an odd look. And you know that how? 
she asked. I've been on a few missions with him. Daiki shrugged. He got drunk on our way back one time, started bawling like a little girl about how he was still a virgin at his age, and the closest he ever got was third base. Barely. The chick he was with laughed at him apparently for how small his member is and left him. He blatantly lied. Uncaringly, without any guilt. He was a shinobi after all. And Kakashi was a prick. Kakashi's eyebrow twitched noticeably. Daiki's grin grew. Ten Ten sighed. So he only looks cool then? She said, sounding disappointed. He's just as big a weirdo as Guy Sensei? It was good that Ten Ten was so used to Guy, that this was so easy for her to believe. Weirder even, Daiki nodded. He walks around reading smut constantly to get his rocks off because he's a super hyper virgin. He's given up ever getting laid. A tragic guy, really. I mean, it is a bit weird, but more sad to be honest, Ten Ten grimaced. I still think Gezensei is weirder than that. You don't deal with him and his quirks like me on a daily basis. He noticed Sasuke was looking at him from his peripheral vision, looking completely weirded out before glancing at Kakashi, giving the man a pitiful look. Negative 100 respect. Hopefully he let Naruto and Sakura know about that little tidbit the next time he annoyed his team, and then Naruto being a loud mouth and Sakura being a bit of a gossip with Ino would get it spread around the entirety of the leaf. If you say so, Daiki shrugged at the bun-haired girl's words. So, I see you're talking to me again. I'm still mad at you, she replied flatly. It was just a joke, he pointed out. A humiliating joke, she responded. Only Niji was privy to it, but that's enough. He's been giving me odd looks. Probably jealous that you acted that way for me and not him, Daiki assured her. Ten Ten snorted. Somehow I doubt that, she noted dryly. Even taking him out of the equation, it was still humiliating. I have my pride as a kunoichi, you know? And I know for a fact if you got your pride hurt, you'd start punching and ask questions later. Well, she wasn't wrong. She pouted at him then. You're such a bully. Cute. I kinda am, he agreed before laughing lightly. All right, how about I make it up to you? And well, let me say first, you're a tough one, one of the best here, I don't think any less of you or anything for that little act. Actually, I was impressed with your acting skills. He complimented her. Well, that's good to know, I guess. Her lips almost quirked upwards, before she smothered the smile that wanted to emerge. And how will you go about making it up to me? Well, he had a few options. I could take you out on a date, he teasingly replied. He was testing the waters. You're already going to be doing that, that though. She replied with a roll of her eyes. And he scored. She hadn't decided against them pursuing that relationship option later on. Good, good, good. True. I guess you'll have to settle for just a summoning contract then. Daiki shrugged casually. What would you prefer? A giant pack of wolves or a giant conch that has a super tough defensive shell and can use a bunch of cool things like a genjutsu mist and big but water jutsu. Wait, what? Tenten -ten goggled at him, eyes flying wide open. But before she could press for further information, Anko apparently decided it was time to move things along and that they'd had enough time to digest their passing the second exam. Now, the third exam will begin and Lord Hokage will be graciously taking the time to explain it all to you, she explained. Make sure you all listen up and take all of his words to heart, you might learn something. Old man Sandame chuckled lightly at Anko's words before smiling at them all. You have all done well to make it here, each and every single one of you are fine ninja and will no doubt go far. He praised them. Now though, the third exam is about to commence, but before we go into the specifics of how things will progress, let me make one thing perfectly clear, which pertains to the underlying purpose of this exam. He paused briefly to let his words sink in, making sure they were all listening, before continuing on. Tell me young ones, why do suppose an examination of this nature is being jointly conducted by all of the five great nations? His smile turned into a faint grin. To promote friendship among all the nations and raise the overall general level in the ninja arts, he revealed. I will be very clear in what this means, what these series of so-called examinations are all about. Daiki noticed Ten Ten swallowing heavily at the man's words, and she wasn't the only one visibly reacting to the man's words. After all, the old man was completely relaxed, his stance and smile wholly welcoming. 
Yet a powerful pressure seemed to exude from him just naturally as he spoke, and it was pressing down upon everyone gathered. Daiki crossed his arms, eyebrow raising. He's just flowing his chakra. He noted he could see it clearly. The man wasn't even letting any of it escape his body, yet still just circulating his chakra within his body caused this kind of pressure. Such powerful chakra. It utterly dwarfed his own. The old man could probably crush most of the genin gathered here by just flaring his chakra at them. And to think this was him far from his prime and much weaker than he once was. Old man third was a complete monster. That is indeed very impressive chakra for a human. Isabu agreed. The fact his bijou actually noted that in of itself was impressive and telling enough. Isabu after all still felt his own chakra capacity and strength, now in the realms of a kage if a low-level one was pitifully small. Quite simply, the Chunin exams are war in miniature. The Sandame continued after a moment. The Chunin exams exist to promote the villages in place of war. A tentative stop-gap and agreement between each of the five great nation ninja villages to stop our loyal ninja dying en masse during times of strife like they did for so many years. This is the friendship of we five villages. That's the stupidest friendship I've heard of, shouted out in reply. Naruto as expected. Though, he wasn't the only one that seemed to be uncomfortable with the Hokage's words and the true nature of the Chunin exams. Quite a few voiced a similar opinion as Naruto, though few of them had the guts to say it so loudly and proudly, challenging the words of the Hokage as the blonde did. Make no mistake, these exams are not just about you young ones, but the glory and honor of the shinobi villages as well. Haruzen wasn't daunted in any single way by the whiny grumbling. While this exam needles out any of you unfit to ascend up to the next rank, it will also more importantly showcase to many honored guests the ability of the villages. This includes the rulers and nobility spread around this continent. Each and every single one of them will be watching you, and your actions and abilities will reflect on your home. What that means, he began clarifying, is that if any nation's ninja show outstanding talent, ability and superiority, the gathered nobleman's eyes will be on them, and they will in turn be quick to commission the village who trained those superior fighters and talents for work, promoting the growth of their villages. Conversely, if inferior ninja take the stage and make a bad showing, it will reflect poorly on the village and may lead to less work commissioned. So, so why then is it necessary for us to stake our lives and fight here? Kiba called out, stopping the Hokage from continuing. Quite a few made muttering agreements with him. Daiki withheld the urge to groan in annoyance. How could clan kids be this stupid when it came to the duties of a shinobi or kunoichi? You know what, this was taking too long. For Sage's sake, isn't it obvious? Daiki's words escaped his mouth before he could stop them. Many eyes turned to him, all eyes in the room actually. It's a member measuring contest you moron. It's basically a big show to say, look how badass our genin are. If our little wimp kids are this strong, how strong do you think our jonin are? Come hire us, we'll beat everyone's asses for you cause we're the best of the best and all those other punk but biatchs can't measure up to us. There was utter silence at his words, and quite a few gaped at him, mostly the other genin. The likes of Sakura, Ino, Naruto, Kiba, Choji and such were outright goggling at him. But the ones in the know were pretty impassive. Which was fine, he just wanted this crap to get a move on. Of the Jonin, only a few gave any visible reaction. Karinai's eyebrows rose, while Asuma snorted in pure amusement. And Anko smirked widely, giving him a nod of approval. The Sandame gave an audible cough, breaking the silence. Yes, while the wording was a bit crude, that is indeed what the Chunin exams amount to. The old man agreed with him, all eyes turning back to him as he began speaking again. The strength of a nation is derived from the strength of its ninja village which in turn draws its strength from the many shinobi and kunoichi whom call that village home and fight for its prosperity. You ask why you must fight? It is because the greatest strength of these shinobi and kunoichi only emerges in the midst of a life and death battle. As he finished, one of the flak jack wearing shinobi standing impassively near him made his way to the front and took a knee in front of the Hokage. Hokage-sama, if you don't mind, would you allow myself to take over the proceedings of the exam from here as its proctor? Gekko Heiate asked. Very well, Sarutobi nodded. You may proceed, Heiate-kun. Thank you, 
The man kept his head bowed for a moment before standing up and turning to face everyone, displaying a pale-skinned face with thick bags under his eyes. Good to meet you all. I am Hayate and I will be the proctor of the third exam, though before that, I will need to ask something of all of you. He made sure everyone was paying attention to him before he continued on. You see, before the third exam begins, there will be a set of preliminary battles and whether you proceed to the true third exam or not is dependent on you winning. He explained. Preliminaries? Surprisingly the one to shout out. Voice aghast was Shikamaru. The hell are you kidding? Hayate san I'm in agreement with him. He heard Sakura's voice speak up. Why can't we all proceed to the third exam? Why do we need to take part in preliminary battles? Well, I don't want to say the previous two exams weren't a trying experience, but the fact of the matter is we still have too many applicants, he replied. As Hokage-sama explained to you all moments ago, we will have many rich and powerful guests watching you all, very busy powerful people at that, so we must not only keep the exam intense, but also fast-paced and make sure that only the best of the best show off their skills. B but dash Sakura sputtered. Hey 8 cut her off before she could finish. If you are worried about your promotion, don't worry. This is a chance for you to show off your abilities as well. Everyone gathered here to watch will be judging your abilities as ninja to see if you are worthy of promotion or not. Even if don't win or make it through to the true third exam, you still have a chance at promotion, he explained, before clapping his hands loudly. Either way, if any of you want to drop out, now is your chance, because the preliminaries begin now. For a moment, a hush of silence befell the crowd of gathered genin, and a majority of them looked around, waiting for someone to speak up. Just as it looked like the moment would pass within nobody speaking up, a single hand was raised into the air. If it's all right, I'd like to call it quits here. One of the oldest in the crowd declared, an older teenager, more of a man really with gray hair said, I've not shook off the injuries I received in the forest yet and don't think I can amount to much here and now. Surprise, surprise, it was Kabuto, which conveniently brings us down to 18 genin in total. Daiki mused. While he'd been having a laugh besmirching Kakashi's reputation, he hadn't been idle and had taken the time to count the opposition. There were currently 19 genin in total within the crowd, he specifically being the odd man out. He'd wondered how things would progress on that front, if someone would get a free pass or have to fight twice or even if there would be a fight of three, a little mini battle royal. That's kind of disappointing. Daiki sighed inwardly as Hei 8 accepted Kabuto's withdrawal from the next round. He had actually been somewhat hoping he'd get to fight against two people at once. Unless he fought Lee using the gates or Gara, there wasn't really anyone here that could give him a challenge or a fun fight. Fighting two at once though, like Niji and Sasuke together, might have been fun. Naruto of course kicked up a big fuss. Kabuto, what the hell? The blonde cried out. What's up with you quitting? After making it all the way here too. Naruto Kuin, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but those guys we fought before beat the crap out of me. The older Genin replied. And ever since that scuffle with the sound ninja back at the first exam, I've been deaf in one of my ears. My balance is totally shot. There's no way I could take on any of you guys here in the state I'm in. Especially in fights where killing is allowed. Oh, I see. Naruto visibly bit his lip his shoulders slumping. Don't mind it, Naruto Kuin. I'll try again next time. Kabuto laughed and pat him on the shoulder fondly. You just do your best. I'll be rooting for you. Naruto perked up at his words and grinned. All right, just watch me then. I'll blow right through this part and be one step closer to being Hokage, he declared happily. As Kabuto laughed lightly and happily along with Naruto, Daiki found he had to grit his teeth to stop from making any sound. This is frustrating to watch, he thought, because he knew Kabuto was just toying with Naruto and manipulating him, whereas Naruto was being utterly genuine and thought of the older genin as a friend who'd risked his life together with him. He felt like he was watching Kabuto make a total fool of Naruto in front of everyone. And while he and Naruto weren't exactly close or anything, it was still beginning to piss him off. Daiki watched as the gray-haired genin turned to his teammates and had a hushed conversation. Even now though, Kabuto was fully on guard, he wasn't showing his mouth to anyone. He'd positioned himself so that his face was partially blocked by his teammates and his arms. A guard against lip reading, his hand blocking the sound from echoing outwards and being heard, muffling his voice. You guys can take it from here, 
especially you, Yoroi. With your abilities, this part should be a piece of cake. Kabuto informed. It's the perfect opportunity for a show of real, brute strength. Considering how you resent my recent promotion over you, I'm sure you're itching for the chance to make a show. To bad for Kabuto, the Shinkigan was not so easily fooled. Humph, you may think you're our lord's favorite, but don't push it, you brat. Yoroi scoffed back at him. Kabuto merely shrugged, smiling lightly at him, before turning to give Naruto a light wave goodbye and proceed to make his way through the crowd of Genin and leave the huge room behind. Probably a smart choice on his part, if he can't handle this, then he isn't ready to be a Chunin. Ten Ten mused. Daiki shrugged and didn't comment himself. He already knew after all that Prick was as strong as a Jonin before he was a teenager, and was perhaps the person currently the closest in the world right now, to actually being in a place to achieve Tenten's dream of being just like Tsunade. The guy after all was the best medic Neen in the world right now after the Busta Blonde send you. All right, seems like nobody else is going to pull out. Good, makes things simple, Hey, mused aloud. There's 18 of you left, that means there's going to be 9 bouts of 1 on 1 battles, and the victors of those matches will proceed on to the real third exam, and as explained before, this will be no holds barred combat. Each pair will fight until one side is either unconscious, admits defeat or dies. A few shivered noticeably at the emphasis he put on the word dies, the weight of what was going down really dawning on them. Daiki was just getting tired of all the repetition, how many times did they have to hammer it in that they could die here? He'd been prepared to kill for the village and possibly die, had died even since he left the academy. The whole point of being a shinobi or kunoichi was fighting and killing for the village. Anybody who didn't get that didn't deserve to be here. People could whine and make all the heartfelt speeches they wanted, but as things were right now, this world ran on that logic. Killing and death were as common as breathing. Hey8 reached into his supply pouch then and withdrew a small device, looking like a remote. He pressed something on it, and then there was an audible grinding noise as the wall behind the two huge stone fists slid up to reveal a large dark screen. This electronic scoreboard I've brought out will display the matches, Hey8 explained. At the start of every round, we will display the names of both combatants competing against each other. Once the two are displayed, everyone else should make their way up to the railings above. He pressed another button on the remote and the screen lit up. A moment later, letters appeared on the screen, though shifting and changing at rapid speeds. Until a second later, they stopped and displayed two names. Akato Yoroi versus Uzumaki Naruto. There was silence again for a moment, before, woohoo, Naruto cheered, pumping his fist into the air. I get to go first, he hollered in celebrating. Yeah, Hei shrugged. All right, beyond the two listed, can everyone else head up to the platforms above? He asked. Daiki shrugged and did just that. He simply turned and jumped up through the air and landed above. He got quite a few stairs before everyone began following his lead. Moments later, the Hokage and the staff were at the very end of the room's platforms, whereas the Kanoha Genin and their Jonin Sensei joined Daiki. And the San Trio made their way up to the opposite side, their Sensei Baki joining them. The only ones left standing below were Hei 8, Naruto and an older Genin, easily in his twenties wearing full purple, his headband attached to a bandana, a piece of cloth covering his lower face and a pair of dark shades hiding his eyes. As it turned out, the ones to land nearest Daiki was Team 8, Kiba, Shinoi, Hinata, and their sensei, Kurinai. Naruto's up first, huh? Kiba noted, leaning over the railing beside Daiki a grin on his face. This should be quick. You're not wrong, Daiki agreed. This is a complete mismatch. Naruto will dominate this fight. Kiba blinked. What? He asked, taken aback. You seem sure of that, Kurinai input raising an eyebrow at him. Yet from all I've seen of Naruto, he's one of the least impressive here. A Kurinai once again proving that specializing was a horrible move and being wrong as always. You'd think you'd have learned by now after what happened last time. He used the Jutsu Fu taught him to direct his message straight into her head. Kurinai twitched. A8 called for the beginning of the match. Do you really think Naruto Kuin will win? Hinata spoke up at his side before he could have fun poking at Kurinai. Just watch, Daiki shrugged. Something tells me this match will be over quickly, 
As soon as the words left his mouth, the match began in earnest. Naruto burst forward in a rapid sprint, rushing towards Yoroi. The shades wearing traitor was quick to respond with a volley of shuriken, which Naruto hastily deflected with a drawn kanai. It kept him back long enough though for Yoroi to make a few hand seals, a visible aura of chakra forming around his hands. Hmm. Daiki observed with interest. With his ability to see chakra clearly and his heightened analytical abilities with the Shinkigen, he was able to just what the man was doing for his technique. The chakra over his hands, connected to his tenketsu within his hands, seemed to be working almost like a vacuum. So he basically just slurps up chakra like a vacuum cleaner. He mused. He already had his chakra absorption seal, but learning that technique might not be a bad idea either. At the very least, it wouldn't hurt. From what he saw though, the rate of absorption, or rather the strength of the vacuum effect, seemed to be dependent on the chakra capacity of the user. Yoroi didn't seem all that impressive chakra-wise. I wonder, could I apply it to my whole body rather than just my hands? Daiki mused as Naruto, seeing the technique, quickly formed a very familiar hand seal. A split moment later, a huge puff of smoke erupted around him, before he burst out of it, for more Naruto's rushing beside him. A few measly clones? Wrong choice of move kid. Yoroi barked a laugh and rushed forward to meet Naruto and his clones. Two clones reached him first and Yoroi narrowly slid between a pair of punches aimed for each side of his face, his palms touching the shoulders of the clones. Only for nothing to happen. Yoroi paused in shock. What's with this stupid amount of chakra? He gaped. He obviously expected the clones to dispel from having the chakra drained. And to his credit, if it were really any normal person, the amount of chakra drained even from those light touches would have messed the clones over. Too bad, he was up against the worst matchup for a chakra absorber. The two clones didn't miss their chance and grasped his arms, locking him tight in place. And thus he was unable to dodge as the other two clones reached him. One went low, sliding forward and kicking his ankles from beneath him, while the other uppercut the man in the chin, at the same time the clones holding him let go. He went straight up, a grunt of pain erupting from his mouth. The real Naruto came in quick for the finish, jumping off the back off the clone that landed the uppercut. He shot up into the air just slightly above Yoroi and clasped both hands together. Then he brought them down in a powerful hammer blow. Yoroi shot down like a bullet, slamming into the ground hard enough to crater it and just lay there, not a sound coming from him. He was completely unconscious from that quick three-part combo. Akato Yoroi is unable to continue. Uzumaki Naruto is the winner. A8 declared after a moment. Silence. Oh yeah. Naruto pumped his fist into the air and cheered as his clones erupted into smoke and dispelled. He wasn't at all bothered by the silence and the various people now gaping. What the hell? Kiba goggled. Told you. Daiki shrugged, shooting a smirk back at Kurinai. Her eyebrow twitched in annoyance. Whoa, way to go Naruto. Sakura cheered loudly. Yeah woo. Naruto pumped both hands into the air, displaying peace signs with both. A smug smile on his face. First match and first win? I'm the man. He probably would have stayed there celebrating if not for Heiate ushering him up above and Medic Nin carrying a stretcher appearing in a shunshin to carry away Yoroi. Naruto Kuen has come a long way. Hinata noted, a pleased smile on her face as she watched him ascend up the stairs. The blonde cockily swaggered his way over to Team 7, walking right past Team 8 and Daiki. He only paused briefly to grin at Daiki challengingly before continuing on. What? Daiki blinked. Shouldn't Hinata have tried to give him some medicinal cream right about now? Sure he didn't take any hits in that fight, but he was still looking pretty trussed up from his time in the forest, even if any external wounds had long since been healed. He looked at the Hyuga girl who returned his gaze, smiling gently at him. His brows furrowed and she gave him an odd look. I wonder who's next. He played it off, musing with a shrug. He didn't have to wait long to see because Hayate was already in the process of choosing the next matchup. He wasn't at all expecting the names that appeared. Yurii Daiki versus Yamanaka Ino. Oh come on, are you kidding me? Ino's voice shouted in disbelief from along the platform. Now this was an unfortunate match. And not only for Ino. 
This won't be fun at all. Daiki groaned inwardly. And not only that, but how was he supposed to show off with an opponent he could beat in what amounted to a blink of the eye? And it royally sucked for Eno. He was literally her worst matchup possible. Oh well, nothing for it. He mused with a shrug before hopping down. Nobody wished him luck. Not even Hinata. Because nobody thought he'd need it he was sure. While it was a bit disappointing for him. For Eno, as she made her way down, trudging her way down more like, it seemed more as if she was headed towards the gallows. Poor girl. There was a massive grimace on her pretty face as she took her position in front of him and her shoulders were slumped. This seriously isn't fair. The blonde pouted. At least you have the courage to actually face me, Daiki replied. There wasn't really much he could do here to console her. They both knew how this would end. It's impressive on of itself you have the guts to stand against the strongest guy here after all. I am pretty great, she agreed, her frown twitching into a brief smile, before she sighed. No way I can beat somebody stronger than Sasuke Kuen though. Don't feel too bad about it, Daiki shrugged, and spread his arms wide and let his voice become louder, making sure everyone heard him. After all, there isn't a single gen in here that can beat me. Hell, every other gen in here could come at me at the same time and I'd still clap every single one of them. Yeah, why don't you say that to my face? He heard Naruto shout from behind him. Yeah, don't talk crap Daiki you prick. Kiba agreed with him. I would be most interested in testing that Daiki Kuen. Such a youthful boast. Lee added, I hate this kid. Kankaros grumble was quite audible as well. That doesn't actually make me feel all that much better since I actually do have to fight you and not any of them. Eno pouted. I don't suppose you'd be willing to throw the fight? Usually, I'd be all for it if you made it worth my while. Daiki mused, voice lowering so it wasn't heard quite as easily. Sadly, can't do that. It's my mission to go all Tobarama on this exam and make Konoha great again. The second Hokage? Eno raised an eyebrow at him. Wait, mission... I mean, you already heard back in the first exam along with everyone else. I'm the big bad ringer. He grinned. I'm here to kick ass, take names and show off. Basically, since this is a member measuring contest for all possible clients to see. The old man wanted me, the guy with the biggest member of all to swing it around and clap cheeks. Ino took a moment to process his words before nodding. That does kind of make sense with what Hokage-sama just told us. She nodded slowly before snorting. You should be careful with boasts like that though. What'll you do if somebody actually calls you out and asks you to prove how big a deal you are? She grinned. Depends on who's asking. Daiki shrugged. Not missing a beat. I mean, if you want me to prove it, I have no problem at all whipping it out gorgeous. Eno blinked and was stunned into silence. Face turning a crimson red. Hey, eight side. Can we get a move on please? Sure. Daiki shrugged. And I'll be generous, Eno. Give you a chance to show off. I'll give you 20 seconds. I won't attack back at all. So feel free to come at me with everything you have. Wait, seriously? She blinked again and gaped at him. Seriously serious, he nodded. I mean, you earned your spot here. It wouldn't be kosher if you didn't get the chance to prove your mettle and show if you're tuning material just because you're up against a guy that can slap around Jonin like little brats. Eno bit her lip. Usually, I'd be insulted at this, but I saw how easily you dismantled that rain guy. This fight would be over an instant if you didn't. She grudgingly accepted. She had her pride as well after all. All right, enough of this. Hei groaned and promptly declared the beginning of the match. Daiki crossed his arms and smirked. Ino took that as his approval for her to go right ahead. She visibly channeled Chakra through her feet and propelled herself towards him with a burst of speed. It wasn't the Shun Shin but more of a rudimentary prelude to it. Not a bad idea either. She rushed through a couple of hand seals, and a cloud of smoke erupted around her. And just like in the previous match, multiple blondes erupted from the smoke. Each were holding handfuls of shuriken and quickly spread apart, spreading out from around his front. Each let loose, slinging ten shuriken each towards him. A hail of fifty shuriken shot towards him. Only ten of them were actually real though, the barrage of ten coming from his far left, Eno had switched her positions with one of her illusionary clones to try and throw him off. A decent use of the Academy clone jutsu. 
Too bad he could see straight through them. He sidestepped them easily, allowing them to fly straight past his body, and didn't even blink as the rest of the shuriken passed straight through his body as if they were never there. All five Enos grimaced noticeably. Damn it! The real blonde cursed, and the other clones disappeared a moment later. She kept rushing him though, lunging into a thrusting knee strike, all her weight and strength behind it. He juked slightly to the side, letting her sail right past him. She landed a moment later and immediately whirled into a roundhouse kick aimed at the back of his head. He stepped forward and let it pass through empty air. He'd give Eno one thing while she wasn't all that fast. She was quick mentally and immediately kept the attack up, aiming for a punch aimed at his kidneys. Her technique was basic, but well-polished and aiming for vital points constantly. 4. He mentally counted as he spun slightly out of the way of her punch, even as she dug her feet into the ground and shot right back around to him, exploding into a flurry of punches and kicks that he weaved around or deflected. Your taijutsu isn't bad at all, he praised. Though your conditioning could do with a little work, and you need more jutsu for sure, because you have no options beyond this with me? Has your sensei not been teaching you anything? Honestly, what the hell was up with Kakashi, Kurinai, and Asuma? They didn't seem to teach their students jack crap. 7. 8. He mentally counted as the match went on. Asuma-sensei is just as big a lazy bum as Shikamaru and Choji. Ino grunted, not letting up at all. He's only drilled us physically and taught us to attack as a team. That sounded familiar. Heh, <laughs> you know? The more I hear about how the Jonin are teaching you guys. Daiki mused idly as he deflected a punch over his shoulder by poking Ino's wrist with one finger. The more I'm glad I never ended up with one. Sounds like a total waste of time. Lucky you. Ino grunted, whipping her hand back to try and grasp his neck at the same time she jumped into a rising knee aimed for his chin. He was fast enough that a simple diagonal step backwards allowed him to evade both and Ino grunted again in frustration. Mid-air for only a moment, she grabbed a trio of kunai from her pouch, lobbing one with a flick of her finger aimed at his face. He tilted his head to the side and caught it by the handle. With his teeth. That's just absurd. Ino growled. Even as she switched one of the two kunai remaining in her hand to her offhand and landed, pushing off with a burst of chakra and dual wields slashing at him. He clasped his hands behind his back at the same time, he blocked and deflected her blows using only the kunai held between his teeth. And to think, Isabu thought he shouldn't have Roronoa as his middle name. Time ran down quickly, and Ino was no closer to hitting him. 18. 19. He idly counted off. Ino visibly ground her teeth together as he parried one of her slashes down with the kunai in his mouth, the force behind it actually forcing her to kneel on one leg. She showed a surprising amount of skill though when she flicked her fingers up, letting the kunai in the hand he just parried shoot up towards his chin. At the same time she pushed back with her back leg and tossed the one in her other hand. One coming up for his chin, the other straight for his heart. A pincer technique, cutting off any escape avenue beyond one side. At the same time her hands came together in an unfamiliar seal as she shot back and landed. A square like space gap between her fingers. Twenty. Daiki declared aloud. And then he moved. He disappeared in a blur of speed and Ino's eyes widened. She never got the chance to fire off her special clan jutsu, because Daiki was suddenly behind her. One hand wrapping around her waist and pinning her arms to her sides, while the other wrapped around her throat and pinned her bodily to his chest. And that's match. Daiki grinned down at the blonde. Not bad at all Ino, you're a lot more skilled than I thought you were. Easy for you to say when you danced around me like a child. Eno sighed. Well, whatever. I already knew it would end like this. With you pinned against me? Daiki asked, grin widening. Eno tensed in his grip, suddenly realizing their position before relaxing and tilting her head up slightly to grin at him. Well, it's not a bad position to be in. She shrugged, though only because he allowed it. Did you want to show me you weren't lying about your boasts that much earlier? She flirted surprising him a bit and wiggled her backside against his hips. This could be bad, while usually he wouldn't mind at all. Currently, there was one girl specifically whom he was flirting with and preparing to possibly pursue a relationship with. One girl whom was watching right now from above. 
It was one thing to flirt with other girls when he still wasn't in a relationship with Ten Ten. It was another to do it in front of her. Wait, why do I feel for different killing intents? Daiki blinked, confused. Did somebody have a crush on Eno that he didn't know about? I mean, if you want to see it, just look me up after this exam where we can have some privacy, and I don't mind giving you an up-close and personal look. Daiki replied, and released her, stepping back. You tease? Eno pouted at him. Even as she turned around and idly rubbed her throat. Well, I'll keep that in mind. With that said, the blonde turned to Hey 8 who was watching them drilly, his gaze completely unimpressed. So yeah, um, Proctor guy, I give up, surrender and all that, she declared. Ahu! Hey 8 deadpanned, before slowly lifting his hand into the air. Yamanaka Ino has surrendered. The winner is Yuriai Daiki. Please quickly vacate the arena so we can choose the next match participants. He said, voice completely monotone. He looked completely done with life. As the match end, Ino visible shuddered. Man, is it cold in here or what? I just had this shiver go up my spine. The blonde rubbed her hands together. Daiki shrugged at the blonde girl's words and took his leave making his way back up to the railing above. As he did though and made to walk back to his spot, he passed by Guy and his team, and a certain bun-haired girl wasn't very content to let him just go by. Ten-Ten grabbed his arm and pulled him in beside her, as she did. He thought he saw Hinata narrow her eyes in his direction. Really? Ten-Ten questioned him, gaze dry. The hell was with the flirting? Animal magnetism? Daiki replied with a shrug and grin. It was more Eno flirting with him after all. Then I might just need to muzzle you. She deadpanned. Ouch. Daiki winced, but before he could reply, a hand clapped him over the shoulder. That was a most youthful match Daiki Kun. He looked over his shoulder to see Lee grinning at him brightly. Though I am quite keen to test that boast of yours from earlier. Fine with me? He grinned back at the older boy. Just make sure you pass these prelims. I'll happily fight you in the real third exam and show you why I'm the strongest guy there is. Yash! Lee pumped his fist. I will strive to do so. If I cannot defeat my opponent and make it to the third exam, I will run 5,000 laps around Kanoha and on my hands. That's the spirit Lee. Guy cheered him on. Niji, leaning over the railing snorted. Such childish boasting. The Huga said. Mere words with nothing to back it up. Somebody's a little salty he isn't the strongest Kanoha genin anymore. Daiki shrugged. It's alright Niji. I don't think any less of you. It's only natural to be jealous of someone as awesome as me. The Hyuga merely snorted derisively and didn't reply again. Somebody would really need to do something about that guy. Assuming Naruto didn't do it. Daiki supposed he wouldn't mind kicking his fate loving but around. Niji was a good ally to have after all. Once he got that stick pulled out of his butt about fate. And well, Daiki was pretty sure he could get rid of the cage bird seal, plus he was in line to be Hokage so he could force the issue of abolishing it. He wouldn't stand for any of his citizens being slaves. If the Hugo wanted slaves, they should just go hunt some rock humpers. You really need to learn to stop running your mouth, Tenten sighed. It's not like you're not strong, crazy strong and skilled for a rookie, but Niji's a genius, you know? I'm a super a genius for which is 40,000 times better than a regular genius. Daiki replied without missing a beat Ten Ten gave a slow blink, before shrugging. Okay. She apparently knew a losing battle when she saw one. He wasn't quite sure he liked that though. She clearly didn't believe him. I'm stronger, faster, more durable, no more jutsu, he shrugged and pointed out. On top of that the gentle fist doesn't work on me. Don't go assuming just because you play with Hinata-sama and Hanabi-sama that you've seen the true power of the gentle fist. Niji snorted derisively once again, not even turning around to look at him. The difference between my taijutsu and theirs is as vast as the distance between heaven and earth. Ooh, how testy. Being more skilled at it doesn't change what it does and what it does has no effect on me, buddy. Daiki shrugged. But I'll happily prove to you how much stronger I am once we fight in the third exam. Assuming you don't get your butt kicked. Your words mean nothing. Fate has already decreed that I shall be the victor. Niji replied simply and said nothing more. What a boring guy. He didn't get the chance to say anything else though.
because Hade apparently decided it was time to get a move on, and the huge screen began to rapidly cycle through names. Before landing on two surprising names, Daiki blinked. Ah, Tamari versus Ten Ten. Maybe fate really did exist? Huh. Guess I'm up. Ten Ten grinned eagerly, punching a fist into her palm. She had no idea that besides himself and Gara, Tamari was the worst possible matchup for her here. Gonna wish me luck? She asked him, grin widening. Good luck, he replied, giving her a half smile. If you win, I'll give you a present. Is it a lap dance? Ten Ten asked impishly, raising an eyebrow at him challengingly. If you want, but I don't quite have hips like yours. He involuntarily grinned. Well, I'll hold you to that then. She laughed, walking past him on her way down to the arena below. But as she did, she whipped her hand out and smacked him on the ass. He blinked oolishly. Ten Ten? Both Lee and Guy goggled at her actions in shock, her grin turning massive. Ten Ten continued on her way down, even as killing intent spiked in the room to almost massive degrees. Moments later, the bun-haired girl was down in the arena, standing opposite of the blonde Suna Kunoichi, who had quite the venomous look in her usually lovely teal green eyes. Her venomous gaze flickered up to meet his eyes for a moment, before looking back at Ten Ten lips pulling back nearly into a snarl. Ten Ten said utterly nothing at the gaze directed her way. What's up with her? Daiki wondered. She was much more derisive and mocking originally, but now she was blatantly angry about something. Was it because of him taking the piss out of her the other day, mocking not only her, but her brother, her father, and even her homeland? Maybe I should have given Ten Ten some advice? He mused as Hei Eight stepped up to begin the match. It might not change the results, but if Ten Ten knew in advance she would be fighting a wind user and that long-distance weapon techniques would be useless, her chance of winning by getting in close would be much better. He knew personally after all, that Ten Ten was both faster and stronger than Tamari physically and much more skilled in close combat. If she got close before Tamari brought out her fan and pressured her, she could possibly win. Oh well, too late now. He mused as Hei Eight called for the beginning of the match and immediately grimaced as Ten Ten leaped back, gaining distance, her hands flashing into her equipment pouches and unleashing a bevy of shuriken in the blink of an eye. Each spiraled through the air rapidly, and it wasn't just some random throw. Each had their own specific trajectory, spread out and aimed towards Tamari's vitals. If she was, say, a fire user, she'd have no choice but to dodge and give Ten Ten the advantage to press her. Sadly, she was a wind user, though. Tamari's hand went to the fan on her back and she pulled it forward, running wind chakra down its length. She didn't even open the fan itself, just whipped the huge metal base of it and sent a short but powerful gust of wind to meet the shuriken, blowing them away. That wind chakra metal is really something. He mused. It allowed the sandy blonde to perform high-level wind jutsu without hand seals and more or less instantly. Is that all you Kanoha girls can do? Tamari scoffed loudly. Throw around hunks of metal like some little academy brat? Tenten's lips fell into a frown, but she didn't reply with words. Instead, she reached for her pouch, drawing five kanai and with a whip of her hand, sent all five soaring through the air like bullets towards the blonde. One aimed for her head, one for her neck, one her heart, and two at her kidneys. It was quite an impressive throw, actually. This again. Tamari scoffed unveiling her fan ever so slightly and swinging it. Once again, a burst of wind chakra sent the barrage of Kanai flying away. But Ten Ten wasn't idle, already having leaped into the air. The bun-haired girl drew a single scroll, unrolling it and giving it a whipping motion as if it were a whip itself. Daiki saw her chakra spreading through the scroll itself, going through each and every single storage seal inscribed on the scroll. There was a burst of smoke, and a split moment later, dozens of different weapons rained down from above down towards the blonde. Swords, spears, sickles, scythes, axes, kunai, shuriken and more. And with their trajectory, they didn't just go for Tamari's front, but as they fell, spread out so they were coming towards her from each angle. Humph! Tamari opened her fan a bit more and spun, unleashing another, 
though much larger burst of wind chakra that spiraled around her form and blew away all of Tenten's weapons once again. It was almost comically unfair how badly Tenten's skill set matched up against Tamari. But such was the life of a ninja. Unfairness galore, if one couldn't overcome a bad matchup, they were destined to fail and die during their missions at some point, usually quite early in life. TCH. Ten Ten clicked her tongue as she landed. Done already? Tamari taunted, slamming the butt of her fan into the ground and leaning on it casually, tauntingly. Not quite. Ten Ten replied. No, you are. Tamari denied, the blonde heaving her fan up before whipping it around. The two moons on it displayed proudly, wind style, wind cutter jutsu. From the fan, a compressed torrent of slicing winds were released, roaring through the air towards Ten Ten. Just before they hit her though, the bun-haired girl launched herself into the air. A pair of scrolls pulled from her equipment pouches. The wind tore through her previous position, leaving great gouges in the ground. As soon as she unrolled them and channeled chakra through them, a pair of smoky dragons erupted from the scrolls and rushed down towards Tamari. Or so it seemed. Rather, they slammed into the ground on each side of her and burst into a great cloud of smoke, obscuring both of the girls from view. Though Daiki could see them both easily with his eyes. Tamari wasted no time in whipping her fan out, blowing the great cloud of smoke away. But it was enough, Ten Ten was already in motion. She spun like spinning top midair, rapidly rotating, and a moment later, a massive barrage of weapons launched down towards Tamari. It was just like her previous attack. Only, the scale was vastly different. Where before it was multiple dozens, this time it was multiple hundreds of different weapons that rained down like a metal shower of death towards the blonde. For a split moment, Tamari's eyes widened in panic, before she regained control and unwound her fan properly. It's over. Daiki clicked his tongue. Wind style. Raging gale wall. Tamari swung her fan, all three moons on it blazing proudly with chakra. A massive churning gale erupted from the blonde's fan, and despite the massive scale of amount of weapons aimed at her, they were blown away completely. I'm still not done yet. Tenten roared as she fell towards the ground. She pulled her hands back and Daiki blinked as he saw Chakra shining with his eyes. Chakra strings, not ninja wire? She whipped both hands out, all of the weapons lifting into the air and rushing towards Tamari. It wasn't some full on charge of weapons though, not something so straightforward. They spread out, coming at the blonde from all directions, from 360 degrees, aiming at every part of her body from her feet and ankles to her legs, stomach, chest, heart, neck and head. And the speed of the weapons shooting through the air was much greater than before. This is new. Daiki blinked, surprised. Everything had been going more or less the same as the other timeline until now. She was using chakra strings. Not just a few, but literal hundreds of them at once. Daiki could see each and every single one of them spreading out from Tenten's fingertips, branching out like a glowing spider web. Chakra strings varied. For instance, Kankaro needed to use a full hand to use just a single puppet, but controlling one puppet was vastly harder than just controlling the movement of a single weapon. While Tenten was using a vast amount of chakra strings, not a single one even came close to a fraction of the control of a true puppet user. She didn't need that kind of ability for controlling weapons though, which was why she was currently able to use so many. But when did Ten Ten get so good with chakra strings? Daiki wondered, even as Tamari sent out a quick burst of wind to blow the weapons away and immediately backpedaled. Getting distance as Ten Ten landed and whipped her hands again, sending the weapons back after her before they even hit the ground. Was it because of him helping her with her chakra control? That was the only difference with her that came to mind here. And beyond that, that's some amount of chakra she's using. He whistled lightly. Out of all the genin gathered here, beyond himself, Naruto and Gara, Tenten definitely had the most chakra. Actually, she probably had more chakra than Karinai if he wasn't wrong. Tamari was a flurry of movement, ducking beneath her fan as a shield, spinning and unleashing burst of wind and on the retreat constantly. Sweat was already beginning to pool on her forehead and the blonde's eyes were beginning to shine with panic. The constant harrowing of the weapons and their speed, 
left her little time at all to use a powerful enough jutsu to regain the advantage. And in fact, if she didn't have such a powerful wind chakra metal weapon to rely on, and had to use hand seals for her jutsu like most, she would have already lost. It wasn't Tamari's skill here that was letting her keep up. It was her weapon. It just went to show, in a battle between equals, it would be those with the better equipment that had the advantage. Still, it had become more of a battle of attrition. Would Tamari be able to defend long enough for Tenten to run out of chakra? That question was answered only partially. Tenten faltered for just a moment, the sheer amount of chakra she was using visible to him in how quite a few of her chakra strings flickered out, the weapons at the end of them clattering to the ground. And it was enough for Tamari to gain a foothold. She slammed the butt of her fan into the ground. Wind style. Protective wind barrier. A churning barrier of wind erupted from the ground and formed a spherical barrier around the blonde. Bouncing away the weapons Tenten continued on with. The barrier flickered away almost immediately after. This is it. Tenten declared, drawing her hands up and thrusting them down. Sending all the weapons, still hundreds strong towards the blonde. The blonde who had used the split few moments of being protected by her wind barrier to raise her fan up above her hand. Yeah it is. The blonde agreed. Wind style. Great task of the dragon. A powerful gale wind sparked into existence up above. And a moment later, a huge, massive even, glowing green tornado of wind erupted and roared down like a churning dragon. Just before the weapons would have gave Tamari the same outfit as a hedgehog, the massive wind jutsu shot down, enveloping the bun-haired girl and almost immediately, the chakra strings flickered out and the weapons clattered to the ground uselessly. He heard Ten Ten scream in pain only for a moment, before her voice was drowned out by the roaring hurricane. That's some jutsu. Daiki grimaced, definitely an A-rank jutsu if he wasn't wrong. Though even with her fan enhancing her ability and making wind jutsu cost much less chakra to use, Tamari could only hold it up for a short period of time. The blonde slumped to her knees, panting deeply, exhaustion etched on her face as she leaned against her fan. And a split moment later the huge hurricane flickered and died away, and Tenten came into view. Her eyes shut and body filled with bleeding lacerations from where the wind jutsu had sliced into her body all over. She hit the ground a moment later with an audible thump, completely unconscious. While Tamari panted deeply in exhaustion and kept a keen eye on her downed opponent, Ten Ten didn't even twitch. She was so still, Daiki might have feared that Jutsu had killed her. If not for the fact he could still see her breathing, see straight through her chest to her heart and see it still pumping, if slowly. For an A-rank Jutsu in scope, the damage it dealt wasn't all that special. Daiki noted, even with the Wind Chakra Metal boosting her abilities, it seemed Tamari still couldn't use that jutsu fully. Ten Ten is unable to continue. Tamari is the winner. Hayate announced after a few moments of Ten Ten remaining still. That was his cue. Ten Ten Song. Lee vaulted over the railing down to the arena before and sprinted rapidly towards his downed teammate. He was still wearing his weights though. So before he even made it halfway to her, Daiki had already rushed past him and scooped the older girl up into his arms. Daiki-san, Lee skidded to a halt, blinking at him in surprise. I've got her, don't worry. He nodded to the older boy. Okay? The bowl-haired shinobi looked a little lost. Better him than the medic ninja on staff, really. If any complications came about, he could provide way better healing than them. And he definitely wasn't gonna let Ten-Ten die. He made a single hand seal even with the girl in his arms. A swirl of leaves forming around his body as he disappeared with a shun shin. As he did though, he noticed Tamari's eyes narrowing at him, or perhaps the girl in his arms. Instead of heading to the infirmary, where the medic ninja on staff would be around, Daiki instead headed for his provided bedroom. The furniture had been returned to their previous location in the room now that he wasn't going to be stuck in there any longer. So he lay Ten Ten down the middle bed. Now let's see. Daiki mused, looking the girl over. Her body was filled with lacerations, and a lot of her clothing had been shredded, blood oozing out of the tears. First of all, it was best to get a proper look. So Daiki made a single hand seal, a green aura forming over his hands, as he used the mystical palm jutsu, 
and began examining the girl's body internally. Hmm, he hummed. The mystical palm jutsu was perhaps his most used jutsu beyond the shadow clone jutsu. He was very much experienced with it. So it didn't take long at all for him to examine the older girl's internal body and feel out her injuries. It wasn't too bad. Beyond the lacerations on her skin, she had some internal bleeding to go along with it in her stomach and her ribs were broken. Her left femur was heavily bruised and her left shoulder was cracked. Pretty bad, for a normal ninja at least, but nothing he couldn't heal up with his medical jutsu within a few hours. This was a good chance to experiment with something though. He focused on the seal upon his neck, drawing on the powerful combined chakra within that grew ever so slightly as time passed on. As he did, he focused the chakra into his eyes, his scarlet red eyes shining with a red glow that lit up the room. The energy shifted into pure life force and he directed it into the green healing aura of chakra around his hands. Almost immediately, it shifted into a bright and warm glowing silvery white energy and he spread the energy over the older girl's body, expanding it until it looked like she was wrapped within a protective cocoon of energy. Almost immediately, the gashes and lacerations along her body began to close up before his eyes and with the mystical palm jutsu, he could feel in real time as her internal injuries and injured bones began to mend as well. In just 30 seconds, he was done. And all of Tenton's injuries were healed as if they were never there to begin with. Well, the dried blood and shredded clothing spoke for themselves though. Not bad. Daiki grinned, dispelling his jutsu and wiping the sweat that had formed on his forehead from concentration. Experiment success though he figured it would go that way anyway. Converting the energy of Jellal, star chakra and natural energy into a healing jutsu with his eyes, amplified the healing abilities of the mystical palm jutsu massively. And it only took a small spark of that energy within his seal. He could probably restore lost limbs with this kind of jutsu. Hmm, it's not really the mystical palm jutsu either at this point. He mused, well it was only amplified, kind of like the sage arts. Shinkigan style mystical palm jutsu, maybe? Or maybe just mythical palm jutsu. If he was Minato Namikaze, he'd probably name it something like the mystical mythical resurrection life revitalizing palm of the immortal starry scarlet turtle heavens jutsu. Now he was half tempted to go with that absurd name just to see people's reactions when he called the name of it out. A groan coming from the bun-haired girl on the bed beside him drew him from his thoughts, and he looked down to see her eyelids fluttering open as she woke. Ugh! She groaned, before blinking and looking at him. Daiki, have a nice rest. Sleeping beauty? He teased. Feeling all right? For a second, she just stared at him, before frowning and giving a disappointed sigh. So I lost then? She asked, shoulders slumping in defeat. More or less, Daiki shrugged. It was pretty close though. Her frown deepened. It sure doesn't feel like it. She could have blown me away with that stupidly huge wind jutsu at the end there at any time. Tenten clenched her fists and pushed herself up into a sitting position. It was all I could do to press her there at the end a bit. And you almost won because of it, Daiki pointed out. I was impressed with the chakra strings by the way. When did you learn to do that? She shrugged. I've been working on chakra strings for a good year now, though I'm not all that good with them. Even tried my hand at using puppets once, but I can only control one even with all my fingers, Tenten replied. After my training with you, my chakra control got way better and I figured using them like this I could make up for a lack of quality with quantity. But well, you see where that got me. She sighed. There's no shame in losing to Tamari, you know, he assured her. She's a year older than you and is the oldest kid of the Kazakage. On top of that, she could only use her wind jutsu like she did because her weapon is a pretty high-grade wind chakra metal. Plus, wind jutsu is one of the worst matchups for you. Hell, she did far better than her other self had at least. Ten Ten snorted. A loss is a loss, Daiki. The excuse is pretty it up, but I still got my butt kicked. She shrugged. Though, you seem to know a lot about her. Something you'd like to tell me? She arched a brow at him and gave him a dry gaze. She confronted me over making fun of her brothers and village. He admitted. Ah, uh, who? Tenton's arched eyebrow seemed to pierce into him. And you flirted with her. She accused. Smartly on her part. Maybe he shrugged. Though in my defense, she confronted me before you got to the tower. The bun-haired girl sighed. I'm really gonna need to muzzle you. Maybe get you spayed while I'm at it? Ten-Ten shook her head. So, 
How long have I been out? Did I miss the end of the prelims? Nah, it's only been about 10 minutes at most, Daiki replied. I just brought you back here to my room instead of the infirmary to heal you up quick and personally make sure you didn't suffer much. Oh, she blinked blankly for a moment before a small smile formed on her lips. Thanks, I guess. Though shouldn't you be keeping an eye on everyone to know what you'll be up against in the third exam? Nah, he waved her off. I already know what everyone taking part in the exam is capable of, and there's nobody here that can beat me. She snorted. I hope that arrogance bites you in the butt someday. It'll break its teeth trying. He smirked. Ten Ten shook her head. So not cute, Daiki? She replied, before sighing and leaning back into the pillow, her arm coming up to cover her eyes. It's frustrating? She admitted. Daiki was savvy enough to know she wasn't talking about his cocky arrogance. This time, losing? He asked, getting to the root of the issue. Failing to keep up? She replied. I've always been way below Niji, but even Lee's leaving me in the dust. Guy sensei has even been teaching him a super special jutsu lately. I train every day, I study my butt off, I collect every type of weapon I can find and learn how to use every single one. But normal stuff like this can't keep up with a Hyuga genius or the things Guy Sensei is teaching Lee. Hmm. Did she know it was the Eight Gates or not? Daiki assumed she did, after all, to use the The Lotus, Lee had to open the first gate. And he wasn't shy in using it last, he remembered. They're not that special, he assured her. There's a limit to how far the Byakugan and Gentle Fist can go alone and Niji's approaching it rapidly, and the gates are full of drawbacks that Lee is incapable of getting around. The best Lee could do was train his body and adapt as best he could to handle the strain. He wasn't like Daiki or even Naruto who had innate healing abilities that would massively lessen the strain on them from the eight gates. You even know about the gates, huh? Ten Ten mused, biting her lip. When you come away with stuff like that so casually, it almost makes me believe you're boasting about being as strong as you say you are. I'm being truthful, it's not my fault if nobody believes me until they get my foot up their asses. Daiki shrugged. I suppose seeing is believing, so you can watch me kick everybody's asses in the third round. For a moment, she was silent. Then she lifted her arm from her eyes and looked up at him, her eyes slightly red and puffy. It looked like she had been on the verge of crying in sheer frustration. It's understandable, young as she may be, she has put a not inconsiderable amount of time of her life into training to become strong, Isabu mused. You are anomaly as far as gaining strength as a human goes, you're a freak really with your obsession with grinding, but on top of that, you're a freak who cheats. Someone like her who has no special teacher or the opportunities you have, will find it a struggle to progress after reaching a point. A cheating freak. Huh? Well, he wasn't wrong, but still hurtful. Still, he did have a point. Ten Ten had quite large chakra reserves and she was very, very skilled at what she did. But skill only went so far in the face of raw, unadulterated power. Can? Can you help me get stronger? Ten Ten asked. He blinked. Ah, okay. Daiki agreed with a shrug. Ten Ten stared at him. Just like that? She asked, looking quite lost. Just like that? He nodded. While he was going to be pursuing a possible relationship with this girl, and as such it would be in his best interest to make sure she didn't kick the bucket on missions, there was also something else. Ten Ten had trained with more or less every type of weapon, to the point where she was basically a master of almost every type of weapon, or at least every type of general weapon shape. On top of that, she in the future would have went on to be able to use the tools of the Sage of Six Paths, be better with them even than the Gold and Silver Brothers or Darui. The skill was there, the potential was there, and the drive was there. If he helped power her up, she would be a great help in the future. Honestly, out of all the Kanoha Twelve as they were called in the other timeline besides Naruto and Sasuke, Ten Ten was probably the easiest of them all for him to help reach S-Class tier. Especially with what he had sitting in his Dimension Four seal, gathering dust. Well, not really since there wasn't any dust in there, but the point remained. I kind of expected to have to plead with you a bit or something, maybe bribe you. Ten Ten pointed out slowly. I mean, you still can it might make me help you even more, he pointed out with a grin. I'm partial to Dash. Lap dances, I know. She cut him off giving him a dry look. You're an idiot, you know that? I know you are, but what am I? Daiki retorted, grin widening at his epic retort. She rolled her eyes and sat up. 
and then surprised him by promptly standing up, only to sit right down atop him, straddling his thighs, wrapping her arms around his neck. Still an idiot, Ten Ten replied, before leaning forward and pressing her lips against his. It wasn't some epic passionate kiss, and more really just a chaste press of her lips against his for a few seconds before pulling back and pressing her forehead against his gently, staring into his eyes. Still, thank you, she said gratefully. Jumping the gun a bit, aren't you? He chuckled, wrapping his arms around her waist. You don't even know if my training help will be all that good, he pointed out. That wasn't for the training help, that was just me marking my territory, Ten Ten snorted. You've got too many girls hounding after you. Since when? His forehead wrinkled in thought. At most he'd flirted a bit with Sakura and Ino, but they were still solidly into Sasuke. Feelings didn't change that easily. Tamari thinking he was hot didn't mean she had feelings for him either. Well, he did have that little heart-to-heart -heart with Sakura he supposed and she was receptive to his flirting and seemed to have opened her eyes a bit. But that didn't really change anything at the moment. And it wasn't like she knew anything about his arrangement with Anko. Which, now that he thought about, probably wouldn't go anywhere since Ten Ten was all but saying she wanted to date him right now. He was a lot of things. Many of them bad. Such as an asshole, a prick, a serial killer, a thief, a bastard, devilishly handsome. But he wouldn't cheat on someone. Unless they were pricks. Well, that sucks. Guess I won't be riding Anko like a pony. But oh well. He withheld a sigh of disappointment. Well, not really a big deal in the grand scheme of things. How do you flirt so easily and so much, yet still be such a dunce about this kind of thing? Ten Ten arched an eyebrow at him, deadpan look in her eyes. I'm a genius, what can I say? Daiki shrugged and unwound his arms from the older girl's waist, holding one arm up. But since you're big on marking your territory apparently, these will probably fit you best. He focused on the Dimension Force seal and pulled one of the summoning contracts out of it, the huge scroll appearing atop his palm a moment later. What's that? Ten Ten looked up, confused. A summoning contract I made, he replied. For a pack of giant black-maned wolves, they're big and will get tougher and smarter thanks to the contract, though they need training, so that'll be up to you. Um, what? Ten Ten stared at him blankly. How the heck am I supposed to train giant wolves? Kakashi owes me instructions on training Ninken, so I'll give them to you, Daiki replied. I'll give you or show you everything you need to do to become super strong. The actual training will still be up to you though. He couldn't hold her hand through it, not when he still had a ton of crap and training of his own to go through. Oh! Ten Ten blinked. Wait, you're just giving me what amounts to being able to make my own summoning clan, training and all? Like, how'd you even make a summoning contract anyway? Cause I'm awesome, like I keep saying, he shrugged. And yeah, a lot of what I'll help you out with will have to wait until after these prelims though and during the month leading up to the third exam. What do you mean a month leading up to the third exam? Won't it just be right after the prelims like the others? She asked. Nah, there'll be a month break before it to give everyone a chance to train more and show off to those coming to watch. He replied. That makes sense going by what the Hokage said. Ten Ten nodded. But, how do you know that? Cause I'm the next Hokage. Daiki smirked. Ten Ten rolled her eyes. If you didn't want to tell me, you could have just said it was a secret. Like anyone will believe that. She snorted. Why was it nobody ever believed him when he told the truth so blatantly? She unwound her arms from his neck and stood up, accepting the scroll from him. Still, thanks for this. She smiled down at him summoning scroll in her arms. Don't mention it. He waved her off. Just call me Sugar Daddy Daiki. He winked at her. You have some weird fetishes, you know that? She replied blandly. First there was that simpering personality you had me put on, then the lap dance obsession and now this? Ashur was lonely being a genius. Nobody understood his greatness but himself. A few minutes later, Daiki with a whistle on his lips leisurely strolled back through the halls of the tower and back to where the prelims were taking place. When he entered, it was just in time to hear, the next round will be Shino Aburame versus Sasuke Uchiha. Eight announced. Uh, neat, he got back in time to see Sasuke fight. He noticed though as he jumped back up to the balcony above, that the room was a bit less full than it was before. 
He couldn't see Kiba, Choji, or that stretchy dude from Kabuto's team. He passed by Team 10 on his way over to Team 7 and couldn't even give Ino a wink as he went past. His attention was drawn to Shikamaru. The shirtless Shikamaru whose bare torso was littered with claw marks. Have a wild night, buddy? He asked with a grin. Shikamaru just gave him a bland look. That would have probably be even more troublesome. He replied. No, I just fought Kiba. Him and his puppy were a massive drag to take down. Uh, he beat Kiba? Interesting, Daiki would have pegged Kiba to be the one to win a matchup between those two in an area like this. Where's Choji? He asked. He fought before Shikamaru. Ino shrugged, drawing his attention to her. He fought against that Kabuto guy's teammate. A total freak by the way who could stretch like he was made of rubber, and he choked Choji out. I can't believe Shikamaru is the only one of us to pass this stupid exam. Well, that answered that. You sure took your sweet time coming back, kid. He was distracted by Asuma sensei speaking up before he could respond to Ino. And after rushing off with Guy's little girl too. Something you want to admit? There was a grin on the bearded man's face. A teasing one at that. He seemed to be rather amused. Yeah, actually, fess up. Ino pointed out at him. Is there something going on with you and that girl? Daiki grinned at her. That's for me to know, he replied, before leaning forward. And you to Doth. He flicked her on the nose before turning away, continuing on to Team 7. He heard Eno growl behind him and his grin widened. Tenton's fine. He assured Lee and Guy as he passed them as well before they could ask. So hip and cool, he heard Lee say behind him. Well, look who it is, Mr. Knight in shining armor himself. Kakashi looked up from his book as Daiki approached him and his team. Did your fair maiden give you a reward smooch? Yes, actually. A very nice one to be honest. Chaste as it was. Not that Daiki was going to mention that when Sakura was standing right there, her head turning away from looking down at Sasuke to him when Kakashi spoke. Just because you're a virgin Kakashi, doesn't mean you get to live vicariously through me. Daiki responded idly. He was really only half paying attention to Kakashi. The rest of his attention was focused on the arena below. Specifically on the black-haired Uchiha that had paused upon his return to the massive room and looked up at him, staring him straight in the eye. They held eye contact for a few moments, before Sasuke smirked and turned away facing his opponent. Shino. Hmm. You can cut the tension with a knife, Kakashi commented with a giggle. Something you want to share with the class Daikikuen? Kakashi-sensei, Sakura cried out, aghast. Daiki took his attention off of Sasuke and turned to look at Kakashi. He was going to give him a whopper of a glare. But he could only muster a deadpan stare when he saw Sakura's face was bright red and wearing a warped smile, green eyes glinting with interest as she looked between him and her teammate down below. Daiki sighed internally. He forgot she was actually a total closet pervert and was into that kind of thing, or so Naruto's reverse harem jutsu from the other timeline had him believe. I don't get it, Naruto added. Eyes narrowed into thin slits and face scrunched up in thought, making him look a bit like a fox. There's nothing to get, Daiki assured him with a wave of his hand. Kakashi is just a sad sack who's been dateless for so long that he's seeing things. Now that's just hurtful, Kakashi shrugged, eyes smiling all the way. But I'll have you know I see plenty of women. Name one, Daiki snorted. Your mother. Kakashi's grin was so broad it was visible through his mask. Kakashi-sensei, you can't say that. Sakura gaped at the man, head whipping around to stare at the man in shock. I just did, T. The man giggled unashamedly. My mother's dead, you know, has been for over a decade. Daiki shook his head, the implication not even phasing him. That says a lot about you, that your go-to is banging a corpse. I'm a man of cultured tastes. Kakashi shrugged his words off again. Unlike a child like yourself, more like a man of small ability, Daiki emphasized the word ability and gave a roll of his eyes. If he wanted to play it like this, he could do it too. The only way for you to get to a girl's heart is with that Chidori of yours. Kakashi twitched, though it was so quick and so small. Daiki doubted Sakura or Naruto picked up on it. You're one ruthless kid. You know that? He shook his head. You started it. Daiki rolled his shoulders and smirk. I suppose I did. Kakashi nodded. Fair enough. 
and that was that. I don't have any idea what's going on. Naruto was looking even more lost. Sakura nodded right alongside him. I don't get it either. The pink-haired girl admitted and gave them both an odd glance. Why were you insulting each other like that? And bringing up someone's dead mother is just mean Kakashi-sensei. Especially like that. MMM. Naruto nodded. Daiki's a cocky fool. But you don't just say that to somebody Kakashi-sensei. It's nothing personal. Kind of. Kakashi chuckled. I'm just doing my civic duty to deflate the ego of one of our up and coming valued shinobi before it gets him killed. I just have fun taking the piss out of this guy. Daiki crossed his arms and nodded his head in agreement with the man. Besides, we'd be pretty crappy shinobi if insulting a dead loved one was enough to make us lose our cool. True, true. Kakashi nodded. For a hormonal cocky little brat you have a remarkable control of your temper. Most in the same situation as you family wise would have flown off the handle at something like that. Yes well, he was long since accustomed to yo mama jokes and insults. Anyone who spent any time on the internet needed some thick skin unless they only frequented hug box safe spaces. Naruto grimaced noticeably and opened his mouth to respond. But the whiskered blonde was cut off by Hey 8. Shino Aburame vs Sasuke Uchiha. Begin! The proctor called out. As soon as the fight began, both fighters moved in the exact same direction. Sasuke exploded forward, chakra pushing from his feet to give him an accelerated boost and rushed towards Shino in a blur of speed. Hmm. Sasuke had learned that little trick as well? Well, not like he can copy my jutsu, so it's no wonder he doesn't know the body flicker yet. Daiki mused. Sasuke could copy his taijutsu techniques, but he couldn't copy his ninjutsu. The way the Sharingan worked, was that it imitated those in the vision of it perfectly and ingrained that in the user's memory with perfect recollection, akin to photographic memory. The problem in this case was that, thanks to the Shinkigen, he could wholly mask his chakra from even the Sharingan and as such, Sasuke was unable to copy any of the jutsu he used when they sparred. As Sasuke rushed him, Shino fled in the same direction, backpedaling backwards rapidly to get distance, though noticeably much slower than Sasuke. The sunglasses wearing Aburame lifted his hands up, jacket sleeves spread wide open and a pair of hazy black clouds erupted from his sleeves, each swelling to larger than an adult man and shooting through the air towards Sasuke. Though these clouds were not made of vapor or smoke, but rather tiny buzzing chakra absorbing insects, instead of retreating or even pausing to make sense of what was heading his way, Sasuke pushed off up into the air, rocketing up far above Shino and ran through a blurring set of hand seals before cupping a hand around his mouth and exhaling. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Sasuke spat out a massive fireball, easily larger than three men put together and Daiki had to withhold a whistle. It was easily the biggest fireball he'd seen Sasuke fire off. His chakra capacity has increased noticeably after being exposed to the curse seal, just like yours did initially. Isabu commented. Hmm, true, that did make sense. Not only was the fireball big, but it was fast as well. Shino had no choice but to cut off his backpedaling and rushing to the side, fleeing the attack that slammed into his previous position and exploded against the tiled floor into a wave of flames that washed outwards in all directions. Shino had to jump a split moment later to dodge that secondary effect, leaving him in mid-air, if only for a moment, a moment Sasuke took advantage of. The Uchiha had already landed and shot towards him, flicking his wrist and sending a bevy of shuriken spiraling through the air towards the bug user. The Uchiha didn't even seem winded from his fireball jutsu. By my estimates, his chakra capacity is currently around what yours was when we first met. Isabu added, that wasn't bad at all. If he remembered right, when they first met, his chakra capacity was approaching 50,000 and was in the Jonin tier. Shino drew a kunai in the blink of an eye and parried the shuriken coming his way, diverting them from slicing into his body. But it kept his attention busy for a split few milliseconds, which were precious when it came to ninja on ninja combat. Even academy brats barely out of their toddler years could outpace a sports car back from the other world after all. And Sasuke was far faster than one of them. Faster now even than he originally would have been. And Shino didn't seem to have changed at all. In parrying the shuriken, Shino lost sight of Sasuke, though Daiki did not. The Uchiha circled around in a blur, 
getting around the bug user as he turned, right in time for Sasuke to spring forward launching a high kick that caught the bug user under the chin. Ho! Daiki's eyebrow rose in interest as Shino rocketed up into the fair from the force of the blow, laying prone and airborne up above. And Sasuke used that chance to push up off of the leg he'd sprung off of to kick Shino and shoot up into the air after him. That's Dash! He heard Lee shout in shock. Yep, shadow of the dancing leaf. Though imperfect by the looks of it, it did get him into Shino's blind spot though. And Sasuke took supreme advantage of that, hooking a leg around Shino's waist from behind and spinning them both around before lashing out with an elbow that caught Shino in the throat as he tried to retaliate with the kunai in his hand. The bug user choked and Sasuke took his chance to launch into a barrage of revolving kicks all over Shino's body on the way down, before finishing with a handstand atop the other boy's head and driving a double mule kick straight into his torso, smashing him into the ground. Shino didn't stand a chance. Sasuke sprung off of their former classmate's head and landed lightly on his feet, dusting off his hands and looking away from the prone boy. Instead of paying attention to Shino whom he'd just defeated, the boy looked at up Daiki and smirked at him. He could practically feel the smug confidence radiating off the boy and he understood exactly what he was saying even without words. You're next. Nobody said a thing for a few moments until a good five or so seconds passed without any motion from Shino. After all, the chance was there that the boy had switched out with a bug clone. Though of course he hadn't. That was why Sasuke wasn't paying attention to the boy. He would have noticed thanks to his Sharingan if he had. They weren't shadow clones after all. Winner. Sasuke Uchiha. Hey, declared then. Yeah, way to go Sasuke Kuen. Sakura hooped, cheering him on. Damn. That bastard looked way cooler out there than me. Cage. Naruto crossed his arms and complained, though there was a smile on his face even as he complained. With his win announced, Sasuke smugly walked his way over to the stairs and up to the railing above instead of just jumping up at a leisurely pace while the medics came in to take Shino away. As that happened, Hei8 looked to the huge electronic screen at the end of the room just as it lit up again and landed on two familiar names. Kankuro vs. Hinata Hyuga. Well, that was an interesting change as well. Looks like the quiet girl is up, Hibaba, right? Sasuke noted as he approached, smirk still plastered over his face. Hinata, Daiki absently corrected him. His eyes were on the midnight blue-haired girl, so very different from the one who would originally fight in this place against her cousin. Kankuro had a huge smirk of his own on his face as he swaggered down, supremely confident. Hinata, though, walked at a measured pace, face blank and head held high. If it was the her from before, she'd be shrinking away from all the eyes on her. That's what I said. Sasuke shrugged and stood beside him, leaning on the railing. Looks like she's up against that loser from the sand as well. He wasn't that impressive when we ran into him. Let's see if this girl has actually become worth anything. I'll be disappointed if she loses pathetically after training with you. You will. Daiki raised an eyebrow. He didn't think Sasuke had all that of an interest in her. In you, Sasuke's smirk grew. If she can't even beat this clown, your teaching abilities are obviously subpar, and you'll never make it as a jonin sensei in the future. Who said anything about me wanting to be a sensei? Daiki raised an eyebrow, actually confused. Weren't you bragging about your little apprentice to me before? Hitati or something? Sasuke raised an eyebrow right back at him. Hanabi. Daiki corrected him on reflex. Same difference. Sasuke shrugged. Daiki gave him a deadpan stare, before making a single hand seal while Sasuke leaned against the metal railing. Arms spread out confidently. He must have thought he looked cool like that, and would no doubt have been the epitome of casual uncaring badassery. If not for the doodles that popped up on his face, mustache, glasses, inky crap, Jizz and all. Naruto erupted into laughter. The heck are you laughing about? Sasuke looked at Naruto, his second eyebrow joining the second. Naruto only laughed harder. Kakashi tittered. Um. Sasuke Kuin, what happened to your face? Sakura tentatively brought up. Sasuke blinked. My face? He asked, lost. In response, the pink haired girl swallowed before reaching into her equipment pouch and bringing out a small hand mirror, and held it up for Sasuke to see his face in. 
Sasuke stared blankly at his doodled reflection, and stared. He kept that up for a good five seconds before his onyx black eyes swirled, burning into a crimson red with two rapidly rotating Tomo in each eye. His head mechanically turned daiki, and he gave him a bloody red glare. You! He accused. That's a good look for you. Daiki smirked at him. Crap head. Sasuke's eyebrows twitched, and a vein throbbed on his forehead. I'll kill you for this, he vowed. Then you woke up with your face in your cereal bowl. Daiki taunted. I swear I'm going to avenge myself on you for this. Sasuke promised, fists clenching together over the railing. Tight enough he could hear the metal groaning. I'm not into dudes, sorry buddy. Daiki shot back. Forget his cute little apprentice's name, would he? You will suffer the wrath of an Uchiha for this. I hear they make a cream for that now. Wrath not rash you prick. That day, everyone gathered got to the sea rare sight of Sasuke Uchiha completely losing his cool. To be fair Suzuki, it's not nice to forget people's names like that. Kakashi happily piped in, and then promptly had to duck as Sasuke launched a punch at his face, tittering all the way. All the while Naruto just laughed and laughed. The whiskered blonde laughed until tears came to his eyes, and he collapsed on his backside holding his stomach from the sheer hilarity he felt. The commotion they were making drew quite a few disgruntled or angry looks, specifically from the sand team. Even more specifically, Tamari was giving him the evil eye once again. Not that he was all that bothered with it, or anyone giving him any angry looks for that matter. Still, Hey 8 gave them a pointed look. Their shenanigans were causing enough of a ruckus that it was holding up the next match. So Daiki being the ever-generous lad he was, sealed away the doodles once more. It didn't stop Sasuke from glaring at him though. Hate you, he said, leaning over the railing, facing down at the arena below. But his attention was on him, eyes glaring through his peripherals. Hate you so much, you know? They say there's a fine line between love and hate. Kakashi hummed and Daiki resisted the urge to snort as Sasuke wrinkled his nose in disgust. Still, fun as this is, what brings you to our little corner of the railing? We're standing right in the middle of it. Daiki deadpanned only for Kakashi to shrug. I'm here for my payment, remember? Oh, is that so? Kakashi mused, before reaching into his pouch and pulling out a rolled up scroll and tossing it Daiki's way. There you go. Wait. What payment? What's in the scroll? Naruto asked as Daiki caught it. Training methods for training dogs. The tan genin shrugged, slipping it into his own pouch. That just seemed to confuse Naruto and he wasn't alone. Why? Sakura asked, eyebrows raised and giving him an odd look. I don't think how much of a dog you are factors into this kind of thing. Sasuke snorted a smirk spreading across his face at Sakura's little dig at him. Woof woof. Daiki replied. Sakura gave him a dry look. His attention was taken by the two who had made their way downstairs while their little commotion was going on. Specifically, his eyes were on the midnight blue-haired girl, so different from her previous self who stood opposite Kankaro. Oh great, Kankaro huffed. Not only do I need to fight a brat, but a little girl at that, he commented arms crossed casually. Hinata didn't respond at all to his words. Instead she ignored him entirely and looked over her shoulder, her pale white eyes locking with Daiki's own. Kankuro audibly growled at being ignored, as if slighted. That was a good move on her part. Both Kankuro and Tamari were all up on their high horse over Kanoha right now and looked down on them as if they were lesser just because they weren't struggling financially like the Sand Village. Though he bet Hinata wasn't at all thinking of that. She smiled lightly his way and he smiled back before giving her a wink and a nod. She had this. Her smile twitched up a bit more, before she turned back to face her puppet using opponent. The white-eyed girl slid one foot back, both arms coming up, one slightly above the other fingers pointed outwards, the beginning stance of the gentle fist. TCH. Kankaro clicked his tongue. Hey eight looked between both of them, making sure they were both ready before lifting his hand and bringing it down. Begin! He declared. As soon as declared the beginning of the match, Hinata's chakra pulsed. Be a Kugan! She voiced and he saw the telltale veins pulsing around her eyes before she promptly pushed off, rushing towards Kankuro who stayed standing still. 
A smirk played across Kankaro's face as she rapidly approached him. Only, instead of attacking him straight out, Hinata jumped, flipping over his body and landing behind him before launching a rapid two-fingered strike towards the bandaged object on his back. Heh! That little hiding trick is useless against the Byakugan. Daiki smirked. There was a grunt of pain as she made contact, before a puff of smoke overcame the bandaged object and suddenly in its place was Kankaro. Only, not quite, Hinata's fingers smashed right through with shattering sound and Kankaro's visage fell away to show the bland, pale, dull-eyed expression of a puppet beneath. Behind the puppet, the bandaged object unveiled and Kankaro jumped out gaining distance, one hand clutching at his shoulder where Hinata's two fingers had impacted initially. How did you know I was there? The older boy grimaced and demanded. It was a very convincing disguise. Hinata commented as she spun on her foot and lashed out with a roundhouse kick that caught the puppet. Crow in the neck and decapitated it as well sending both head and body bouncing away. But my Byakugan can see through solid objects. She added and rushed forward towards him. Is that right? Kankaro ground his teeth and began backpedaling rapidly trying to gain distance. The fingers of his free hand twitched. Chakra strings in full view for Daiki thanks to his eyes and he saw the puppet crow that had hit the ground split apart into several different pitches, before blades erupted from the split ends of its parts and shot towards Hinata from behind. He was intending to skewer her from behind while she rushed him. Not that it would work. Hinata tilted her head, letting one of the bladed parts shoot by her head, then lashed out with a quick chop of two fingers, chakra coating the digits. She severed the chakra string controlling it easily. What the hell? Kankaro gaped, eyes wide with shock. Despite his shock, he wasn't idle though and let go of his shoulder, and with both hands now controlled the puppet parts, each spreading out and shooting at Hinata from all angles like bullets. She was forced to stop her pursuit of the older boy and spin out of the way of one, ducking under another, jumping the next. It almost looked like she was dancing as she wove between each of the bladed puppet parts without ever taking her gaze off of Kankaro. How the hell are you doing this? The boy grunted out in frustration. Chakra ignited around Hinata's fingers as she got her timing down, and she moved in a spiraling spinning blur, lashing out with both arms and slicing through the chakra strings of a puppet part each time she dodged. Upon the last one, she swept her foot around to bring her back around to face Kankaro and pushed off, rushing towards him. To quote a boy I know, Hinata replied, F you, that's how. Kankaro wasn't a physical specialist, so despite Hinata not being the fastest out there of the Kanoha Genin, she was still faster than him and now with his ace in the hole taken care of, she had no reason from hesitating and rushing him. Biatch! Kankaro spat. Literally. Just as she was upon him, he spat out a few senbon. Each point dipped in a liquid substance at point-blank range. Too bad for him, though. Hinata ducked, skidding underneath them, feet grinding against the ground with chakra, you are within my range, the girl declared. He could see them clearly with his Shinkigan, as could Hinata with her Byakugan. Two palms, Hinata declared softly as one palm smacked into his solar plexus, while the other caught him in the chin, before she spun again and smacked his shoulders with two strikes and continued on. For palms, eight palms, sixteen palms, eight trigrams, thirty-two palms, Hinata's hands were a blur of motion as she struck Kankaro all over his body. The last palm strike smashing into the core of his stomach and bodily lifting him up and sending him flying back a few feet to smash into the wall, where he promptly slumped to the ground unconscious. Ho! Daiki's eyebrows rose in interest. That was new. She could already use the 32 palms? From what he remembered, Hinata didn't actually learn that before until the time skip. She hadn't even shown that off while training with him. A recent thing, or was it something she wanted to surprise others with? It wasn't quite the 8 trigram 64 palms or the 8 trigrams 128 palms that Niji could use already around this time, but it was progress nonetheless. Pretty good progress at that. The difference between the her of now and the her of the other timeline was like that of night and day. Unlike Sasuke, Hinata didn't take her eyes off of Kankaro, just in case he managed to get up. She stayed in her stance, ready to keep on attacking in case he made any move. Hinata Hyuga is the winner, Hei declared after a few seconds of the puppet user remaining limp on the ground. Only then, 
After being declared the winner did Hinata relax, sliding out of her stance and letting out a noticeable sigh of relief. When did Hinata get so strong? Sakura commented. You can thank this idiot for that. Sasuke snorted, jabbing a thumb at Daiki. She's been training with this doof almost as much as me. Sakura blinked before looking at Daiki and her gaze turned dry. That makes sense. Hinata is cute. Especially with that longer hair. And I remember someone going on about how he liked longer hair as well. The pink-haired Kunoichi commented. Her gaze flickered down to her hands where the seals he placed on her for his jutsu was. Well, the results speak for themselves. He shrugged before looking to his side, specifically where Team Guy was. Lee was clapping happily as was Guy. His attention though was drawn to the other male member of their team. Niji had his hands gripped around the railing so hard Daiki wouldn't be surprised if the metal was warped and he was visibly gritting his teeth angrily. Dude needed to take a chill pill man. That could be a problem though, Niji is pretty strong and a great ally to have. But with this, Naruto isn't exactly going to get the motivation to kick his butt and remove that huge stick from it. He mused. So would he have to take care of that then? But, Naruto's message had a much bigger impact because of how much of a failure Naruto himself was considered. Despite never actually being one, just poorly trained and ignorant. Well, it would be something he needed to look into at least. His eyes drifted from Niji to Hinata who was making her way back up after being declared the winner. Her eyes were on him as well. He flashed her a thumbs up and then a nod. He could of course talk to her in her head thanks to his eyes and the jutsu he learned from Fu. But he was leaving it for now. Better to congratulate her in private. She smiled brightly at him. Cheeks darkening a bit as she made her way back to her team. Heh. Guess not all of that shyness of hers had been dealt with. It was cute though when it wasn't her main trait. He looked away as she reached her team and was congratulated by Kurinai and Shino, Kiba still being in the infirmary. And he was just in time to see the huge electronic board light up once again and rapidly cycle through names before landing on two of the four left ready to fight. Sakura Haruno vs Niji Hyuga. Ah, well, she's in trouble. Daiki mused. Then again, better Niji than Gara. She would have been better off getting Lee. Lee, while vastly stronger, would at least not hurt her too badly and would go easy on her, giving her the chance at least to display her skills. Wait, Lee. Lee and Gara were the only two who hadn't fought yet. I guess some things are written in the stars. He mused. That could either be really good or really bad. If things go the way they did in the other timeline, then I should get ready to step in. Sure, Lee had a whole character growth thing with his broken limbs and risking his life in his operation and Guy showed how amazing of a sensei he was, for Lee at least, willing to die with him if it failed. But just in case things do go wrong, I'd rather have Guy around. He thought, if it came to it, he'd heal Lee's legs himself using life force, but he'd really rather not waste any after emptying his reserves as he did before. As soon as her name appeared on the electronic board, Sakura had frozen up. She stared at her name displayed on the screen like a deer caught in headlights. Looks like it's your turn Sakura-chan. Naruto didn't read her mood very well and thumped her on the shoulder happily. All you need to do is kick this guy's butt and all three of us will have made it through. Yeah. She replied dazedly, biting her lip. Kakashi didn't say a word to her. Not that Daiki blamed him while Sasuke looked at the pink-haired girl with a raised eyebrow and didn't say a word either. He was just waiting for her choice. She should have known it was coming at this point when Hinata and Kankuro got called up. It had left only three possible options for her opponent and prepared something at the very least. Her head turned almost mechanically and she glanced at him out of the corner of her eyes, meeting his own. She seemed to want to say something to him. What are my chances of beating this guy with that jutsu you gave me? She asked. He'd like to tell her she had a chance. Maybe give her some advice that would let her gain an advantage. Close to zero, he replied bluntly and truthfully. If you could get an actual hit on him with it, you could win. The problem is you're nowhere near fast enough, experienced enough or skilled enough to do so right now. As much as he'd like to do that, he couldn't, because he didn't have a solution for her right in this very moment that could allow her to defeat Niji. Sakura's shoulders slumped. I see, she grimaced. Sasuke's eyebrow rose a bit higher, but that was all the reaction he gave. Naruto on the other hand, what the hell do you mean Daiki? 
the blonde sputtered. Sakura-chan can totally take this guy. No, she can't. Daiki denied, crossing his arms. Frankly, even if you went down there and helped her, fought him two on one, you'd still lose. No way, Naruto growled. I can take him, he declared. But even as he did, Daiki caught his blue eyes flickering over to Lee who was cheering Niji on as the Hyuga made his way down to the arena and grimacing. Yeah, Naruto should already be aware right now that he couldn't beat Lee right now and that Lee had declared that Niji was stronger than him. So bluster then, hyping himself up because nobody else would. Well, Daiki understood that part at least and he'd be a bit of a hypocrite to look down on him for it. He was the exact same after all. Daiki sighed. Niji is the Hyuga's big prodigy these days. As far as Taijutsu goes, there probably isn't any genin here more skilled than him right now. I think I'd even lose out to him, he informed, looking at Sakura. He'd give her this much at least and see what she made of it. His Byakugan allows him to see chakra through solid objects, have 360-degree vision meaning. He pretty much has no blind spots and see far off into the distance. On top of that, his Taijutsu style is the gentle fist. One poke of his fingers can close your tenketsu and lock down your chakra and stop you from using it. On top of that, there's a good chance he probably knows the Hyuga's famous defensive jutsu the rotation. He'll spin in a circle and unleash chakra through his tenketsu and create a rotating dome of chakra to use as a shield. Even my jutsu won't be able to break through it. Hmm. Sasuke smirked as he digested the information for Sakura himself while Naruto clicked his tongue. That's crap. Sakura huffed giving him a dead look. There's no way I can win this. Right now, yeah, you've got little chance. Daiki agreed with her, before reaching forward and placing a hand on her shoulder and giving it a soft reassuring squeeze. If you had an extra year under your belt like he did, I'd give you much better odds, but sadly life isn't convenient like that. Best advice I can give you? Just do your best, show off your skills and try to earn your promotion. Winning isn't the only thing that matters here. Oh, right? Her pretty emerald green eyes widened in realization and she nodded. That's much more doable, she agreed. Get in there then and show us what you can do. He grinned lightly. She returned the look before leaving them behind and making her way down to the arena to face off against Niji. Quite the pep talk, Kakashi commented as she left, not even looking up from his book now that she was gone. And as usual your knowledge is something else. It's really not, Daiki snorted rolling his eyes before glaring at the man. But just as usual, I'm doing your job for you. Why didn't you speak up and give her advice? Kakashi shrugged. Her best option is to surrender here and try again another time. This was just bad luck on her part. Maybe if you did your job properly, she would have had a better chance. Sasuke cut in with a huff. Kakashi rolled his singular visible eye at them. You do realize being a jonin sensei isn't about teaching you all jutsu and the like right? That's something you can learn on your own time, the elite Jonin pointed out. My job is to get you guys experience on the job, show you how to do your jobs and make sure you don't die on the way. Teaching new jutsu isn't required for that. Getting taught new jutsu is not a privilege you're entitled to. Excuses, Daiki scoffed. You're just a lazy bastard. Well, you're not wrong. Kakashi shrugged the accusation off. Daiki rolled his eyes and looked away from the scarecrow-looking Jonin and turned his attention to the pink-haired girl making her way down to the arena. She was gonna have a hell of an uphill battle, that was for sure. But if she can just make some decent moves, and then dash he paused as a thought came to mind. He extended his chakra outwards in a rippling wave, directing it towards Sakura while he focused chakra to his eyes. Sakura, he said with the chakra transmission jutsu he learned from Fu. Sakura froze in her steps for a moment before continuing on. Daiki? She replied. Yeah, he said. Look, I've already told you pretty much all you need to know. But if you want to maximize your chances for a promotion to Chunin, I've got a decent idea for you. If Shikamaru could be promoted for it, then despite how much he disliked it, then he would take advantage of it. How? The pink-haired girl asked. Just go with any plan that fits what you've decided on from everything I told you he replied. Show everything you can, and that's all, when you're totally out of options, just surrender. Surrender? But won't that make me look like a coward? She asked in her thoughts. To some, he confirmed. But to others looking too much into it, 
They'll see you making the smart choice to disengage from an enemy you can't defeat and it'll put marks for maturity and intelligence in your favor. Ah, right, just like what Irika Sensei said about heaven and earth. Neither one is good enough alone. I can't just be strong, I have to smart as well. The pink-haired girl replied in realization. Right, I can do this, thanks. Don't mention it. I've got your back. He waved her off. Hey, you've made no attempts to hide that. She giggled. Daiki raised an eyebrow at her words, before shrugging them off and cutting off the flow of chakra. Moments later, Sakura took her place in a cross from Niji and wasted no time falling into a loose ready stance that would allow her optimal chance to spring forward or backwards, depending on how things went. Niji in contrast gave her a dispassionate glance. His arms crossed in an almost bored fashion. He wasn't taking her seriously at all. Not that Daiki could blame him, there wasn't much Sakura could do to him at this point in time without him being taken utterly by surprise. Hey 8 looked between them and nodded before lifting his hand into the air and bringing it down. Sakura Haruno versus Niji Hyuga? Begin, he declared aloud. For a moment, none of them made a move. Sakura was tense, ready to move at a moment's notice, but Niji didn't. T make a move. This is foolish, the older white-eyed boy scoffed. You should just surrender while I'm feeling generous. You have no chance at all at defeating me. I won't know that unless I try. The pink-haired girl replied tightly. Niji scoffed again. Utter stupidity. I have already seen all you are capable of, and you fall vastly short of the level needed to even make me sweat. He replied. The only thing of note you have to your name is one singular jutsu that was given to you by someone else. A jutsu you can't even use without hurting yourself. Do yourself a favor and accept your fate and give you dash, as Niji was getting into his insulting tirade. Still not taking the girl seriously at all and demeaning her with every word, Sakura used that chance to act. Her right arm, extended outwards, was flicked into a rapid jab. It wasn't anything blindingly fast and was actually very slow by Daiki and even Niji's typical levels. But it wasn't meant to be anyway. Chakra rippled and a split moment later, a large compressed shock wave of pure force erupted from her fist and tore through the air towards Niji rapidly. An audible crack echoed through the room as Sakura's wrist once again snapped from the sheer force behind the jutsu and the girl gave a muffled scream of pain. Sakura chose the perfect time to attack and took advantage of Niji's arrogant grandstanding. Niji's eyes widened as the jutsu was on him in a split moment and quickly he spread his leg back, arms going outwards and wide before rapidly rotating like a spinning toad. Chakra sparked into existence, howling out of his tenketsu and forming around him into a large spiraling dome. The shock wave slammed into the dome of Chakra, and an explosion of sound blanketed the room drowning out everything else for a few moments. What the heck was that? Naruto sputtered as the jutsu was dispersed. It looked just like your jutsu Daiki. Daiki barely paid attention to the blonde Jinshiriki. Instead his eyes were on Sakura. She hadn't stayed idle. As soon as Niji started spinning and unleashed his ultimate defensive jutsu, she rushed towards it. Even as her right arm dangled useless at her side. Smart. He nodded approvingly. After all, Niji, arrogant as he was being in regards to Sakura and not taking her seriously, hadn't activated his Byakugan yet, so his vision was currently obscured within his jutsu and he couldn't see her getting close. When Niji spun to a stop and his dome shield of chakra flickered away, it was just in time for Sakura to reach him, getting within just a few feet of him. Niji's eyes widened in shock as the pink-haired girl once again took advantage of him not taking her seriously and threw a rapid punch out with her remaining non-damaged arm. Shinaro! The pink-haired girl roared. Once again the air rippled as a massive concentrated shock wave of pure force erupted from her fist at near point-blank range. Normally, this would have been the end, even as Sakura's second wrist snapped and the force of the jutsu jettisoned her back. This should have been checkmate. The problem though was in the sheer speed difference between her and her opponent. On seeming instinct alone, Niji spun, chakra erupting and roaring forth from his tenketsu. He didn't manage to form a shield of chakra even half the size of his previous one, but it did do its job. Even if the force still traveled through, Niji gagged noticeably as pure force slammed into his stomach and bodily lifted him into the air and threw him back the chakra forming around his body bursting apart. 
it hadn't been properly formed after all. Niji spun through the air before landing on his feet over 20 feet away, clutching at his stomach and glaring fiercely at Sakura who had landed in a crouched position. Pain visible on her pretty face as her arms hung limp at her sides, already purpling deeply with bruising. Tisish taking advantage of me speaking, how trivial, the Hyuga scoffed. Though a decent plan for trash like yourself, it doesn't change that it is my fate to defeat you. He added, letting go of his stomach and narrow his eyes. Veins visible throbbed around his eyes and his white irises became more pronounced as he activated his jujitsu. He was just about to spring forward towards Sakura, no doubt rushing her down before she could even do anything and give her a mighty beat down. Only he never got the chance. I give up. The pink-haired girl took Daiki's advice and surrendered. What? Niji was so shocked by the call that he actually stuttered forward a step. What? Naruto shouted. Sakura Haruno has surrendered. The winner is Niji Hyuga. Hei declared, before calling for the medic ninja to make their way in. While everyone was busy being shocked over what just occurred, the pink-haired girl instead looked over her shoulder and met Daiki's eyes. He smirked and gave her a nod of approval. It was a very, very short bout, but it went a long way to showing Sakura's strengths and few of her many weaknesses. Clever girl. He broadcasted to her with his chakra. The smile that splayed across her lips was almost blinding. For a moment, nobody really said anything. The most telling reaction of anyone's, though, was Niji's. The frustration on his face was plain as day. His lips pulled back halfway between a snarl and a frown. He was clearly not happy with how things turned out. Not that Daiki could blame him. He may have won, but he barely displayed anything beyond the Katen in that fight. He never even landed a hit before Sakura used up her cards and gave up. The pink-haired girl not only got the chance to strut her stuff a bit and show multiple traits from ruthlessness to pragmatism and of course intelligence in knowing when to retreat from a superior foe, but she also stopped Niji from showing off what he could do for the most part as well, dropping his promotion prospects. His pure white eyes follow Sakura right up until she was escorted out of the room by the medics to heal her hands. Just before she disappeared through the doors though, the pink-haired girl looked back, her emerald green eyes meeting with Daiki's own. The large happy smile on her face practically made her glow. And then she was gone. And it was time for the final match. All right, I suppose we don't even need to use the board now, Hei declared, looking up at all the assembled shinobi and kunoichi. The final match will be between Rock Lee and Gara, so both of you come on down. TCH. Niji turned away from the door Sakura had left through at the announcement, clicking his tongue. The Hyuga began making his way back up at the same time Gara impassively began making his way down and... Yash! Lee happily cheered bouncing on his feet and rapidly shadow boxing in place, bandages fists scything through the air like bullets. It is finally my turn. What a splendid time to be alive. I shot dash. Lee! Guy shouted cutting the leotard wearing Jenin off and grabbed the boy around the neck. Listen carefully. I have made quite an astute observation I feel I must share with you before you explode with the power of youth. Yes, Guy sensei Lee gave him his full attention. Guy nodded before looking around almost suspiciously. Your opponent, that gourd on his back, is suspicious. He not so quietly revealed. Daiki snorted as Kakashi palmed his face at his side. I mean, he's not wrong. The Tangenin laughed lightly. Guy was always a riot. In small doses. Neither Lee nor Guy seemed to notice all the dry gazes sent their way. Especially since, Guy Sensei, thank you for your wisdom. I shall keep your words in mind. Lee happily took his words. Oh, Lee. Guy swept the boy into a tight hug, tears streaming from his eyes. Guy Sensei. A hug that Lee was all too happy to return, tears budding in his eyes as well. These guys are weirdos. Naruto commented. Like you're one to talk. Daiki snorted. And the hell is that supposed to mean? The blonde turned to him with a glare. You're the one who likes turning into a hot busta female version of yourself. Daiki shrugged. Hot ha. Huh? Naruto snorted back at him. Can't be weird if it works. Daiki opened his mouth to respond. Before pausing. That was pretty sound logic to be honest. Not something he'd ever do. But the blonde wasn't wrong. No, it's still weird, dumbass. 
Sasuke scoffed. Shut the hell up, bastard. Naruto gave a sneer. You're just saying that because you know you'd never be able to match up to my sexy jutsu even if you did know it. As if, Sasuke growled, stepping forward to glare straight into the shorter, stockier blonde's eyes. I could do it far superior to you. I just won't lower myself to such stupidity. Are they seriously, basically arguing about who would be hotter as a chick? Daiki thought blandly. Mama, calm down girls, you're both pretty. Kakashi interjected with an eye smile. How did he even do that? It was kind of creepy, actually. Shut up, Kakashi-sensei. Both Uzumaki and Uchiha snapped at him together with twin glares of sapphire and onyx. Kakashi merely laughed and looked back down to his book. It was a good question to ponder, though. I wonder if a female Sasuke could actually measure up to Naruko. Daiki mused inwardly. And what would his female version even be called? Sasuko. Satsuki? Whatever the case, Sasuke would have an uphill battle. If Naruto was actually Naruko, Daiki would have been all over her. That was just how hot she was. It was almost disappointing Naruto wasn't a girl in that sense. And a weird thought to have to be honest. Thankfully one he didn't need to ponder long. Thanks to Lee leaping from the platform they were standing on to land below facing opposite Gara. Gara-san. Lee greeted the redhead Jinshiriki with a wide grin and a thumbs up. Facing you here and now makes me very happy. Gara. Arms crossed didn't even blink or utter a sound. Just staring completely impassively at the bowl cut bearing teen. There was a popping sound. But before the sound had even finished echoing outwards. Lee's hand shot out. Grasping the cork of Gara's gourd that had shot across the distance between them in almost just a blink of the eye. Calm down, kid. Hayate huffed, rolling his eyes. Wait for my call before you two start fighting. Yes. Let us not rush things, Garasan, and enjoy this battle to our heart's content. Lee nodded, eyes going serious as he dropped the cork to the ground. That's the opposite of what you should be doing here. Daiki mused, leaning over the railing and eyeing them both. This should be a good fight and I'll be able to see what Gara can do. Sasuke grinned, copying him. That guy gives me the creeps. Naruto frowned. Something just wigs me out about him. But it'll be good to see what Bushy Brows can really do. Daiki already knew how this would go. Though he admitted, it'll be good to see the gates in action. He mused. It was just too bad he hadn't completed his new seal yet and sealed Shursue's Sharingan within him. It meant he wouldn't be able to copy the usage of the gates. Though he'd still be able to see how Lee did it and perhaps puzzle it out himself couldn't be too complicated he supposed if Lee could actually do it. If nothing else, Daiki wanted to learn how to open the first gate. Actually, it was the one he was most interested in of all. Begin, A declared. As soon as the beginning of the match was declared, Lee sprung forward as a blur of speed, twisting his whole body in a single motion and lashing out with a flying spin kick. Leaf hurricane, he declared. His foot met a wall of sand that sprung up almost instantly. The sand swelled further, shaping into an almost fist-like shape and bashed Lee backwards. The force of it sent the boy rolling across the ground before he sprung up, landing in a crouch. That should have been the end right there. Daiki grimaced. If Gara had wanted to, he could have easily crushed Lee's leg right then and there. He only didn't because Gara liked to play with his food. Sand? Naruto cried in shock. Sasuke wasn't really all that better. While he didn't make a sound, his wide-eyed stare spoke volumes. He was repelled so easily. The Uchiha commented. Lee's eyes narrowed and he pushed off, speeding to the side and winding around Gara in a blur of motion that the vast majority of Genin in the huge room they currently occupied probably couldn't even follow. Lee's fist whipped out, the air parting around his hand and slammed into the wall of sand once again that swept around a block. Sand went flying and Lee lashed out with a rapid kick that sent even more spraying through the air. But it was like a bucket pail from a lake, hardly making a dent. Before the sand could swarm over his body, Lee quickly retreated, bouncing back in a set of quick hops and fell into a ready stance, eyeing Gara wearily. Gara meanwhile just continued to stare impassively, boredly even. Even bushy brows can't get through that sand with just taijutsu. Naruto grimaced. He's not fast enough to... 
Sasuke clicked his tongue. He should switch to ninjutsu for a bit. Test the waters. He can't, Daiki informed. Lee's pretty much incapable of any worthwhile ninjutsu. He has absolutely no talent for either ninjutsu or jinjutsu, so he's a pure taijutsu user. It wasn't that he had something wrong with him and was unable to use ninjutsu or jinjutsu. Lee was just terrible at them and thus gave up ever being good with them and focused only on taijutsu. Though even then, this match was still far from over. Even if Daiki was still very sure of who was going to be walking away the winner in this fight. Lee just lacks the mindset to use his abilities properly and take the win. Daiki mused. If it were him in Lee's place, he would lose the weights and open the first gate and just absolutely pound Gara's head in. No hitting him all over and wearing him down. He'd just target the same spot over and over again and crush his skull. It would not only be the best way to deal with that sand armor, but it would also pose the least risk with using the gates themselves before he could handle them. And Lee couldn't handle the upper gates as he was right now. His body wasn't strong enough to withstand them currently. Even beyond the damage Gara had done to him, the most damage had been done to Lee by himself. How boring! Gara commented for the first time and lifted his hand towards Lee. As he did, the sand around him surged out rapidly and shot towards the older Genin who quickly sprang away, jumping up to the top of the giant hand statues making the seal of reconciliation to escape the wave of sand. Lee, take them off! Guy shouted as he landed. He should have taken them off from the very beginning. Daiki scoffed inwardly. As much as he found Lee a pretty cool guy, that didn't change that his choices were stupid and he put himself at a handicap for his opponent with those weights. A massive negative black mark towards a promotion. Lee, after all, was the complete opposite of Shikamaru. While Shikamaru had the intelligence to be a chunin but lacked the strength and ability, Lee had the strength for it but not the mentality. But Gai Sensei, Lee shouted back, completely taking his eyes off of his opponent. You said I must never take them off unless defending someone or something precious. It's okay, Lee. I approve of it in this instance. Guy grinned and flashed him a thumbs up. This was stupid. He'd loved this fight before. But watching it here in person and being as he was now, it was frustrating him. He's a shinobi. Why would he never take his weights off unless for something like that? Daiki scoffed inwardly, hands gripping the railing too tightly, the metal of it warped beneath his grip. He was lucky to have never been killed from that sheer stupidity. And even as he sat down to take off his weights, completely disregarding Gara still, Daiki couldn't help but shake his head. The only reason he was even getting the chance to take them off right now was because Gara had stopped attacking and was eyeing him with curiosity. If the redhead Jinchuriki was as pragmatic as he was ruthless, he'd just keep attacking and not give Lee the chance to show off he was a freaking sitting duck right now. Watching this right now, Daiki came to a conclusion. Lee was far more stupid than Naruto ever was and it was a wonder he ever made it to Chunin. Yash, here we go. Lee stood up after a second, carrying his weights in hand, before promptly dropping them. There was a mass of widening eyes as they slammed into the ground and sent debris flying as they created a pair of huge craters from their sheer weight. Another stupid move. Daiki scoffed inwardly again. Seeing how easy he could carry them, he should have thrown them as hard as he could their sheer weight would have forced quite a bit of the sand to Gara's defense and left his back just a bit more vulnerable. What the hell? Naruto gaped. Aren't you overdoing it, guy? Kakashi mused dryly, looking over at the leotard wearing sensei. Guy merely laughed. Haha. That's the way Lee explode. He cheered. Yes, sir. Lee called out, crouching down into a runner's position. One leg pulled back, both hands placed on the ground statue and leaning forward. And then he took off, shooting towards Gara with all his strength and speed, his body accelerating like a tightly compressed spring suddenly being released from a tight hold. The first thing Daiki noticed, that it was not at all subtle or gentle. The sheer force the older leotard wearing Genin took off with, shattered the top of the statue he was standing atop and the air itself exploded with a sonic boom from his sheer speed. He crossed the distance in a split moment, getting behind Gara before the red-haired Jinchuriki could react. His sand was not so slow though. A wall of sand rose up just as Lee's fist shot forth like a bullet aiming for the back of Gara's head. 
It wasn't quite fast enough though and was too thin to stop the full speed and power behind the blow and Lee's fist went straight through it. It was just enough though to slow Lee's blow down for more sand to rise up. Seeing that, the older Jenin quickly pulled his hand free and moved in a blur, circling around Gara and launching out with a spin kick aimed at his head as the Jinchuriki turned to his back, already a step behind. Once again a thin wall of sand rose up and blocked the blow, but not enough to stop it from going through. And then Lee once again disengaged and juked around to Gara's right as the redhead whirled around to face his front. Another blazingly fast punch aiming for his cheek, which was once again softened by a thin wall of sand, forcing the bowl cut sporting Shinobi to circle around to the other side. Holy crap, he's so fast I can't even see him move, Naruto voiced in shock, blue eyes wide in disbelief. Sasuke at his side said nothing, but his eyes were just as wide, Sharingan shining brightly. Daiki crossed his arms as he watched Lee zip around Gara, probing his sand defense with powerful rapid blows, switching to another point with each blow. I'm faster, Daiki noted for one. Not by a massive amount, but he was faster than Lee was. The second thing he noticed was that Lee wasn't at all used to moving at the speeds he was currently moving at. He could see some lingering hesitation in his attacks, some almost amateurish movements here and there despite the older boy's obvious skill. He's not used to fighting without his weights, Daiki mused, which was to be expected considering the rules guy had set for him. He probably only had a little experience sparring with Guy and possibly his teammates without his weights, but nothing more than that, and his inexperience with his current unhindered abilities shone brightly to Daiki's eyes. He was so fast Gara's sand was having trouble keeping up and only barely managing to get a meager defense in place. Lee's blows were fast and heavy, each one capable of piercing through that meager defense. Yet, he never committed fully to his blows. He backpedaled every time he met resistance, coming from a different angle and trying to overwhelm the reaction time of the automatic sand defense. And while it was working, albeit slowly with the sand defense, bit by bit putting up less of a defense, he could have gotten through from the very first blow if he just committed to it. He was draining his own stamina unnecessarily and giving Gara time to adapt at the same time. Finally though, Lee having worn down the sand defense flipped and accelerated, coming around to Gara's front and spun over the thinnest shield of sand rushing to his defense yet and brought a back heel kick down atop Gara's skull. Lee's own momentum from the kick not only sent the bowl cut sporting boy skidding back out of any retaliatory range, but sent Gara skidding the opposite way as well, the redhead only kept upright by his sand. He he, Guy puffed his chest out proudly. In terms of speed, there's not a single gen in here that can keep up with Lee. All around Daiki could see people staring wide-eyed down at the boy, none more shocked than Tamari who was gripping the railing she was standing behind tightly and staring down at the spectacle below gobsmacked. There was a cracking sound that echoed audible as a fissure ran up Gara's cheek. I'm faster, Daiki announced with a shrug. Honestly, he was actually a bit disappointed this was all Lee amounted to. He could be so much more right now if he just was smart about things and trained more without his weights on to get used to his speed. What use was all that speed and strength if he couldn't even use it properly? He felt many an eye on him after his announcement, but his eyes were more focused on somebody else. Specifically the sandy blonde on the other side of the room whose wide-eyed stare shot to him at his announcement. Of course you are. Sasuke scoffed, shaking his head at his side. Lee shot forward then in a blur of motion and, for once, put his all in and committed fully. Gara's sand wasn't fast enough to amount a large enough defense to block him before the older boy's fist smashed into his face and sent him flying back. Still, that was it. Lee didn't follow through. What a punch! I couldn't see him at all. Shikamaru voiced in shock. Wait, what? He followed with a sound of confusion a second later. Gara's sand stopped him from falling, or taking any damage for that matter. The fissure on his face had opened up fully displaying skin beneath. Despite the power of Lee's punch, the sand armor had blocked it. And Gara had suffered no damage beyond that. Because despite Lee's strength, the force behind it wasn't enough to rattle the red head even through his armor. He should have followed through and just bullied him into the ground and keep attacking. Daiki shook his head. 
Not only was Lee hesitant to fully commit and inexperienced with his own abilities, he lacked the true edge to ruthless decimate his opponents. It wasn't at all a lack of ability or skill that held Lee back at all. It was his mindset. Right in this very moment, before Gara could recover, Daiki in Lee's place would have opened the first gate and just hammered him with all his strength and not give him any chance to recover. Whoa, his face broke off. The hell? Naruto exclaimed. This sand jutsu sure is versatile, a two-layered defense. Not only that shield of sand that seems to be faster than Gara's own reaction speed, but this sand armor as well. Anyone else would have been finished from a blow like that. Sasuke grunted out. They call it the ultimate defense in Suna. Daiki explained for them. Since Kankuro wasn't around right now fishing for information through Naruto and here to explain it. The sand shield is automatic. He doesn't even need to control it himself. It's akin to a bloodline and he can repair that armor of his on the fly. To punctuate his statement, sand flowed up from Gara's shield and formed over the hole in his armor and filled it up again. That's crap, Naruto shouted, squinting his eyes and pointing down at Gara. How the hell is somebody supposed to get through that then? That's pretty easy, Daiki replied with a shrug. He already had multiple avenues through it for one bullying through the simple way, or just avoiding it entirely and point-blank blasting him with his force palm jutsu and letting the shock wave travel straight through. Once again multiple eyes landed on him, but he said nothing else. Well, Sasuke arched a brow at him. Figure it out yourself, Daiki snorted. I'm not here to spoon-feed you wimps the answers. Sasuke clenched his jaw before nodding in understanding. Heh, I bet you're just talking crap and don't actually know. Naruto snorted. It seems, I must resort to more drastic measures. Lee announced, saving Daiki from having to respond to the blonde. Saving Naruto, really, from a major burn. The leotard wearing Genin reached for the bandages on his arms and unwound them. Looks like he's going for the lotus now. Daiki mused. Things were playing out exactly as he figured they would. He crossed his arms and watched. Lee shot towards Gara and circled around him making the redhead think he was going to attack from behind. But it was a feint, and the leotard wearing teen circled around again to Gara's front, launching a mule kick towards his chin that sent the redhead flying. Or so it seemed. It was actually a clone Gara made on the fly within his sand shield and switched with just before the kick connected, using his own sand armor as a cover to mask the switch. Daiki could see it all with his eyes. The primary lotus was quite powerful, the sheer force it impacted the ground with a few moments later when Lee got behind the sand clone with the shadow of the dancing leaf and wrapped it up with the bandages of his arms, left a huge multiple meter crater in the ground. Even Daiki would have trouble walking one of those off. Too bad as he knew it was a clone. And while everyone was announcing Lee's win, a familiar redhead rose up out of the sand behind him, a manic grin on his face. All that was within the impact site was an empty sand shell in the likeness of Gara. Lee's eyes widened, as did everyone else's. When did he slip out of that shell? I never even saw it. Guy exclaimed in shock. Exactly. Daiki rolled his eyes. The replacement technique Gara used was seamlessly done and hidden completely from view. Only a Dejitsu like his own or the Byakugan could have seen it happen. He doubted the Sharingan could, actually. A quick glance at Sasuke's shocked expression answered that question for him as well. He <laughs> he. Gara chuckled ominously and formed a ram seal. The surrounding sand surged in size and exploded forward like a rushing wave and slammed into Lee, who was too hurt from the primary lotus to dodge. The sand carried him across the arena and slammed him into and through the wall. The only reason he didn't end up in another room entirely was because of how huge the wall itself was. But even then, when the sand was pulled back a bit by Gara, a huge crater had formed in the wall with Lee in the middle. He was bloody and bruised, his leotard ripped and stained with blood, on his knees arms crossed in a feeble block. But he would be dead if Gara actually wanted him to die right then and there. Gara still wasn't taking him seriously. Why didn't he dodge? He's way faster than that sand. Naruto asked loudly, confused. The primary lotus, that technique he just used is a double-edged sword without the right conditioning. Daiki responded before Guy or Kakashi could. After using it his body isn't in any shape to move like before. Indeed. Kakashi nodded and gave Daiki a shrewd glance. Your knowledge is something else, kid. Daiki shrugged. 
Guy is pretty famous, and I put thought into learning the strong fist myself once. He replied. The feather fist suits me more though. Hmm. I wonder about that. Kakashi hummed, but said nothing else. Cut your cryptic crap, you morons. Naruto scoffed. More importantly, doesn't what you said mean bushy brows can't win? He could have won already if he wasn't being stupid. Daiki rolled his eyes and glanced over towards the bowl cut bearing Jonin looking down upon the match proudly. Gezensei, tell him to give up. He called over. As much as he would like to see the eight gates in action and learn from it. It wasn't worth Lee damaging his spine and putting his life in jeopardy over a freaking Chunin exams that happened every six months. Especially since going through with what he would, wouldn't get him promoted anyway and would be a demerit against his promotion. Worried are you, Daiki Kuen? Guy looked over and must have confused quite a few people when he grinned. There's no need to worry my young friend, for the Lotus of Kanoha be dash. Blooms twice, I know. Daiki cut him off. Going that far for a single match in the Chunin exams is stupid though. There's no point in doing this, he already could have won if he was smart about things, Instead, he doesn't know how to handle his own abilities because he hasn't fought enough without his weights off and he's too hesitant and kind to leverage his strength properly. Your concern for Lee is Admirable Daiki Kuen. Guy smiled at him. But you need not worry, Lee is strong. Just from that single statement, Daiki knew he wouldn't budge. He wasn't caring about logic, it was all illogical sappy emotion. Daiki was surprised how angry he found himself becoming his teeth involuntarily grinding together. Guy, don't tell me you taught him how to open the gates? Kakashi gaped at his fellow Jonin sensei, and when Guy merely smiled wider, Kakashi huffed. I'm disappointed in you, Guy. Guy scoffed. You don't know the first thing about that child Kakashi, so you don't understand. He shook his head and replied, Lee needed this. He doesn't need to use it here. Daiki bit out with a growl before looking down at Lee himself. Lee, give up. You've wasted your chances. Going any further will just destroy you. Lee looked up at the sound of Daiki's voice and gave him a tired grin. I cannot do that Daiki Kuen my friend. He called back. Here and now. I will show that even one such as I who cannot use ninjutsu or jinjutsu can become a splendid ninja. You've already did that. You're one of the strongest guys here. Daiki snapped. You could have won already if you were smart about things and started without your weights or just hammered him properly without chickening out. Going any further won't prove anything and just show you're not Chunin material. Lee bowed his head for but a moment at Daiki's words before rising back up and facing Gara. Resolute. I'm sorry Daiki Kuen, but this is something I must do. He shut his logic down fully with a single statement. Your concern is appreciated Daiki Kuen, but one born as talented as you, Cannot understand Lee, Guy smiled proudly. That boy has a dream he believes in so profoundly and is chasing it so passionately that he is willing to die for the sake of out. There was no reasoning with these people. Daiki gaped at them both, at a loss for words, his mouth opening and closing, looking for and failing to find the words to reply. This was so stupid. It was admirable to chase his dream so passionately but risking it all over a damn Chunin exams that happened every six months? Just to beat one person in a fight? A fight that wouldn't get him promoted anyway? Don't do this, Lee. Daiki almost pleaded. Why was he so invested in this? He knew how it would go. He couldn't wrap around his own concerns or their own lack of logic. I must. Lee spread his arms wide and Daiki saw as the chakra within his body began to rush towards certain points flowing in an almost erratic manner, before rushing up through a certain point located near his brain. Gate of opening, release! Pathetic! Daiki spat and before he even knew what he was doing, he was storming away. He got odd glances from quite a few. Hinata reached out to him as he passed by her, but hesitated and let him go by without a word. He left the room behind amidst Lee's shouts as he released one gate after another. He couldn't bear to stand by and watch when such idiocy was taking place. Quite simply, Daiki had to leave the room before he did something stupid and intervened on Lee's behalf himself. That was not his place. Even as thunderous booms echoed from the arena out into the hallway and reverberated through the very tower itself, Daiki refused to even look. With his jaw clenched, he ignored everything utterly. Damn idiot! 
Winning one fight isn't worth your life. Do others people's worrying about you mean freaking nothing? Daiki raged internally, fists clenched. It took all he had not to just start punching craters in the walls in sheer frustration. He wanted to go back in there and kick Lee's ass, and then Gara's while he was at it. Maybe challenge Guy as well and try and beat his butt for being so damn stupidly sentimental and not taking his job seriously. The thunderous impacts didn't last long, less than a minute, and gave Daiki enough peace and quiet for a minute or so to take a damn chill pill and calm himself, which would have worked if the doors at his side didn't blast open and a pair of medic Neen carrying a familiar unconscious leotard wearing boy out in a rush, Guy hurrying along behind them. Hang on Lee! The man shouted. He paused as he caught sight of Daiki though, while the medic Neen continued on, carrying Lee away. Daiki Kuen, Guy gave a visible grimace. Was it worth it? Daiki couldn't help but taunt the man. He didn't answer and looked away. Daiki found himself sneering on instinct. He turned his nose up at the man and walked away, heading back into the arena. I used to think he was the best sensei before. He thought, now not so much. At least personally now, he knew not what to do. Between Guy and Kakashi, Daiki figured he had a full-on example of what not to do as a sensei and perhaps even a parental figure. There was a stunned silence that greeted Daiki when he made his way back into the large room the prelims were taking place in. The bottom floor, which before the final fight had taken little damage was riddled with craters, spider web cracks and piles of debris. Many a paled, shock-filled face met his gaze when his eyes swept over the room. Specifically the likes of Ino and Shikamaru who were amongst the weakest gathered within the room couldn't hide the disturbed looks they had at all. Such was their shock at the fight they just witnessed. Daiki's eyes roved over to the other side of the room. Specifically, upon the two remaining San siblings within the wide-spaced room. Despite the damage done to her clothing and such that had came from her fight with Ten Ten, there was a wide, smug smirk on Tamari's face, her arms crossed. While at her side stood Gara, his clothing torn and frayed, yet not a single bruise upon him and impassive look upon his face. Teal eyes met Daiki's own, sensing his gaze upon him and Gara stared back at Daiki, examining him. Daiki couldn't hold back the scoff that erupted from his throat, frustration bubbling inside him. All that big talk about your dreams and using a forbidden jutsu that you couldn't even handle and for what? To ruffle his clothes a bit. He thought derisively of Lee's efforts. Lee's courage was vastly overshadowed by his own stupidity. If he was deserving of anything at all, it was not a Chunin vest, but rather, a Darwin award. The fool had his whole life ahead of him to accomplish his dream, and he threw it all away for a completely meaningless fight. Of course, the silence didn't last for long. This is crap. Naruto complained. Loudly. Daiki rolled his eyes as he looked away from Gara to the blonde. To see him with his arms crossed. Blue eyes narrowed into a glare and a snarl on his lips. They're supposed to be medic ninja, right? How can they not help him? The blonde kicked the railing, the pole his foot connected with bending. Bushy brows was so desperate, he kept saying how much he wanted to fight Sasuke and that Niji guy. Cause they're not miracle workers, dumbass. Daiki scoffed loudly, drawing eyes to him. He honestly didn't care right now. Naruto had made himself a convenient target to unleash a bit of his frustration on. You're back. Naruto noted in surprise, before shaking his head and growling. And what's that supposed to mean? I've seen those guys heal broken bones pretty easily before. They should be able to heal what that sand jerk did to him. Moron. Daiki crossed his arms. It isn't what raccoon boy did to him that's the problem. It's what he did to himself. The gates are called a forbidden jutsu for a reason, because of the toll it takes on the body to use them. Lee was just too weak. End of story. The hell do you say? Naruto snarled indignantly, uncrossing his arms and tensing his shoulders in Daiki's direction. Did you see how Bushy Brows fought? There ain't nothing weak about that guy. Besides, what would you know? You stormed off before the fight was even finished just cause Bushy Brows wouldn't listen to you. And look where he ended up. Daiki shot back. If he listened to me, he wouldn't be a cripple for life. And for what? to soothe his ego and claim he can fight against the strong? If the moron bid his time until he could handle the gates better, that would never be a problem. 
but he traded everything for a single meaningless fight against an utter weakling. W weakling. Naruto gaped at him, and he was not the only one. Daiki didn't bother looking to see who else was shocked by it, but the way Sasuke's eyes widened briefly and how Kakashi furrowed his brows was telling enough. You heard me? Daiki rolled his eyes. Gara ain't crap. None of you are. I could beat every single genin in this room with one arm tied behind my back. The fact Lee would waste his life to try and one-up another weakling just shows how pathetic he is. And the best of it is, he crippled himself with his own jutsu. Gara literally could have just huddled up inside his sand and let Lee kill himself and show how inept he really is. Laying it on a little thick, aren't you? Isobu Muset. Yet, his bijou partner did not claim he was wrong. Because he wasn't. It was pathetic. There was nothing noble or heroic or even worth admiring about what Lee did. It was just a pathetic waste of potential. This had been building up for a while, to be honest, since the prelims began. From everyone's stupidity about how the Chunin exams worked and what being a ninja meant, to the sheer stupidity of nonsense dreams pushing these morons to even stupider heights. You want to be Hokage? Then learn what being a Hokage actually damn meant. You want to become a strong ninja with only Taijutsu? That was fine, but don't throw everything away for one single fight that meant nothing. Like, what the hell would beating a single genin, jinchuriki or not mean in the grand scheme of things in the prelims with a limited viewing capacity? It proved nothing. It's not even as if I can heal him either. Daiki grit his teeth in frustration. He'd got a good look at the boy as he wheeled past on the stretcher. Not only were his muscles torn all across his body, not only were his arm and leg bones completely shattered, but he had damn shards of bone lodged into his spine. There was a difference between healing someone and surgery, and he'd need a damn miracle surgery to get this bone fragments out. At best, Daiki would be able to keep the moron alive during such an operation, but even then, considering how long such a surgery would take with how delicate it would be, it would take up quite a lot of life force to do so. Daiki had neither the skill, nor the life force available to help Lee. There was multiple spikes of killing intent directed at him for his words. And not just from the sand siblings and their sensei. Though, none even came close to the roiling wrath directed at him by Redhead on the other side of the room. Blood was pumping in Daiki's ears and his lips pulled back into a snarl as he turned around and glared murder at the Redhead trying to smother him with his intent to murder him. You better rein yourself in right now you damn clown he snarled, his own killing intent rising to the surface. I'm not in the mood to play with you right now, so sit down, shut your butt up, or I'm gonna come over there and pulp your skull between my palms. It would be so easy, too. That sand armor wouldn't do crap to block his force palm jutsu. He'd just use his heavenly star seal and draw on the first stage of Isabu's chakra, blitz straight through his hand, clap both hands over the idiot's ears and unleash a pair of force palm jutsu and pulp his brain from both ends. Calm down, Daiki. Your frustration and temper are getting the better of you. They aren't worth getting worked up over and ruining your plans. Isabu cautioned gently. Daiki took a deep, shuddering breath at his companion's words. He was right, but it was oh so hard with how childish and naive these people, his friends even, were. Which is why it annoys you so much. Because their lives aren't something easily replaceable. Isobo replied lightly. Ah, uh, enough. The Sandame's voice was calm and level, yet somehow seemed to echo with a thunderous ruling force. The killing intent spread throughout the room sputtered and died instantly in the face of the authority inherent through his voice. Naruto scowled at Daiki one last time, but didn't speak up. Even he knew better than to really go against the Hokage's command. The arguments were put to an end, and before long, all of them were directed down to stand in a line in front of the Hokage. And by all of them, he meant all nine of them that had passed the preliminaries. Daiki himself alongside Naruto, Sasuke, Shikamaru, Hinata, Niji, Tamari, Gara, and Stretchy Guy, Kabuto's teammate. Daiki honestly couldn't remember his name, nor did he care. He was a traitor anyway. Daiki eyed him speculatively out of the corner of his eye. I should take care of him in advance, he mused. It would make the third round of the exam move smoother and he could rip some information out of the man's head. Like the location of some of Orochimaru's bases. And perhaps how his jutsu was used. Daiki for the life of him couldn't remember how his jutsu worked. 
Does it make his body rubber or something? He wondered. If it did, then it might be worth stealing for himself. If not, it could at least be useful for if he ever got tied up or something. Sarutobi went on to explain how now that the prelims were finished, the next part of the exam, the third and final round would be another series of one versus one fights that would take place a month from now. As expected, quite a few didn't understand why Naruto as expected among them. And the old man had to once again go over the fact that the Chunin exams were in fact just a glorified member measuring contest, and they had to give some time for people of power from around the elemental countries to make their way to Kanoha to watch. Honestly, it's constantly in one ear and out the other with these people. Daiki rolled his eyes. Even Shikamaru for all his vaunted intelligence was just the same in that regard. Once again, the Nara clan heir was a prime example of why intelligence did not mean wisdom, nor did it mean common sense either for that matter. Finally though, things came to a close and everything was dismissed. As Daiki was about to leave and head home to plot his next move though, the Hokage caught his eye and gave a single slight jerk of his chin for him to follow, before disappearing out of sight with a body flicker. Daiki sighed, but did his bid. He left the room behind with a body flicker of his own before anybody could talk to him or in Naruto's case, continue their argument from before. He followed the Sandame straight to the top of tower. It was a simple small sitting room with two couches and a table in between them. When he arrived mere seconds after leaving the arena behind, it was to find the Sandame already waiting for him, sitting placidly on one couch. Ah, Daiki-kun! Sarutobi smiled at warmly and gestured at the opposite couch. Have a seat. Sure. Daiki shrugged, doing as said and collapsing into the couch. He didn't even bother sitting on it. He just lay straight across it and propped his head up on one arm. So what's up? He asked, though he already had a feeling he knew what would be getting brought up here. We can get to that in a bit. Haruzan's warm smile didn't even twitch at his utter disregard of propriety. In fact, his eyes twinkled with amusement. How are you feeling? That was quite the outburst you had. He didn't need to specify. It was obvious he was talking about how pissed off and frustrated Daiki was about Rock Lee. Lee pissed me off with his utter stupidity. Daiki shrugged. Guy should have had the common sense to stop him and not encourage him. Now, unless Tsunade comes back, he'll be crippled for life and call it him being petty. But right now... Daiki didn't feel up to trying to fix the idiot. Hmm. You seem so sure of that. Haruzan mused. Daiki shrugged again. I saw his injuries with my eyes. He replied. Even beyond what Gara did to him. It's what the gates did to him that's the real problem. He's got shards of bone stuck in his spine. Our medic ninja are pretty good. But like I said, they're not miracle workers and they're not Tsunade either. Hmm. I see. Haruzan's brows furrowed. That is a disappointing thing to learn, and there is no way Tsunade will help the boy. Not only will she not come back, but beyond even that she, he trailed off. She's afraid of blood, so even if she did come back, her skills as a medic are utterly useless. Daiki finished for him, unless Naruto went and talk no jutsued her bodacious blonde but into coming back and getting over her fear of blood. Lee was in trouble without Daiki himself going out of his way. Hiruzen's eyebrows rose at his words, but nodded, quite. He agreed. A period of silence filled the air between Hokage and subordinate for a few moments. Hiruzen seemed to be quite at ease with it, but after a minute of the man saying nothing else after the discussion about Lee and Tsunade, Daiki found himself shifting slightly. He wished the old man would stop beating around the bush and get to the point of why he called Daiki here after the end of the prelims. Patience is a virtue you know. The old man commented finally after another minute when he stared to drum his fingers on his thigh, voice casual idle. Daiki rolled his eyes. I'm a shinobi, not exactly a very virtuous person, he replied. He stole, tortured, and murdered as a profession. And he was pretty damn good at it if he did say so himself. Perhaps, though taking a few moments to enjoy some peace and quiet every now and then won't kill you my boy, the old man shrugged lightly. Still, I suppose we're both going to be quite busy this month, so I best get down to business. To defeat the Huns? Daiki prodded, rolling his eyes and crossing his arms. Quite. The Hokage nodded, agreeing with him and not at all questioning the reference. First, let us talk of you training. Finally, some good crap. 
Daiki uncrossed his arms and leaned forward eagerly, the old man having gained his full attention. I see that caught your attention, Sarutobi chortled a bit. Well, first things first, I know you no doubt have quite a few things you want to work on yourself already. How long will you need to complete everything you have on your plate already? That gave Daiki a bit of a pause. The old man wasn't wrong. His clones were constantly hard at work and the list of techniques he'd pilfered shortened by the hour. As it was though, he had over 10 techniques still to learn and that wasn't taking into account training the wind element or earth element. Not to mention completing the seal to add Shursue's eyes to his own nor completing the lightning release. Chakra mode. But taking those last two out of the running and... A week, maybe two at the very most. Daiki replied. As it was, he thought two was a bit of a stretch. Unlike Naruto, he didn't have a bijou constantly trying to take control of his body and slowing his training down. Also unlike Naruto, he already knew all he needed to, to train both the wind and earth elements. Sure, the wind was thanks to Naruto's future self's example which he mostly had to puzzle out on just vague advice from Kakashi and a bit from Asuma, but eh, that didn't impact Daiki. He figured he could train both elements to the limits he knew of in just a few days, two maybe three apiece and then get the elemental jutsu down with his clones within a day. Really, the one he figured was going to take the longest singular jutsu-wise was the mysterious peacock method. Then again, I've got some things to take care of as well. He mused, which could slow him down. A tad depending on his mood. At his explanation, the Hokage stroked his chin in thought for a moment before nodding. I see, he mused. You have eight days. Daiki blinked. What? His befuddlement must have shown on his face because the old man chuckled. Do you think that's unfair of me to demand of you? He asked the boy. Daiki stared at him for a moment, before shrugging. Not really, he replied. He was a bit confused, but he thought it was accomplishable. Good, if you did I was going to cut it down to six days. Sarutobi's smile spread into a grin. Sadly, as much as I'd love to take my time teaching you, we're going to have to make it a bit of a rush job. My old student has made it so that I'm going to be very busy so the time I can set aside for your training is limited. Not only had that bastard made such a big fuss and made it so he'd have to rush everything due to his little hissy fit biatch fest invasion plan. Now he was even messing with his gains? I should have just bid you dom at him and damned the consequences. Daiki growled inwardly. You know, blowing everything that annoys you to kingdom come isn't actually an answer to all the problems that ail you. Isabu commented dryly. Clearly you just weren't using enough explosions then. Daiki snorted. The only time a Bijidama wouldn't work was if a bigger Bijidama blocked it or stupid hacks like the Kamui. There was a limit to how much chakra even the likes of the Predapath of the Rinnegan could absorb at once. Hell, if someone did try to absorb a Bijidama, unless the drain rate was monstrously fast, then the Bijidama would just explode and render the attempt moot and the user erased from existence. God he wanted to fire a Bijidama at a proper target so badly. Isabu sighed. Though, putting that thought aside and thinking back to Petamaru. Did you find out anything useful from that kin girl? Daiki asked, a bit hopeful. If she knew of the invasion coming up then. Not much I'm afraid, much of what she knew we already did. Sarutobi replied, dashing his hopes immediately. The most we have uncovered is that the Sound Village isn't actually any normal village and is in fact a series of bases set up all over the elemental countries by Orochimaru and that he has his own elite guard known as the Sound for each apparently having the curse seal to empower themselves with. Sigh. There was a limit to how useless people could be. The real problem beyond that is going by your meeting with him at the bottom of the tower alongside Kakashi. My wayward student is prowling around the village. The old man's smile faded away into a frown. I have no idea what he's up to now, so when I'm not training you, I'll be spending most of my time on vigil for him, though I don't expect him to make a move for a while yet. Daiki clicked his tongue in frustration. He was regretting it now. At least a bit. Not using the excuse of gaining knowledge from the curse seal and Orochimaru's soul fragment to let the old man know of the invasion. But, he hadn't changed enough for Orochimaru to alter his plans much. In fact, Going by Orochimaru's attitude, the man didn't feel threatened by him at all beyond needing someone to handle him during the invasion, and he seemed to be leaning towards Kimamaro for that role. Nobody Daiki couldn't handle. He'd be tough as all hell to put down, but Daiki didn't feel too threatened. He'd prefer if it were Kabuto honestly, 
he would be even easier to deal with. The biggest problem to deal with would be Gurin if she got called in. But Daiki doubted it. Come the end of the Kanoha crush, he wouldn't be able to have a handle on things at all, so he wanted at least to use that to his advantage before it came to the real movers and shakers. Orochimaru, for all his abilities and genius, wasn't a true big fish currently, he was just hard to kill, like a cockroach. Without a body able to handle Senjutsu, he'd never become as big a threat as Ibido, Nagato, and the like. Granted, Daiki wasn't a big fish himself currently without Isabu's help. But still, still, it was regrettable he couldn't have things entirely his way. But then, he was pretty much used to that at this point. Everything he had now was due to his own plans, back-breaking effort and his own guts to see his desires through. Sure, he had the memories of his other life that were truly the biggest help of all. But without the guts and will to go through everything he had, they would have been useless to him. Thankfully, Ivor called Jiraiya and he should arrive by tomorrow morning. Sarutobi broke him from his thoughts. Orochimaru might be able to hide from my scrying through the barrier over the village thanks to his intimate knowledge of the village. But with Jiraiya around he won't risk sticking around and the possibility of a confrontation with us both. Daiki blinked. Wait, is that how your crystal ball thing works? He asked. He remembered there was actually a little debate among the fans about how the man's spino jutsu with that thing worked. My scrying jutsu? The old man asked and Daiki nodded. Yes actually. My crystal ball is linked to the barrier formed by the barrier core over the village, and with it I can more or less look over any part of the village. Well wasn't that interesting? Not that I actually need it considering I can see anything in a 10 mile radius if I want, but still pretty cool. He thought. He wondered idly who came up with the idea for it. Now moving on. Sarutobi waved his hand and sat up fully and stared into Daiki's eyes seriously. And it was quite a testament to the old man that he hadn't been serious at all when discussing Orochimaru. Beyond Orochimaru and our upcoming training, I have something I wish to discuss with you. Something more serious than Orochimaru? Instinctively, Daiki found himself straightening up out of his slouched position as well and giving the older man his undivided attention. Madara Achiha. The Hokage said simply, and involuntarily, Daiki found his senses sharpening and his breath freezing in his chest. Or, at the very least, the man claiming to be Madara Uchiha, Sarutobi continued. I have not been idle since you let me know of this man. Doubtless you already know. But before Naruto, there was another Jinchuriki of the Kyubi in the village. Years ago, someone interrupted a specific ceremony and released the Kyubi from her seal and summoned it into the middle of the village. The older man let that revelation hang in the air for a few moments, staring at Daiki, gauging him for a reaction most likely. Daiki shrugged. Obviously, he replied. I looked into the QB quite thoroughly for reasons I'm sure you understand, and there were no historic sightings of it attacking anyone or anything since the battle between the Shodame and Madara Uchiha. And considering Hashirama Senju won that battle, it's obvious he had the QB sealed after it. The funny thing was, he wasn't lying at all here, just omitting some of the truth. Anyone with half a brain and knowledge of the Bijou and Jinchuriki would come to this conclusion. And it was obvious if the QB just randomly appeared in the middle of the village, then it must have either been summoned or broken free of its prison. Good. It means I won't have to go into too much explanation on the how or why. Sarutobi's lips quirked up into a small smile before it was replaced once again by a frown. Simply, I'm going to put this out here. That night, this man claiming to be Madara Uchiha, not only got into the village and killed many of our skilled shinobi, and extracted a bijou without anyone able to stop him, he was also capable of holding back the Yandame Hokage, the events of that night leading to his death. Daiki said nothing outwardly, though inwardly he couldn't help but roll his eyes at how pathetic Abito was, literally causing the death of a man who was like a father to him, his wife who was always looking out for him and then trying to kill their newly born child, just because his crush that never returned any of his feelings died on a mission as a kunoichi. Honestly, he was like a stupid, pathetic, mentally weak child that couldn't accept the reality of the world. People lived and people died. Honestly, he was just throwing the world's biggest tantrum, really. I will be blunt. I am not as strong as I once was. Age has taken its toll, Sarutobi admitted. I don't believe I have the strength necessary nowadays to defeat someone capable of what this fake has done. 
As much as Daiki would like for that to be wrong, he knew it wasn't. Abito was capable of fighting not just QB mode Naruto, but him with Kakashi and Guy backing him up. Daiki knew the weakness of Kamui, but even with that he wasn't confident in their ability to defeat Abito currently. Whiny man-child he might have been, but Uchiha seemed to get stronger the more they cried about how unfair the world was and blah blah melodrama blah blah. With your potential, you very well may surpass Minato and myself given enough time. But time is something we do not have, the old man sighed. We do not know where this man is, we do not know when he will strike. Only that he has his eyes on the Bijou and Naruto isn't a well-kept secret I'm afraid thanks to my dear old idiotic friend Danzo. Well, you're not wrong. Daiki found it in himself to smirk. I'm kind of the crap. Give me three years and I'll be way stronger than you or the Yandame. Maybe. Honestly, he was sure he could reach that level at least. But Madara and Hashirama's level? That was where the doubt festered. Madara was a monster capable of beating down Bijou mode Naruto, the eight other Bijou, Gara, and Sasuke at the same time. Without his eyes, that guy was a freaking monster, and Daiki was terrified of fighting him. Even with Bijou mode with an amped up Isabu, even with the Sage mode, even with the Sage transformation, even with Shursue's Manjikyu, he didn't think he'd be even close to Madara Uchiha's strength without his eyes, never mind with his Rinnegan or God forbid Six Paths Madara. Quite frankly, if Madara wasn't betrayed and ganked by Kagaya, then he highly doubted Naruto and Sasuke could have beaten him. In fact, if Six Paths Madara fought Kagaya, he was sure Madara would have stomped her but silly and made her his biatch. Well, we'll see in time I'm sure, should we have it? Sarutobi rolled his eyes in amusement. Still, the reason I bring all this up is to make sure we have that time. Daiki raised an eyebrow. And how will you do that? He asked. Unless you've got a hyperbolic time chamber hidden in the Hokage Mountain or something? Sarutobi gave him a queer look, but didn't comment at all on his quip. While quality is always appreciated, quantity has a quality in of itself and there is strength in numbers, he stated. What we need are allies, powerful allies, especially with how strained our relations are with Suna. We barely avoided war after the Kyuubi attack when we were weakened with the loss of Minato and many of our shinobi. The only reason we did was thanks to Minato himself doing a number on stone and cloud and the sudden loss of the third rakage. Allies are good. Daiki nodded and said nothing more. After all, it was a given they'd never be allied with stone or cloud. Quite. Sarutobi grinned lightly. Cloud are constantly gathering more strength and Stone will look for any chance to undermine us. Our alliance with Sand is shaky at best, which leaves only one. Say what? You can't be serious. Daiki gave the older man a deadpan look. Oh, but I am. Sarutobi's grin widened a bit. How though? He asked, gaping at the man and utterly lost. I've kind of got one of their bijou stuck in my gut and prancing around like a peacock with a set of their most treasured weapons. So you're aware that you prance around that a peacock, interesting. Sarutobi stroked his chin and mused. He was messing with him, wasn't he? How the hell would we even manage that? Daiki goggled at the man. Last he checked, most shinobi villages weren't exactly happy to part with a bijou and legendary set of chakra weapons. Not to say he was against it. He would happily team up with the foxy babe that was Mei Terumi. He just didn't see how it would be possible without handing over his swords and evicting his buddy and then dying in the process. Ah, I think you're misunderstanding something. Sarutobi's eyes were positively gleaming now as he corrected Daiki. Not we, but rather you. The hell do you put in that pipe you're always toting around, old man? That must be some good crap. Daiki gave him a dry look. I get it imported from Kusa, actually, Sarutobi replied without missing a beat. To be exact though, I'm being fully serious here. Think of it as a test. Making an alliance with a village that will be raging mad at me in particular because of their crap that I've yoinked is a test? Daiki was not following the logic. Honestly, he was about ready to try and dispel whatever funky Jinjutsu he was in. Had he already lost and was in the infinite Tsukiyomi? Well, that sucked. Indeed, Sarutobi's grin was practically reaching crap-eating proportions now. There is no doubt of your strength for the Hokage position, but others are still in question. I would like to see how you approach a situation like this. Thus, 
I will assign you this S-rank mission to meet with the Mizukage and gain an alliance with the village hidden in the mist. Daiki just stared blankly at the man. That was near impossible to be honest. It would be one thing if it was something approached in the original timeline but here and now. When he had the Kiba Blades and Isabu, they weren't going to be happy at all. Of course, this is not a mandatory mission. Saratobi spoke up breaking him from his thoughts before he spiraled into them. You can choose if you want to partake in it or not. He could choose? What do I do here? He bit his lip. The most logical thing to do would be to turn it down. Everything was against him here. What could he even do to convince them? They were actually loyal to Yagura initially and knew of the Jinjutsu. It's how he died if I remember right after it got dispelled. They might be grateful for confirmation and a common enemy might get some begrudging acceptance. Begrudging wasn't a good standing point for allies though. It was shaky and liable to end in betrayal. Granted, there was Kubikurbocho, Zabuza's blade. He knew where it was and could return it to them as a gift as well. And he did know where a few others were, or at least who had them. But that still didn't seem like a lot. Granted, using my story about Raiga trying to use Isabu could work in my favor, as well since he was a traitor to their village and make it look like me becoming a Jinchuriki was a necessity. His mind whirled in circles. All the while the Hokage and his new sensei just watched him in amusement. Who knew the old man was such a prick? Damn Hokage crap. He knew it would F him over, he just didn't realize how soon it would do so. In the end, there really was only one option for Daiki to choose. He accepted the mission. A half an hour later, he found himself walking through the streets of Kanoha on his way back home. He could have made it back within less than a minute if he wanted. But he was in no rush at the moment, and his thoughts were heavy. Maybe accepting it was the wrong choice? He mused, stroking his chin in thought as he absently walked down the street. Anyone in his way giving him a wide berth instead of getting in his way. He didn't make room for other people, they did it for him. Still, could have accepting the mission been the wrong choice and the true basis of the test. Perhaps the old man testing or not if he had the maturity to not choose something beyond him. Neither could have been the right or wrong choice even. He mused. In the end, all that really mattered was results. If he actually made something of his choice, then it clearly wasn't the wrong answer. Daiki sighed, rubbing his forehead. Tricky crap like this are a pain in the ass. I'd much rather just fight head on instead of subterfuge. He huffed. If it helps, I think you made the right choice. Isabu consoled him. While it isn't exactly playing it safe and comes with risks, the rewards outweigh them and on top of that accomplishing this will go in your favor as far as merit goes. Besides, you will be the one negotiating from the point of strength and with the advantage and have much to offer them. Not only can you use your made-up story about Raiga to your advantage and return the Kubo Kirabocho, you also know where the remaining Lost Blades are and Kiri itself also has something of your village as well that isn't any lesser than the Kiba Blades. Daiki paused. That was right. He did know where the remaining Blades of the Seven Swordsmen were. Kiri still had one, Kisame had one, Daiki had one and would return another, and he knew exactly where the other three were. Orochimaru had them, so it would be in their best interest to ally with Kanoha if they wanted to see them again. On top of that, Ao had the Byakugan. While personally Daiki felt the Kiba Blades were far more useful than the Byakugan, and it especially didn't even come close to Isabu, the Byakugan was still highly regarded as one of the two best Jujitsu in the world currently and Kiri had stolen one. Hmm, I can work with this. He grinned. He nodded to himself and picked up his pace, walking a bit faster towards his home, his worries easing up a bit. Things were so much easier when you realized you were the one in the position of strength. Though one thing was still fishy. You'll depart 15 days from now. That was what old man Sarutobi had said to him. It was matter of fact, no room for debate and full of assurance that Kiri wouldn't at all knock them back. Which told him either the old man had some dirt on them to make them comply, or he'd already been in correspondence with Kiri. And considering they were looking to be allies and knowing the old man, Daiki was leaning towards it being the second of those two options. So I have a week of training myself and then I'll be spending eight days training with the old man before heading to Kiri. Daiki mused. Going by the distance, he could be in Kiri within three days, one day of on-foot travel and two for a boat ride, though if he pushed it he could be there even earlier. Actually, he could probably get there within a day and a half if he just water-walked and ran across the ocean to Kiri. 
If he did that, he could be back in Kanoha within a week if the negotiations went well and get right back into the grind and have another good eight days or so time before the third round of the exams. No time to waste then, Daiki nodded to himself, before abandoning his leisurely pace and disappearing in a blur of speed with the Shunshin. When he arrived at his home, Daiki was surprised to find someone already waiting for him. He half expected Anko to have tracked him down already, but it wasn't her. Instead, it was his cute little white-eyed apprentice who was leaning against the wall around the outside his compound beside the entrance and waiting. What's up, firecracker? Daiki greeted her with a grin as he landed. Her white pupil lacking eyes somehow lit up. Don't ask him how, he couldn't explain it if he tried. But they surely did. As expected of his cute little apprentice. Aniki. Hanabi greeted him with a nod. A small smile appearing on her face that she quickly smothered a moment later. Not fast enough to hide from his truly glorious eyes though. He ruffled her hair, getting a pout from her. That was quickly hidden as well, before he opened the gate to his home. Come on in. He waved at her off his shoulder, gesturing for her to follow him. He led her inside and sat down on one of the benches inside the outer garden, and gestured for her to take a seat beside him. So what brings you here? He asked her. You told me to come find you after you returned from the Chunin exams. She replied succinctly, sitting down beside him. He did do that, didn't he? though he wasn't exactly expecting her to turn up literally within an hour of the exam ending. Well, he could respect the hustle. I did, didn't I? He nodded. Though if you've come this fast, I expect you've made some progress then? Yes, Hanabi replied simply. I am now capable of summoning the giant tiger to my side, though it uses up almost all of my chakra to do so. Good on you, Daiki laughed, actually quite delighted by the news and pat her on the head. Sure, the tiger wasn't all that strong prior to the summoning contract, only about as useful in combat as a standard chunin and the chakra amount would reflect on the strength and power of the beast, but considering Hanabi was eleven and still had a year or two before she graduated, it was a pretty good feat he could easily make this girl as strong as a jonin at this rate by time she graduated. Especially since summoning was such a highly chakra-intensive jutsu, and using it over and over again with her summon to deplete her chakra quickly would make her chakra capacity grow all the quicker. Hanabi, despite the cold front she tried to put up, was unable to hide the small pleased smile that spread across her lips at his praise and ducked her down down a bit to look at the ground and hide her face from him. He chuckled, mood easing up. He'd been in a pretty bad mood up until now, he wasn't gonna lie. Not only from Lee and Guy's stupidity and his new pain in the butt mission, but also because he'd learned from Old Man Third that the rock humper prick that murdered him before had left the village already once he found out his team had failed to pass. He hadn't bothered sticking around. He'd been tempted to chase the man down. But thankfully his apprentice was here to cheer him up. So, how are you getting along with the tiger? He asked. Actually, have you named her yet? She attacked me the first time I succeeded in summoning her, Hanabi admitted. Though father was overseeing my attempts at the time and so easily rebuffed her, since then I have managed to get her to at least listen to me, me, and no, I have not named her. Hmm, kind of expected since it was me who kicked her but, and not you the first time and her strength will be growing already. Daiki mused with a nod. Still, you're on the right track, the best way to make friends is to kick their asses and show them kindness after that. Establish both your dominance and your compassion towards them in the same breadth. It also works on attracting women. Everyone was attracted to power. They feared and coveted it. It was just a basic instinct that all living beings shared. Their very first instinct after all, humans included, was survival and the more power one had, the easier it was for them to survive. And if one could not obtain such power, the best option beyond that was to attach themselves to someone who did have that power and women had an advantage on that front if the one with power was a manly man such as himself. Sure, there was a lot more factors to things like that and it was generally those of lower character that resorted to things like that, those that lacked sufficient courage and willpower, but he wasn't one to overlook an advantage like that. If women wanted to throw themselves at him because of his strength, he would happily accept them. If they were hot, and for a time before he kicked them to the curb because few of them would be worth keeping. Why would I want to attract women? Hanabi peeked up over his hand to give him an odd look. I'm a girl she pointed out. I don't judge, he shrugged, which was a lie. He judged people quite often without shame. 
but he had to be a positive role model for his cute little apprentice. Hanabi's odd look did not fade, but she said nothing and just sighed before changing the topic. So what should I do now? She asked. Ah, uh, training, the grind, the most holy of all topics. Keep up your summoning of the tiger, try and do it every day and exhaust most of your chakra as possible each day and name her. Establish a good relationship between you both, he replied. Beyond that, you don't need my help with taijutsu since you train with your father on that side of things. Though, on that note, do you know your elemental affinity? He asked. I do, Hanabi nodded. Father had me tested for it as soon as my training began when I was young. Though it is frowned upon in the clan to use elemental jutsu, to reach jonin status it is a must-know, and as such something all within the Hyuga clan have tested as soon as they begin training from a young age. Ah, uh, that was interesting, and chakra conductive paper wasn't exactly cheap. He knew he'd checked. As expected of the Hyuga clan though, he supposed the now most powerful clan in the entirety of Kanoha with the death of the Uchiha clan. Good to know, Daiki hummed. So what's your affinity then, Firecracker? He questioned. My affinity is of the lightning element. Aniki. Hanabi replied. Daiki blinked before grinning. Well, isn't that a coincidence? My first natural element was lightning as well, he replied. Must be fated that you became my apprentice. Or would have been if that dirty biatch fate actually had the tits to mess with him. But she should know better lest she get a bijudama up the ass. Ah yes, threaten one of the possible omnipotent forces of the universe if they do exist. Such a smart move. I am in awe of your genius. Isabu commented dryly. Didn't you say fate doesn't exist? Hanabi questioned with a snort. I did and I stand by that, it was just a joke. Daiki responded before grinning menacingly. Besides if fate did exist, she'd keep her distance from me cause, if she tried to get funky with me, I'd make her my biatch. You're such a weirdo, Aniki. Hanabi rolled her eyes, but was unable to hide the small grin that appeared at his words. Cultured actually thank you very much, he laughed. Anyway, how about for now? I teach you the first stage when it comes to lightning manipulation, and I might even teach you a jutsu. Okay? Hanabi nodded in agreement. A lightning jutsu would be helpful to pass my inevitable test to become a jonin in the future even if I won't be able to use it in battle. And why's that? He raised an eyebrow at her. He already knew the perfect lightning-style jutsu for a cute little Hyuga like her. His lightning style. Elekiter would go amazingly with her gentle fist. The clan would frown on that. Hanabi replied simply. Daiki rolled his eyes. No apprentice of mine will have jutsu and refuse to use them, he snorted. If they whine at you for it, you can just tell them I gave you permission as your teacher, and if they have a problem with it, they can come whine about it to me, and then I'll kick their asses and assert my dominance and show them why I'm clearly right and they're wrong. Just another show of his words before on how to go about her partnership with her tiger summon, now just applied to her clan. Sure. Okay. Hanabi accepted his words with a shrug. Ah, uh, see, this was why his apprentice was way better than Naruto's. She already listened to him properly. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.